Twists and Turns, Fay Wild Series Book 1, written by W.J. May, narrated by Kathleen Star Hall. Forgetting is easy, remembering is hard. A Fay determined to recover her memory and learn her place in the realm discovers that there are no simple answers. With the help of a soldier with secrets of his own, she charts a course between two worlds, a dark forest where no fate dare set foot, and the capital of the realm, which might end up being more deadly. Can she uncover her identity before the rest of the realm's secrets pull her into something she can't talk or fight her way out of? Prologue The night pulsed with power, making it seem as if the stars hanging above the clearing were themselves pulsing, vibrating in time with the words spoken far below, words that had been old when the world itself was young. The words climbed a spiral of steam that curled from a bubbling cauldron. The forest was thin in this place, a natural clearing where the roots and gnarled limbs of the ancient trees had given way to tall, soft grasses thick and lush enough to cradle the newborn. In the centre of the clearing stood a stooped figure, cloaked in a black so dark it seemed to devour the starlight that touched it. Much else could be swallowed by such a darkness, lovely and deep, and whispering promises of dreams unremembered but unforgotten. It was the darkness at the centre of the forest, a place where the sun could not touch for the leaves and branches of the great old trees blocked out any light that would burrow its way into the wooded depths. There dwelt a wildness that was the rhythm of the forest, the heart beat of its creatures small and trembling, clawed and lurking, even the ones who wheeled high above in lazy circles, surviving on death's leftovers. This world was a wild one, ruled only by the divine laws of nature herself. That wildness was present in the words that resonated around the clearing. The sounds that slithered on the belly through dry leaves, plodded thickly through mud that sucked a bit, skidded up knotted trunks with ragged claws. Sounds that screeched and bellowed through treetops and echoed over overgrown valleys and into the surrounding mountains cloaked in mist. These sounds created the phonology and morphology of the old tongue, the first tongue, the language spoken before the world changed, before it was occupied by more civilized minds. The figure held an ancient hand, wrinkled like a vine-covered tree over the cauldron, tossing ingredients into the roiling currents. The cauldron accepted its dew, the fire below flashing at times, the steam sometimes thickening to smoke after the addition of one ingredient or another. As the chant continued, the air of menace surrounding the clearing increased with the addition of glowing eyes. Low to the ground, high in the branches, and everywhere in between, sets of eyes began to appear on the forest perimeter, watching and waiting as the shrouded figure continued to chant, the world holding its breath, unskilled minds attempting to comprehend the sheer power that seemed to be unfolding before them. The force was coming alive with every word spoken, every wing and tooth and drop of fluid spilled into the cauldron. Unnoticed at first, new buds unfurled into leaves, thick and healthy, branches extended and roots unrolled themselves, curling like hands outstretched. A torrent of wild energy brought the forest to life, while the creatures inside it, like shadows hidden among the trees, held still, unmoving as the miracle revealed itself. They had shining eyes, these figures, eyes that had seen magic like this before, although perhaps not on this scale. They watched the cauldron and the cloaked one, their inner calm contrasting with the wildness that grew and breathed around them. The black-clad figure shifted, her hood falling back to reveal a face lined like polished petrified wood, thin lips, hooked nose, and eyes black and shiny as a rook's wing. The old woman's mouth worked, producing the words that were remaking the world. Her mouth smiled, and suddenly the words she spoke were intelligible to those who had gathered to watch her from within the tree line. The old woman spoke of the forest's might, and of its wild beating heart strong enough to vanquish those who would think to dominate and subdue her wilderness. The time is at hand, she announced, her hands like claws grasping at the night. The time to reclaim this world, to push out the interlopers, to return the realm to the wilds, wild it was and wilds it shall be. A solitary howl rose from the woods, almost an animal sound but shaped by a more articulate mouth. The howl was joined by others until it was a chorus that rang from the trees and echoed upward climbing through the branches and leaves until it burst out of the canopy and rushed the stars themselves. Night spun around itself, a disorienting feeling. 
There was a swirl of stars, then the world below once again resolved itself, the heavens separating itself from the earth below. A sensation of falling arose suddenly, dropping toward the canopy once again, drifting through leaves and branches until hitting the icy surface of a bubbling brook. Twisting through a rock-walled cavern, the brook sped down a path through the thickest part of the forest, trees and branches and overlapping ferns making it almost imperceptible, save for the sound of its journey. Rocks give way to dirt embankments and thick vegetation, and the pace of the brook slowed, currents gently from roars to whispers, until it emptied itself into a small pool beside a thicket, a willow sighing over the water on the opposite bank. Among the tangle of the thicket, a small grassy spot overlooked the pool. There she sat, quiet, reflective. The peace of the thicket was undisturbed by the ancient woman and her faraway words. Here, there was only the gentle gurgle of the water and the talking of the wind through the trees. She could not see beyond the trees very far, the forest receding into a grave formlessness that surrounded her, but not in a menacing way. It was the boundary of a dream, the fuzzy margins, inconsequential until confronted. They didn't worry her, these boundaries. In fact, to her, they did not exist, for really does a dreamer know she is in a dream. She watched the eddies whirl and vanish, whirl and vanish, and wondered idly whether there was something she was supposed to be doing. Memory was slippery here, and it seemed to take too much effort to hold on to things when the gentle breeze encouraged her to forget them. She'd long ago forgotten to wonder where she was, or even who she was, or why it mattered. The wind picked up, the leaves around her rattling. Branches began to sway, then the trees themselves, their whispers turning to groans as the breeze became something much less gentle. She looked up, concern creasing her features for the first time she could remember. Menace filled her belly, an unfamiliar feeling that made her muscles tense, her breath became shallow. Despite the mighty wind shaking the trees around her, the pool itself had become still, its surface no longer giving a glimpse to the rocks, plants, and small silverfish that dwelled below. It had become fathomless, dark, and deep. She leaned over, then froze, her reflection coming into view. Eyes carved of light stone stared back at her, and she noticed pale ear tips poking through the waves of her thick, light honey hair. Plump lips of pale pink framed a mouth that was smiling. Touching her lips, she let out a gasp to discover that her reflection did not mimic her motions. The smiling lips were not her lips, the hands not her hands. The reflection's smile turned sharp and sinister, and the need to flee filled her. Goose flesh dotted her skin, a chill filling her. She'd made up her mind to run, but her body did not move. It could not. She could only look in horror at her reflection and wonder whether something ominous looked beneath the depths, or whether it was too late and that ominous something had already breached her defenses. She couldn't remember, after all. A hand gripped her shoulder, and the world around her faded to nothingness. Chapter One You're me, the familiar voice whispered. Remember? She gasped, waking suddenly to a world of light and sound. Scrambling up from the ground to her hands and knees, she blinked at her surroundings. The first thing she recognized was the gurgling of a stream, followed by the sound of birds trilling in the trees and the rustling of wind through leaves. Pulling herself to her feet, she groaned and touched the back of her head. It felt tender there, as if it had been hit. Or well, maybe I fell. A quick glance revealed that the grass she was standing on had been pressed down with the weight of her unconscious body, but that the vegetation around her seemed undisturbed. What happened? What happened to me? She tried to retrace her steps, but she couldn't. How did I get here? And where is here? No answers revealed themselves as she stood and stared at the stream. Then the other bank, which was dotted with trees and bushes. I'm in a forest. The realization caused her to shiver, but she couldn't be sure exactly why. Why should I feel worried and not worried at the same time? She tried shaking her head, then stopped groaning again. Placing her hands on her belly, she wondered if she'd gotten drunk the night before, and that was responsible for her current plight. It wouldn't have been the first time she'd been intoxicated. She realized as she saw the image of herself holding up a golden goblet in the toast while surrounded by other young, well-dressed women. The image disappeared as suddenly as it had come, 
gone from her memory as if it never existed. The stream provided a natural mirror of sorts where she could take in her attire. A silk gown, rumpled and stained from a night spent outdoors, lay heavily on her, and she wondered how much a dress like this would cost, and whether I can afford it. Why would I wonder that? Maybe I wear dresses like this all the time. She attempted to comb through her hair with her fingers, suddenly anxious at her appearance. A lady must always appear presentable, she murmured to herself, then froze. Who told me that? She scrubbed her face with her hands, then groaned when she realized her hands were dirty. There were three rings glittering on her fingers among the dirt and muck. One was a simple silver band, another a golden band with a jewel-encrusted crown, and the third an opal set in an ornate platinum casing. The expensive dress was starting to make sense, given her accessories. Considering whether to attempt to wash her hands and face in the stream, she paused, the remnants of a dream coming back to her. She took two steps away from the stream, deciding it was safer. I don't want to touch that water, but I don't understand why. Add it to the list of things I don't understand, she told herself, letting out a huff of air. <sighs> she turned her back on the stream and looked out over a thicket of shrubs and bushes, her brow furrowed. She'd obviously gone to some length to end up here, so why don't I remember anything? With one last look around her, she took a step into the grasses that grew to the border of the thicket. Her slippered foot landed on something, and she reached down to see what it was. It was made of velvet and soft to the touch. She turned it over in her hands, taking in the white thread embroidery on the deep burgundy pouch. Lynetta, she whispered to herself, her finger tracing the word. Is that my name? Am I Lynetta? The real question is, why don't I remember? Her fingers untied the bag and opened it. A quick catalogue of its contents was made. Coins of different materials and sizes, a few small red gemstones, and nothing that says who I am beyond the name embroidered on the outside. She closed the pouch, then carefully looped its ties around the thin, silver-plated belt circling her waist. When she was satisfied that the pouch was secure, her hands found her hips. All right, Lynetta, she told herself. Let's find out exactly what you've forgotten. The thicket was deep with branches set to scratch and dig, but her body seemed to know just how to duck and shift to work her way past them without injury. Soon the trees and shrubs began to thin, and in less than half an hour she was out, stepping into a grassy field where she could see winged insects buzzing languidly in the early morning sunshine. The grasslands sat in a semicircle of trees, so she headed for the one area where the grass went onto the horizon unbroken. After walking for several minutes, shapes began to climb from behind the horizon line, and a few minutes after that, she realized the shapes were buildings. There was a village in the distance, and now she had a destination. Well, Lynetta, you have a lot to answer for, she said out loud, speaking to herself in part to soothe some of the anxiety that had taken hold of her insides. Her muscles felt as tight as a scythera string about to snap. How did you get yourself so lost in the forest that you decided to sleep there and forget everything you've ever known? There was heat in her voice, her tone angry. There's no reason to hold back on myself, she figured. I've made a mess of epic proportions, and if my name wasn't printed on this stupid coin pouch, I'd have no clue to my identity. Her mood was made worse by the ache in her head, one that didn't resemble a hangover in the slightest. It was a dull, radiating pain that pulsed from the tender place in the back of her skull, making her think she'd been a victim of violence. But why knock me out and then not steal my coin purse? Or commit an even more sinister act, she pondered. I was there, defenseless for who knows how long. They could have done anything to me, and yet I was left untouched. It wasn't violence then, she muttered to herself, which means I went there willingly. As far as she knew, she wasn't a master tracker, but she hadn't noticed anything that would clue her in to another person being present with her around the stream. She'd been alone. I fell, hit my head, and caused me to lose my memory. Then I wandered to wherever I wandered, in a daze before losing consciousness. She figured it made as much sense as anything else. So where did I fall then, and why? The grasses grew less tall, and she could see where they leveled out into a plain that had been covered with a thin layer of gravel to create a road that ran perpendicular to her own path. Lynetta crouched, looking both ways while she was still in the shelter of the grass. The caution came naturally, 
almost below the level of consciousness. When she'd made certain there was no danger in sight, she stepped carefully from the grass and into the roadway. The village was more apparent now, the road obviously leading to it from parts unknown. Or maybe I knew the parts at one time, just not now. She sighed. Oh, Lynetta, I'm getting the feeling you're a bit of a troublemaker. Her eyes were on her slippers, which picked up more dust with every step. They'd once been a pale pink like her gown, but now they were turning grey moment by moment, all dressed up and no idea where to go. Brushing a stray leaf from her bodice, she frowned down at herself. An expensive gown and a full coin purse. I must be someone of means. Lady Lynetta, she said, trying the words out in her mouth. They felt familiar, or maybe not. Eyes toward the heavens, she let out a groan. Ho, oh, who in the fey realm am I? Fey realm? That felt familiar. She was one of the fey, the inhabitants of the realm who, like her, had pointed ears and delicate features. The fey realm was just one of the many realms that existed in the web, worlds connected through portals and inhabited by a multitude of different life forms. For a moment, her spirits were buoyed by the fact that she knew something about her surroundings until she realized how little this information helped her. It took several minutes to get a hold on her frustration. If I don't know who I am, I should at least be able to assemble facts about the rest of the world. Maybe I know more than I think I do. It turned out to be harder to reconstruct the world around her when she didn't know what in particular she did not know. The road came around a curve and a small farm revealed itself the unpainted barn showing its age, a small fence around the yard beside the farmhouse, which was little more than a two-room shack. Lynetta considered knocking on the shack's door and asking for assistance, but something held her back. In the end, it was hard to trust anyone, even someone residing on the idyllic-looking farm. She did stray from the road to the small pond that lay between it and the farm, her throat parched from the walk. It was now past midday, and she was closing on the village, but she knew it would be at least another hour or perhaps longer before she reached its walls. Kneeling beside the clear pond, she dipped her hands under the water, rubbing them gently to clean them. Then she cupped them and lifted them to her lips, gratefully slurping at the cool water. She repeated her motion several times until her thirst was slaked. Lynetta took a moment to look at her reflection. She felt none of the apprehension she'd experienced next to the stream where she'd woken up. There was nothing familiar about her appearance, nothing she recognized as inherently herself. Tiredness weighed on her features, which were otherwise youthful and attractive, at least by her own metrics. How did you end up in this state, she asked, tucking a stray lock of hair behind her pointed ear. Someone who looks like you shouldn't be passed out next to streams in the middle of a forest. She rose and wiped her now clean hands on her gown, then regretted it when they came back caked with dust. The walk back to the road was short, but she felt weighted down by a weariness that didn't seem likely to resolve any time soon. How am I supposed to figure out who I am when I know next to nothing about anything? Tired feet carried her inexorably toward the village. It was late afternoon by the time she reached the outskirts, her stomach growling at her like an overactive lapdog. She took in the well-kept white walls and blue tile roofs of the town, but it made little impact because she recognized nothing. The houses on the outskirts gave way to ordered streets with shops and two-story homes. Well-fed people waved as she passed them, their smiles polite, their eyes slightly less so. Probably because I look like I just crawled out of the woods. Which I did. She passed a farrier and stables that smelled like manure but were otherwise clean and organized. The blacksmith's shop belched smoke, but the walls were not blackened by soot. It was evident from even a short stroll around the village that the residents took pride in their town. The village square sat in the center of town, a wide open green space surrounded by streets on four sides. The buildings fronting those streets, some of the most popular and prosperous, folks streamed into and out of the businesses, some carrying boxes and baskets, others strolling idly. She watched two young boys walk by, each holding a pasty in their hands. Lynetta smelled the pasties as they passed, and her stomach clenched hot enough that she almost doubled over. I guess I've discovered one thing about myself. I don't like to miss a meal. Her eyes scanned the storefronts, coming upon a three-story building that took up much of the block. Whitewashed brick made up the first floor, the ones above it built in wood and painted a light green. 
contrasting with the blue tile roof, it was hung with a sign composed of an intricately painted board. The painting was of a wooden gate overgrown by flowering vines, and underneath in swirling letters was the name, The Green Gate. Two fey males stumbled out the door, their arms around each other's shoulders, as if each was responsible for keeping the other upright. Neither was doing a very good job. From the expressions on their faces and their gait, they were well past inebriated and a fair clip toward drunk. If they have liquor, maybe they serve food too, she thought hopefully. With her straining hand on her stomach, she opened the door and stepped inside. Chapter 2 Lynetta blinked into the dimness. After a day spent under the sun on the road, it took a moment for her eyes to adjust to the lamplight inside the green gate. She paused just inside the door to take in her surroundings. A few heads turned when she entered, and her eyes flitted from one to the other, but she noticed nothing out of the ordinary. To the left she saw a contingent of men dressed in the same attire occupying a handful of tables. Their coats were light blue with golden piping, tailored for broad chest, tapered waists, and long limbs. Straight leg pants in the same colors led to shiny black boots. Some of the coats were more heavily decorated than others, and Lynetta realized suddenly that they were uniforms. The Fay Royal Guard. The words popped into her mind, and she swallowed understanding now that she was staring at soldiers. With no idea why apprehension was filling her, she turned away from the military uniforms to take in the rest of the clientele. A row of booths hugged the back wall, and Lynetta saw a few groups scattered among them, most dressed in simple garb like the other villagers, namely white tunics and homespun breeches. Despite their rustic quality, the clothing was well made and clean, as were the wearers. Along the right wall, a long wooden bar ran the length of the building. Behind it stood a ruddy-faced fay with brawny arms and a bald head. He wiped the bar with broad circular strokes, his face intent. Lynetta directed her steps toward the bar and the man standing behind it, hope filling her as she approached. She could smell food cooking nearby, likely on the other side of the closed door behind the barkeep. Lynetta willed her stomach not to growl too loudly and bellied up to the bar. Good afternoon, she said, inclining her head in what she hoped was a genteel way, then sat carefully on one of the open stools. The barkeep grunted in response, then she felt his eyes crawling over her, taking in her disheveled appearance. He went back to his cleaning, dismissing her out of hand. Lynetta tried not to let her frustration show. Could I trouble you for a glass of water, and a plate of whatever meal you might be preparing? The barkeep finished his swirls and tossed his rag under the bar. He came back in her direction, pausing to fix her with a skeptical look. I'm supposed to believe a light skirt like you has the coin to pay for a meal. Light skirt? I have coin, she said. Let me see it, he said, unimpressed. Do you make all of your customers show their coins before you serve them? It seemed patience wasn't her strong suit. You learn something new about yourself every day or in my case, every minute. He just stared at her, not answering. Lynetta sighed and untied her coin pouch from her belt. She lifted it to where he could see, hefting it up and down so he could hear the coins clink against each other. One bushy eyebrow rose, and the barkeep's lips pursed. I need to see it. You don't believe me? He gave his head one solid shake. Too easy to cast an illusion nowadays, isn't it? How's do I know you ain't got magics like that? It had been a long day already, and she was too tired to argue. Illusions, huh? Maybe I could cast one. Fae were known to have innate powers, generally simple ones that all Fae shared, like lighting a fire with a gesture, or causing their skin to emit light. Some could charm non Fae, some were good with herbs and potions, and others were so skilled with creating fine jewelry and musical instruments that they seemed to have a magical talent for it. There were other fae, a rare few, who had more specific and powerful talents, like casting illusions. She drew on an inner well of strength and attempted to cast the illusion of a gold coin sitting on the bar in front of her. She squinted, bit her lip, and gnashed her teeth, but no coin appeared. Giving up, Lynetta untied the pouch and held it open so that he could see the coins inside. The barkeep made a gesture with his hand, indicating that he wanted to inspect further. I might have woken up on a riverbank this morning, but I wasn't born last night. 
Instead of holding her pouch out for his inspection, she plucked a small silver coin from inside it and handed it to him. The barkeep pressed it between his thumb and forefinger, then nodded. Without a word, he filled a glass with water and passed it to her. Lynetta gulped it gratefully while the bald man disappeared through the door, leaving her alone at the bar. Her stomach protested at the addition of water without anything more solid to seek its teeth into. I know, she muttered softly. I'm working on it. She swiveled on the stool, looking for anything that might clue her into her location, but nothing looked familiar. Maybe I should ask the barkeep where I am. Another coin or two should loosen him up. It was an idea with merit, but something stopped her from following through. If my loss of memory is because of a head wound that someone else inflicted, it might not be smart to let on that I don't remember who or where I am. She had no idea who might have knocked her out and left her in her coin pouch in the forest. It could be anyone, including the inhabitants of this fine establishment. It might be safer to keep to myself until I know more. But how was she supposed to figure out where she was if she didn't start asking questions? It was a conundrum that made her head ache. Anyone could be a suspect, which meant eyes could be on her now, watching her, waiting for her to slip up. Or, conversely, no one might know her or care that she'd knock loose her memories so that they'd escaped without a trace. Fancy anything more to drink? Water is fine, but we've got something more sublime. Lynetta turned her head to take in a pretty female fay, two long brown braids framing her heart-shaped face. She seemed friendly enough, but Lynetta didn't want alcohol. She needed food, and lots of it. She was just about to respond accordingly when she felt an arm encircle her waist. A beautiful woman like this deserves something finer than water, said a melodious male voice. Why don't you bring us both a glass of summer wine, Shoshana? She watched the cheerful face stiffen. Shoshana walked off without a word to do as she was bid. Lynetta looked over at the male who'd acted so proprietarily. He was tall and handsome in the way of a man in his prime one who likely spent his days in the fields and his nights trying to get under the skirts of any pretty woman passing by. "'My name's Fry,' he said, a wolfish grin on his face. "'I haven't seen you around the Green Gate before. It must be my lucky night.' "'Lynetta,' she said, holding out her hand to him automatically. Then wondering how she'd known to do that, Fry took her hand and bowed over it, kissing it gently before releasing it. "'The lovely Lady Lynetta,' How it rolls off the tongue, he said, laying on the charm as thickly as jam on toast. What brings you to our village? I have interests in the area, she said vaguely, not knowing what else to say. Thankfully, she was saved from making awkward conversation when Shoshana returned, two glasses of pale golden liquid on her tray. She set the glasses down in front of them, hard enough to make wine slosh over the sides. Lynetta noticed the jealousy that burned in the other woman's face. Shoshana turned her attention to Fry. You better have the money to pay for this, she grumbled. Fret not, show. I'm sure our lovely visitor is more than able to pay, judging by the purse she showed to Neff. Lynetta did not touch the wine. She clutched her coin purse, testing the loops and ties to make sure it was closed and fastened securely to her belt. How did I get into this situation? A flirt and his jealous paramour, all I wanted was some information. Her feelings changed as she gave her situation a second thought. Still, a flirt is someone I can work with. If I return his flirtation, he might be useful. He's a local, after all. And it would be harmless, as I have no designs on Fry, as cute as he might be. I'll tip out Shoshana, let her know it was meaningless, and maybe make her friendly enough to fill any blanks that Fry leaves. It was a ramshackle plan, but it was the only one she had. I have more than enough to pay, she said in a sure voice. Hear that, show. She's got more than enough coin to buy a round for everyone. Fry raised his cap, his voice growing louder. Drinks were on the lovely Lady Lynetta. Lynetta's eyes widened as folks who had seemed almost asleep in the late afternoon heat were now awake and alert and gathering around her at a remarkable clip. They were overwhelmingly male, some locals and others in uniform. Her nerves screamed at her, and she picked up her glass of wine and sipped, needing to settle herself. To the lovely Lady Lynetta, a blonde fay toasted her, winking at her before waggling his eyebrows. May your beauty grow with each passing year, 
he lifted the mug of ale Shoshana put into his hand, and others followed. It was a nice enough toast, so Lynetta took another sip of summer wine, figuring it was best to be polite when in a situation such as this. Unfortunately, his toast wasn't the last. Hurry up, Neff, Shoshana cried from behind the bar where she was hurrying to fill orders on Lynetta's coin. I could use some help out here. To Lynetta, the crowd around her chorused, and she realized she'd missed another toast. Another polite sip, and she was licking her lips. The stuff is good. Too good. Before long, her glass was empty. She leaned back and realized she was a little off balance. That wine is stronger than I thought. A soldier, his hair cut short, his ears long and lean, shoved a new glass into her hand, then raised his, clinking it against hers. It would be impolite not to drink, she told herself, blushing when the fay in uniform started to ogle her cleavage. Fry's arm was still around her waist, and it tightened so she was pulled back against his broad chest. It felt good to be able to relax, especially after the stressful day she'd just experienced, so she let herself melt into the embrace. How long will you be around? Fry asked her, his smile sly. We don't usually get such generous visitors. I'm just passing through, gentlemen, she said, realizing that her words were a slurring mess. Where is the food I ordered? I shouldn't be drinking on an empty stomach. A chorus of despairing groans rose around her. That's too bad, Fry said. How about another round to help the lads get over their disappointment? Lynetta knew it wasn't a good idea, but she was hopeless under the onslaught of polite toasts. Her second glass was nearly empty, and the room around her swam with suitors. Were there this many a minute ago? Her chest felt tight, her mind alternating between worry and a drunken relaxation. Why should I be worried? She asked herself. It's not like I have any place to go or anyone to see. I'm nobody lost in nowhere. At least the locals are friendly. To the Lady Lynetta! Once again, Lynetta lifted her glass and emptied it. I might as well make the best of things, because my only alternative is to make things worse. Somewhere deep inside her, a voice called out in warning, but the wine made it seem very small and far away. Chapter 3 Salvation seemed at hand as she watched Neff reappear behind the bar, a steaming plate of food in his hand. He sat it down in front of her, his expression humorless, but a look of calculation in his eye. Lynetta ignored the barkeep, instead focusing on the plate. She moved her hand in the direction of the fork. Picking it up, she managed to spear a potato before being jostled by the crowd, who was agitating for the next free drink. "'Careful now,' Fry said, putting a finger under her chin and turning Lynetta's attention back to him. She chewed her potato, trying to follow what the handsome Fay was saying. It was a little difficult because her eyes couldn't quite focus. "'We don't want you to lose your footing.' Best hold tight on me. He'd never loosened his hold on her waist, but now he wrapped her arm around him, pressing her against his broad chest. His smile was wolfish, but Lynetta didn't notice. Her stomach, unappeased by her measly tribute, demanded further sustenance. She turned back to her plate, then blinked in confusion when she realized it was empty. A few of her admirers were chewing happily, and she caught one munching happily on a pigeon leg. He gave her a nod of acknowledgement, swinging the leg up in a short salute before biting off a chunk of the meat. Lynetta's brow furrowed, and her stomach howled in frustration. Oh dear, she lamented, her thoughts moving slowly through the fog of wine. I thought I ordered dinner. There must have been some mistake. She lifted her hand to signal the barkeep, but Fry grabbed her arm and brought it round his waist like the other. She found herself pressed against him as he leaned in to whisper in her ear. Things are getting a little rowdy, he said softly. Wouldn't it be more comfortable to go back to my place where we can talk and drink in peace? Peace did sound nice, but he hadn't mentioned food yet, so Lynetta wasn't ready to abandon the bar so soon. She patted him gently on the chest with what she hoped was a conciliatory smile on her face. Lynetta removed her arms and lifted one to try and summon the fay female who was filling glasses as quickly as she could. Check it out, gentlemen, Fry said, his voice shifting from soft to lively. This one enjoys the crowd, it appears. You should have said so, my lady. Lynetta glanced back in Fry's direction when the barmaid ignored her. He'd put an arm around the men standing on either side of them, both wearing identical eager grins. 
Fry bounced his eyes twice, then gave her a look filled with heat. If it's a party you want, then come with us. I promise to provide more diverting entertainment than this. She blinked, her vision doubling for a moment, making her think there were six men trying to lure her away from the bar. Maybe I should be flattered, she thought, then giggled out loud. <laughs> Maybe Lynetta is the type to entertain multiple men in the same evening and still have time to get the washing up done. She shook her head, the last vestiges of reason that hadn't been diluted by wine, allowing her to do the math. Three against one, those aren't good odds. Fry, on the other hand, seemed to enjoy his advantage. He was smiling like he'd won seven rounds of eyes or ears in a row. Reaching out, he took her hand, ready to lead her away. Lynetta stood frozen as alarm bells began to ring belatedly. Let her go! The voice could have been forged from ice. Lynetta turned her head to locate the body from whence it came. Her eyes widened as she took in a female male at least a head taller than the next tallest man in the room. His shoulders were wide, his chest broader than Fry's, his muscular frame making him seem like the prototype for which his uniform had been created. His midnight black hair that would normally fall past his strong jaw was pulled back in a loose bun behind his head, revealing the most pleasingly pointed ears she'd ever seen. But it was his eyes, brighter than emeralds in noontime sunlight, set between sharp cheekbones and above a distinguished nose that held her attention. A woman could lose herself in those eyes, she thought, then shook her head to clear it of the flash of attraction she felt. Not this woman. I'm already lost. Fry tugged on Lynetta's hand and she fell forward unprepared. The floody fay caught her without effort, putting his arm around her and turning her back on the other male. Before she could struggle, the soldier's hand was on Fry's arm, pulling his grip from her. I'd suggest you and your friends make yourselves scarce before I lose my temper. Lynetta turned her head to glance in the direction of the soldier as a chorus of groans went up from around the bar. Come on, Bracken! She saw a fellow soldier moan in disappointment. We're just having a little fun! At the jeers of agreement from the others around him, the one she now knew it was called Bracken scowled and crossed his arms over his muscular chest. Fun at the lady's expense. You all have taken advantage of the poor drunken woman long enough. Neff stopped pouring to fix Bracken with an angry glare. Mind your own business. The lady has plenty of good coin to spend. She heard several people voice their agreement, and Neff went back to pouring drinks and passing them out to every hand that reached in his direction. Lynetta wondered how long the coins in her purse would hold out if her generosity continued to be taken for granted. Let's not make this a whole thing, Fry said, waving his hands to calm the crowd down. Putting his arm around Lynetta again, he gave his opponent a frosty smile. Besides, we were just leaving. She's not going anywhere with you. Lynetta turned to take in Shoshana, who was bristling like a cat with its back up. She took up a place next to Bracken and glared at Fry, her expression saying she was ready to back up her words if necessary. See, this is why you should come back to my place, where we can get to know each other without all these distractions, Fry bent down to whisper in her ear. He again attempted to pull her in the direction of the door, but this time it was the barkeep who stopped him. Don't even think about crossing the threshold until you've paid for these drinks, he growled in Fry's direction. Okay now, Lynetta slurred, holding her hands up, palms out. Why don't we all just sit down and have another drink, and we can work this out amiably, <laughs> amiably. A hiccup interrupted her attempts at the correct pronunciation. Amicably, she said at last with a nod of pride. Bracken's jet-black eyebrow rose. His face said he wasn't impressed by her vocabulary. The men around them, however, sent up a shot of delight and Neff smiled as he began pouring once again. The last thing you need is another drink, the male said, his voice gruff. You're only making the situation worse. The lady can speak for herself, Bracken, Fry bit out, yanking her in his direction. The lady is drunk, Bracken said grabbing her other hand and pulling her back in his direction. She clearly isn't used to the strength of simmering summer wine. Lynetta felt like a child's doll being fought over by two elven terriers, but the words penetrated and she flinched at simmering. I know that word, she frowned. How do I know that word? She's going to rent a room, Bracken was saying when she tuned back in, and she's going to go upstairs and sleep it off. Ain't no more rooms, remember? Neff said gleefully, making Bracken scowl. 
She and your fellow soldiers rented all of them. Plenty of room at my place, Fry said smoothly, giving Lynetta another tug before finally releasing her wrist as Shoshana came at him like a whirlwind. The barmaid didn't hold back, shoving Fry and cursing at him with the viciousness of a fishwife. You shameless cad, she hissed, aiming a knee at his privates that he narrowly avoided. You spent the last two weeks convincing me that you ain't been kissing Mariana behind the bakery like Trina and Lulabelle swear that you have. You're nothing but a no-good, low-down, heartless little... Come with me? Lynetta blinked at the fey male who towered over her, his expression nearly as black as his hair. He grasped her arm with two hands, determined that she wouldn't be pulled away this time. Bracken only made it two steps toward the stairs before he was forced to stop as three of his fellow soldiers blocked his path. "'Not tonight, Bracken,' one said, already slurring. "'Tonight we drink!' "'Do it on your own coin, then,' he snarled in reply, attempting to shoulder his way past. "'Why should we when the lady is happy to pay for us?' This came from a ginger-haired fay with bright orange freckles. He scratched at his nose and swayed a little, already having imbibed heavily. "'I'm not going to argue with you as to why your behavior is wrong.' Bracken's tone was even, but his words felt like a threat. "'You can stay and disgrace the uniform as long as you like, "'but I'm escorting this woman to her bed.' "'How come you get to take her to bed?' Fry whined loudly, then yelled in pain when Shoshana's open palm connected with his cheek. The crowd was getting restless, the drinks they'd already had at her expense filling them with courage.' Lynetta realized that things could get out of hand quickly. When one of the other soldiers shoved Bracken hard enough to push him back, Lynetta freed her hand from his. "'Calm down, boys,' she said, aiming for dignified, but her choice of words and inebriated tone, making her sound more seductive than she intended. A hirsute male gave her a smile full of teeth and pushed another full glass of wine into her hand. Lynetta noticed something was different about him, and she blinked. "'bleary-eyed as she tried to determine what it was. "'He's not fey, she thought, confused. "'Without thinking, she took a drink when he raised his glass to her. "'Although the wine was as crisp and tasty as ever, "'Lynetta realized after she drank "'that she'd passed the line of comprehension. "'Offworlder!' "'The word popped into her head like a puzzle piece slipping into place. "'Before she could think further, "'she was distracted by a scuffle as Bracken squared off, against his fellow soldiers. They hadn't yet come to blows, but she wasn't sure how much longer things could remain non-violent. "'There you are,' a voice said, an arm encircling her waist again. "'I almost lost you. Let's go now before someone tries to stop us again.' Fry attempted to lead her in the direction of the door, but Shoshana leapt suddenly on his back and bit into his shoulder. He yelped and flexed out his limbs, an arm inadvertently knocking Lynetta down. She landed hard on her behind and winced, then tumbled backward, the wind finally taking its toll. Lynetta saw the world upside down, an upside-down Bracken shoving his colleagues as the circle around him grew tighter. "'Good luck, handsome soldier,' she thought, raising her hand in a drunken salute he couldn't see, then passing out cold on the barroom floor. Chapter 4 The stream gurgled softly, almost like a sigh drawing her attention to its surface where her own reflection sat, gazing up at her. The day was warm around her, a gentle breeze blowing through the thick trees and bushes on either side of the water. She watched her reflection as the wind played with a lock of her hair, lifting it before letting it go. The wind picked up, the leaves around her rattling. Branches began to sway, then the trees themselves. She paid it no mind, her eyes wrapped at her reflection. You're me. Remember? The words came to mind out of nowhere, unsettling her. Despite the mighty wind shaking the trees around her, the pool was still, its surface fathomless, dark and deep. She froze a sudden feeling of familiarity filling her. I've been here before. A hand touched her shoulder and she jolted, then swiveled around, looking up to see the owner of the hand. What she saw so confused her, it took a moment for her mind to process it. The same pale pink gown, the same honey-blonde hair and pointed ears. Her reflection had somehow climbed out of the water to creep up behind her. Fear buffeted her as a howl rose up from the trees around her. 
Her reflection smiled, a feral smile that froze her insides. She opened her mouth to scream. And suddenly she woke, bolting upright in bed and ripping herself from her nightmare in the process. Lynetta blinked into the light then groaned, falling back against the mattress, the memory of the dream escaping like a thief into the shadows. Head pounding, she managed at last to prop herself up on her elbows and take in her surroundings. The room was small and tidy, as was the bed supporting her. A lone window looked out at the neighboring rooftop next to a small dresser holding a wash basin. There was another larger table and a plain wooden chair, and a chest with a satchel atop it. She noticed a heavy grey coat hanging over the door leading to the small bathroom. The sight of the bathroom reminded her that she had to relieve herself, the need hitting her forcefully, making her think that it had gone ignored for too long. She hobbled into the bathroom, hurrying to go before it was too late. What happened last night? Her tongue felt dry, her mouth still holding a remnant of sweetness. I don't know if I've ever been that drunk. Then again, I don't know who I am. Maybe I'm the type who drinks every night. She doubted it, though, given what a lightweight she'd been with the simmering summer wine. Lynetta let out a sigh as the tension left her, then froze. Hearing voices through the thin wall she shared with another room. She listened for a moment, recognizing one of the voices. The image of a dark-haired, muscled fay with striking green eyes entered her mind. Bracken, she thought, putting a name to the image. His voice rose, and she realized it was an argument she was overhearing. The other voice had to belong to another male. The tone, one of authority. You're taking her, and that's that, the voice stated, expecting his orders to be followed. Bracken wasn't pleased. Even with the wall to muffle their voices, she could make out every word he spoke, anger vibrating in his voice. I'm not interested in playing a glorified babysitter all the way back to the capital. It doesn't matter what you're interested in, Velux. You'll do what you're told. The hard edge in the other's voice was impossible to miss. Velux. That term was familiar. It represented a rank in the Fae military, one of the lowest ranks. They were skirmishers, famed for their quickness, but also left to do the grunt work. Lynetta was surprised when Bracken didn't fall into line with what his superior officer was ordering. Although he did try to fight the entire barroom last night, so... What happens if I don't want to go? Bracken's tone was neutral, but she could still sense the grit in it. Then you follow in your father's footsteps. There was a pause, long enough for her to wonder what had happened to Bracken's father. Then the Velik spoke again. What happens if she doesn't want to go? She? A chill covered her. Lynetta had a sudden idea what she they meant. The other man's response was matter of fact. What she wants isn't important. You saw her ring just like I did. A ring like that means nobility, and nobility belongs in the capital. His words sank in, and she took a deep breath. Looking down, she caught sight of the ring on the middle finger of her right hand. Carved out of gold, it held a crown with gemstones embedded in its four points. A certainty filled her that this was the ring they were speaking of, and it apparently marks me as a member of the nobility. They're taking me to the capital whether I like it or not. She wasn't sure whether to panic or praise the light. An idea was forming one that quickly spread across her mind, gaining acceptance as it went. I should let myself be escorted to the capital. If I recover my memory along the way and decide I don't want to go there, then I can give my escort the slip later. And if I am a noble as they think, then there are worse places than the capital to be headed. Remembering how quickly things had gotten out of control last night, she figured it wouldn't hurt to have some protection until she could figure out who she was and where she belonged. With a shake of her head, her plan was decided. She left the bathroom, eyeing the empty tub longingly and wondering if she could convince Shoshana to bring her up some bathwater. I might have made an enemy for life last night, she thought with a frown as she headed for the wash basin. There was water in the pitcher, she saw with relief, and filled the basin, unwrapping the bar of soap sitting beside it before stopping to peel the rings off her fingers. She removed the ring with the crown last, then paused and stared down at her hands. Where the silver and opal rings had sat, there was a little strip of pale skin, but the skin under the crown was darker. I haven't been wearing that ring long. 
It was another clue, but one that led her nowhere, so she put it out of her mind and began to wash her hands. Then her face and neck, feeling cleaner but wishing she had the luxury of a full bath. Something told her that she didn't have the time, however, as she realized she was waiting for a knock on her door. Walking to the table, she picked up the comb sitting there, wiping it carefully on the towel beside the wash basin. She then sat on the chair and began combing through her hair. It was tangled with bits of leaf and twig peppering it, so she meticulously removed all of the debris and then started her long, methodical strokes, counting them as she went. It felt right, the counting. Soothing, comforting. She wasn't sure why, though. Another thing that was lost in the haze of her mind. She was on stroke 38 when the door opened and Bracken walked in, not having bothered to knock. That might have been the hangover still affecting her, but she couldn't help the rush of attraction she felt at seeing him again. I might have my memory back, but I know what I like, and he seems to check every box. Then she caught the look on his face and revised her opinion. Okay, maybe not every box. Bracken sneered down at her, saying nothing, before he turned to retrieve the satchel on the trunk. Carrying it to the dresser, he jerked the top drawer open and started emptying its contents into the satchel. Lynetta took a deep breath and closed her eyes, reminding herself that she needed to stay on his good side if her plan was to work. She continued to come through her hair, picking up where she left off, counting aloud softly as she had been before. Silly fae females, he grumbled as he packed, his jerky motions highlighting his anger, only caring about being attractive, a grunt as he closed the drawer and opened one below it, wearing fancy gowns and expensive jewels, something that resembled a growl as he struggled to fit a pair of shoes into the satchel and spending others' hard-earned coin. She bristled, unable to help herself. A moment away from giving him what for, she straightened her shoulders instead. If I'm supposed to be a member of the nobility, then I'd better act like that, which means not dignifying this man's behavior with a response. Although she somehow knew stopping at fifty strokes was too few, she stopped there, setting down the comb and standing. Bracken tossed the satchel on the bed and struggled to buckle it closed. She noticed he was no longer wearing his uniform. In its place was a loose-fitting homespun shirt in dove gray and a pair of fitted slacks. He looked up when she stood, eyeing her suspiciously. She ignored him, raising herself to her full height, which ended up to still be several inches below his, and tried to look down her nose at him. "'I'll be heading downstairs for breakfast,' she announced with as much imperiousness as she could manage, then glided past him and out the door. She didn't miss his snort of derisive amusement as she went. Lynetta frowned while she made her way down the wooden stairs her balance still a little affected by her drinking binge the night before. I refuse to alter my plan just because my escort is a little less of a gentleman. Still, regret stalked her as she made her way through the barroom, headed for the long bar and the fey female behind it. Shoshana did not look up at her approach, instead focusing entirely on wiping down the bar. Lynetta had to resort to a polite cough to get a response, and even then, the barmaid refused to make eye contact. What do you want? Breakfast, please, she replied in a friendly tone. Shoshana tossed her cleaning rag down in frustration and made a quick exit through the door behind the bar. A few minutes later, it wasn't Shoshana who returned with a steaming plate, but Neff, the bald, domineering owner. The smells were hitting her stomach like blows, but Neff did not set the plate in front of her. Instead, he wafted it once under her nose, then took a step back. You still owe me for last night. You passed out before I could collect. Of course, she said smoothly, pulling out her pouch, which she was relieved to see was still tied to her belt. How much do I owe? Sixteen platinum for the drinks, the food, and the room. Her eyes widened. That much? She shook her head, then narrowed her eyes. The room was already paid for, as I remember. Last night was hazy, but it wasn't the void that the rest of her memories were. She recalled Neff saying that Bracken and his companions had rented all the rooms last night, and Lynetta hid a blush at the realization that she'd likely stolen Bracken's bed from him. Neff shrugged a shoulder. Extra occupant charge. He used a hand to lazily waft the delicious odors rising from the plate in her direction, forcing Lynetta to succumb out of blind hunger. 
She untied her pouch and began sorting through it, hoping that she had enough of the coins he was after. Platinum were hard to come by, and the five she pulled out of her pouch represented a small fortune. She'd have to make up the rest in gold, which might end up depleting almost all of her wealth. Her stomach growled fiercely, insisting the exchange was worth it. Too involved in counting, she didn't notice the footsteps coming up behind her. You've got to be kidding me, Bracken said in a tone that said he was tired of cleaning up other people's messes. Lynetta watched as he snatched the coin pouch out of her hand quicker than she could blink, then scooped the coin she'd been carefully counting out on the bar back into it. What are you doing? She hissed, not willing to lose her breakfast to her new companion's arrogance. She watched as Bracken plucked out one of the gems and held it up to the light. This should be more than enough to cover what she owes you, he said, then tossed the gem in Neff's direction. The bald man almost dropped the plate as he jerked to catch it. He set the plate down, then brought the jewel close to his face, looking it over. This and a five platinum, he conceded, as if he were doing them a great favor. The gem and nothing else, and I want a plate as well. Neff looked as if he wanted to argue, but Bracken stared him down, and at last he turned back to the door behind him. Grumbling as he went, Bracken gestured toward her plate, and it was all the message Lynetta needed. She dug into its steaming contents with abandon, barely holding back a moan of pleasure. When her stomach finally held enough to stop its complaining, her thoughts could expand to include more than her hunger. She sized up the man beside her, who was tapping his fingers against the bar impatiently. He was too bossy by half, and she was beginning to think that anger was the only emotion he was able to feel. Then again, he got me fed without emptying my purse, and he seems to have my best interests at heart, or at least his own interests. She remembered what his commanding officer had said, the threat she didn't understand other than the fact that it was a threat. Lynetta chewed, contemplating the journey before her. In the end, she was relieved to have someone watching her back, even if he didn't seem to enjoy it. Chapter 5 My feet hurt. They'd been walking the road for the better part of the day, and it had Lynette thinking that maybe she wasn't the type of person who did so much walking. Or maybe it's the slippers, she thought, glancing down at the delicate silk contraptions. They offered no support, pinched her toes, and the arch was making it more difficult to walk. Noticing a nearby boulder along the road, she trudged to it and sat down, slipping off her shoes and bending her leg to rub her left foot. Oh, goody, blisters! Lynetta sighed, wondering how she was going to walk all the way back to the capital in this condition. It might not be that far, she told herself. After all, you have no idea where you are. The capital could be just around the corner. She looked up at a groan from Bracken several yards down the road. You can't keep stopping like this, he grumbled as he marched back in her direction. We're never going to make the next village before nightfall if you don't pick up the pace. For as attractive as that man is, he sounds like he's perpetually sitting on a chair made of porcupine quills. Which village are you talking about? she asked, as much to buy herself more time to rest than to find out the answer. Bracken grimaced, his eyes narrowing. His powerful jaw clinched, his expression reminding her of a raptor. You don't know? She shook her head, affecting an expression that said she couldn't be bothered to know the geography of the realm. Should I? Suspicion shone in his green eyes. Surely you remember Carter's Dam. You would have had to pass through it on your way south. Right, she said, nodding. Carter's Dam. Her companion didn't look convinced. It's the only river crossing in a hundred miles in each direction. Of course, she said, fussing with her hair. I pass through the area at night, so that's probably why I don't recall it. Switching to dusting off her garments, she continued to make conversation, hoping her tone sounded unaffected. I also didn't get a good sense of the size of the village. Is it large? Big enough for me to buy some new shoes? Bracken made a strangled noise and looked skyward. You women are all obsessed with shopping. You should be more worried about the forest than the village we're heading toward. His gaze returned to hers, and he put his hands on his hips, talking down to her. We wouldn't like to be caught out here at night, not so close to the wilds. They've been unusually active lately. As if he'd just taken in his own words, he moved closer, 
his face turning to stone. How exactly did you make it past Carter's dam at night? And with whom? Who exactly would be dumb enough to lead you on a road so close to the wilds at night? It was clear her improvising was not having the effect she'd intended. Lynetta rushed to put her shoes back on her feet and hopped up. Well, as you say, we better get a move on. The first few steps were close to agony, but she ignored the pain and soldiered on, keeping her eyes on the horizon and hoping with every step that the village would appear in the distance. It didn't. His long strides meant Brecken caught up to her easily. Although she stared straight ahead, she could feel his eyes on her, studying her. Stealing her expression, Lynetta tried to appear unconcerned, even a little stupid. Better he assume I'm a fiddlehead than realize the truth. After a while, he turned his attention back to the road. They walked in silence, the same questions circling her head as they went. What does he mean when he says the wilds are unusually active? Like her knowledge of Fey military rank and her understanding of the currency, Lynetta knew what the wilds were, although to her mind, they were the stuff of legend. Deep forests full of ancient secrets, shunned by Fey in favor of civilization, of cities, towns, and villages. Bucolic farmlands and bustling marketplaces, Fey ignored the forest, leaving it in overgrown, unmanaged sprawl. At least, that's what I seem to know about them. What's so dangerous about the wilds anyway? she asked after a time, hoping his suspicions had died down. It was frustrating not having the knowledge everyone else took for granted. Bracken turned to fix her with a deadpan stare. You're screwing with me, aren't you? Wide-eyed Lynetta shook her head. This doesn't bode well. The wilds are full of dangerous creatures, he said, shaking his head. I can't believe you don't know this. Are all nobles this ignorant? Lynetta blinked, her cheeks turning pink. His tone rankled, but she knew she had to put up with his attitude if she was going to keep her secret. She shrugged, trying to look unaffected. We know that no one goes into the wilds, but you make it sound like it's teeming with monsters. Because it is, he threw up his hands in exasperation. The wilds are a perilous place, more perilous by the day. The woods used to leave folks alone. We don't enter the forest, and a forest doesn't mess with us. At least that used to be the way of things. But now, things are changing. The forest is growing, expanding, and the creatures that dwell inside it are coming closer to the edges, stalking the fae who dare to get close. What kind of creatures? I mean, do we even know that whatever dwells there is dangerous? And what happens to the people who do enter the forest? Are you telling me that no one has ever returned unscathed? That just sounds... absolutely true? Bracken stopped in his tracks. He turned and grabbed her, startling her. His hands gripped her arms and he bent in, his face inches from her own. Why don't you know any of this? No one is this uninformed. I'm from the city. Maybe the wilds aren't such a big deal to us. She had no idea if what she was saying was accurate. Why doesn't my assessment of the wilds match his? Does everyone believe a monster will eat them if they set foot into the woods? She swallowed hard, thinking about how she'd woken up a blank slate in the forest. No monster ate me, but something happened. Maybe I'm wrong about the wilds. Crow feathers, Bracken nearly vibrated with anger. His eyes roamed her face, searching for whatever he thought she was hiding. You look like a fae, pointed ears, exquisite beauty, but the fae aren't the only race with pointy ears in the web. Are you from off-world? What? she asked, shaken. Some kind of spy, he spat, shaking her. Is that what you are? Let me tell you, you're doing a horrible job. He was too close to her, too demanding, and it filled her with fear. He knows something's wrong. How long before he pulls the truth out of me? She acted on instinct, raising her foot and then slamming it down again on his boot. Bracken hissed in pain, his grip lessening enough for Lynette to pull herself out of it. Without hesitation, she darted away as fast as her aching feet would carry her. Stop! She heard him bellow from behind her. Thin footsteps sounded faster than her own. 
She knew he was behind her, and that knowledge sent a surge of adrenaline into her. She ran full out toward the tree line, hoping to lose him among the overgrown plant life at the edge of the forest. Are you insane? His footsteps were even closer, and she knew she'd feel his fingers on her any moment now. Yes, I've completely lost my mind, and I can't find it. She bit back a hysterical burst of laughter and dove for the forest, scrambling through the brush at the outskirts, then zagging, trying to shake him off her tail. She underestimated his speed. What felt like an iron vice grabbed her arm, making her hiss as it pulled her to a stop. Bracken shoved her against the trunk of the nearest tree. What do you think you're doing? he asked incredulous. Lynetta's breath heaved in her chest as she struggled against him. He held her in place with little effort. The man hasn't even broken a sweat, she thought, feeling overwhelmed. Answer me, he hissed, coming closer. You're mad, aren't you? Either that, or you're an off-worlder. Which is it? No, she said, the bark digging into her bag as she tried and failed to pull away from him. Let me go. Let you run into the wilds and get killed, he growled. Not leafing likely. The way he looked at her, into her, left her feeling exposed. I'm Fay, she admitted, her breath choppy. And I'm not mad, at least as far as I know. Then where did you come from? What are you doing? Proving a point. Fear still had a hold on her, but she had more courage than she'd thought. You said the forest is deadly to all Fay, and yet here we stand, unharmed. Bracken's eyes narrowed. Don't change the subject. Tell me the truth. His fingers tightened on her arms, his gaze fiery. There was no way to escape, no way to free herself from his iron grip. It's time to confess. Her mouth opened, then she paused as a sudden wind blew past them, strong enough to ruffle her gown and toss her hair into her face. They turned to face the wind, Lynetta sensing that it wasn't a random occurrence. There was the sudden twang of an arrow string, and a second later an arrow embedded itself in the tree they were standing against. You see? Bracken croaked. There's that danger I warned you about. Crow feathers, she cried in her mind, comprehending that what she thought she knew as little of it as there was might not correspond to reality. How many bad decisions can a girl make? Chapter 6 For a moment, time froze, leaving Lynetta gasping for breath. Nothing had been easy since she woke up with her memory erased, leading up to this moment in which someone was actively trying to kill her. Just one hit after the other, she thought, hopelessness colliding with the fear that filled her. Bracken spun them around to the other side of the tree, seeking to shield them from the arrow fire. The muscular fay covered her with his larger body, making it difficult for her to see. She could feel his heartbeat beating in his chest, an even rhythm that put her own jumpy pulse to shame. Lynetta knew she should be terrified, and she'd had a healthy dose of fright, but having Bracken beside her, watching over her, kept her from blind panic. He looks every part the hero. Quit squirming, he said in a whispered growl, and keep quiet. She watched as he slowly drew his rapier, maintaining absolute silence. Bracken's body was on alert, every muscle tensed, and she couldn't help but admire him. Focus, Lynetta, she scolded herself. She tried to control her breathing, but she felt slightly claustrophobic, pinned to the tree by her protector. Who in the realm is shooting at us? Her thoughts were flying faster than the arrows peppering the trees around them. Bracken had warned her about monsters in the woods, but she'd never heard of actual monsters operating a bow at all, let alone with this skill. Someone is in the forest picking off whoever wanders in. How is it possible that they can patrol the expanse of wilderness to be able to find us so quickly? It could be coincidence, she reasoned, but it seemed unlikely. Maybe they were being followed, stalked by someone in the woods like Bracken had mentioned earlier. But who? Could that same person also be responsible for my memory loss? She could feel the lump at the back of her skull pulsing dully. You could be wrong, like you've been wrong about everything else. You probably fell and knocked your brain loose, and if that's true, then the person shooting arrows at us has nothing to do with me, which means we could really be facing down one of the monsters Bracken warned me about, or someone else, maybe someone worse. 
A chill went through her, and she suddenly wished for a weapon of her own. Bracken poked his head around the tree, trying to spot their enemy, then quickly pulled it back as another arrow whizzed past. His eyes locked under hers, and he spoke his tone serious. When I say to run, you will race back out of the forest and to the road as quickly as you can. His tone was filled with a confidence that she was nowhere near feeling. Bracken in that moment was every inch a leader, making her wonder for a second why he hadn't attained a rank above Velux yet. He could be in front of an army, giving orders to troops about to face their own death. She gave him a nod of understanding, even as fright played its way up her backbone like a lithophone. Lynetta braced herself, watching as Bracken sheathed his weapon and bent slowly to retrieve a sizable rock from near his foot. With a sudden burst of activity, he threw the rock as hard as he could away from them. Then he grabbed her hand, yelled, RUN! and ran. It took a second for her brain to catch up, and by the time it did, he was already yanking her away from the tree, pushing her in front of him and following behind, still trying to shelter her body with his own. Lynetta put on a burst of speed, but she was no match for her guardian, who shoved her sideways behind a large bramble bush that would act as cover for the rain of arrows. Bracken was faster than anyone she'd ever seen, and she'd wondered if his ability was magical in origin. It was an immediate struggle to keep up. The skirts of her ankle-length gown kept catching up her feet, slowing them down. She bent to free them, narrowly avoiding the arrow that filled the space above her a second later. Several more thwacked into the trees around them. Damn it! her companion hollered, and a moment later Bracken was sweeping her up and tossing her over his shoulder. Then they were running, faster than Lynetta could have run on her own. Moments later they burst through the greenery and stumbled out onto the grass beside the road. Bracken tossed her down behind a wide square mark of stone and crouched beside her, his eyes on the forest they'd just escaped. Her breath sawed out of her, but Bracken was motionless. She wasn't sure how long they sat like that, her limbs shaking with leftover adrenaline. When no one had followed them out of the forest, many minutes later, she saw his muscles finally relax. Bracken let out a long breath then turned to her, his eyes seeming to shine in the fading light. He shook his head, then laid into her. How in the realm could you be so idiotic as to run into the forest, right after I just told you how unsafe it was? Lynetta shook her head, words abandoning her. How do I tell him that I thought he was on the verge of prying my secret out of me? That I thought he was overstating the danger of our surroundings. I'm stuck with this guy until I figure out who I am, or we reach the capital. I'm never going to make it if I keep melting down like this. Bracken's hands came up to cup her face. They were surprisingly warm but rough, the toughened skin giving away their use. How could you put yourself in danger like that? She could feel his anger coursing through him, but his touch was surprisingly tender. Lynetta wasn't sure how to feel, so she looked away until he removed his hands. His lips compressed to a thin line and disappointment radiated from him. Tired of feeling off balance because of his wild moods, she pulled away, emotionally and physically. Lynetta stood and began to brush off her gown with vigorous swipes distracting herself from the moment that had just passed between them. Bracken rose to his feet and stared down at her, his features tight. Will you always refuse to answer my questions? That's another question, she said waspishly, her anger boiling over suddenly. Maybe I'd be more forthcoming if you weren't constantly badgering me. The adrenaline was fading, leaving her feeling tired and peevish. But Bracken was spoiling for a fight, and he was more than happy to give more than he got. You are the craziest woman I've ever met, he exploded, his eyes wide, his stance confrontational. Chest expanded, eyes blazing, nostrils flaring. He was the epitome of an offended alpha male. Well... Maybe I'm the alpha female, she thought, squaring her shoulders. And you're the bossiest man. Her arms crossed over her chest. She looked at him sideways. How could I not try to escape from you and your obnoxious commands? He covered his face with his hands, then let out a strangled groan. I can't believe you. You're leaving unbelievable. Her hands found their way to her hips. Me? You were the one tossing around wild accusations. I thought you were on the verge of assaulting me. His hands dropped to his sides, his face like a thundercloud. Bracken charged forward, grabbing her with a speed that once again surprised her. 
His hands dug into her arms, his anger vibrating from him, making her skin tingle. You really think I'd assault you after the way I protected you just now? Protected, she scoffed, lifting her hands to his chest to push him away. Throwing me over your shoulder like a sack of grain was hardly protecting me. His eyes flashed at those words, and he gave her a look that told her to back down. Well, I'm not in the mood to take any more orders from him. She looked up at him, just as he did. Between them, a sudden crackle of energy put her further on edge. The moment expanded until it was a potent thing, until the energy seemed to encircle them in a way that had her nearly panting. And then he was kissing her. His lips crashed into hers, catching her off guard. They were soft and yet demanding, insistent against her own mouth in a way that made her knees weak. The need to surrender washed over her, and her hands crept to encircle his neck just as his moved from her arms to encircle her waist and hold her against him. By the light itself, this man is something else. She let her lips open, persuaded by his gently questioning tongue, and Bracken did not hesitate. He deepened the kiss, making her swoon, her body melting into his like iron in a forge. Please, please, don't let him stop. Chapter 7 Oh, holy heavens, this has to stop. Her brain was having trouble comprehending that she was locking lips with the hot faced soldier sent to escort her to the capital. He was kissing her like he meant it, and she was kissing him back. I don't remember if I've ever been kissed by someone before, but I'm positive that I've never felt such a scorching kiss. That I would remember, but this is something I don't think I could ever forget. Lynetta hesitated, afraid of falling deeper under the handsome face spell. He's already bossy enough. If he figures out he can control me simply by kissing me, I'll be royally screwed. Still, she couldn't force herself to pull away. Bracken must have sensed her hesitation because he broke the kiss off suddenly. He staggered back a few steps, breathing heavily and cursing. Lifting his face into the sky, he frowned and closed his eyes. When he opened them again, he focused them on her. We've got to start moving or we'll never make it to Carter's Dam before nightfall. He trudged back to the road and headed off, muttering to himself about dangers and distractions. Lynetta let out a long breath, shaken by what had just happened between them. When she'd gotten her head on straight again, she looked down at her gown and the slippers that had been a royal pain for too long. She bent to pick up her hem, then pulled hard at the fabric until it tore. It took several tries and a few accidents, but she finally managed to rip away most of her gown below the knees, making it much easier to walk. Ignoring the slit she'd torn to nearly the top of her thigh on the one side, she tossed the excess fabric to the side. Then she kicked off her slippers and flexed her toes in the soft grass beside the road. No shoes are better than those, she figured, then walked to the road, stepping gingerly onto the dirt and gravel track. She expected to feel uncomfortable at the sensation of hard and pointed rocks under her soles, but her feet felt remarkably better. Maybe I'm used to going around barefoot, she mused, then frowned. That doesn't make much sense if I'm a member of the nobility. Nothing seems to make sense at all, she admitted to herself, fighting a wave of despair. Lynetta looked up at Bracken's whistle. He was looking back at her, his strong jaw tightening. Put some speed in it, will you? Maybe you have some magical means of traveling at night, but orders are from all military personnel to avoid traveling by night at all costs. With a sigh, she quickened her steps, not catching up with him, but getting closer. She could use a little space to come to terms with the events since her unexpected memory loss. They walked without speaking, the miles stretching out before them as the sun started to sink below the trees. The sun was setting when they made their way through the double gates at the south end of Carter's Dam. Although she told Bracken she'd come this way on her journey to the village where they'd met, she remembered nothing about the city she saw around her. It didn't take long for her to see that the streets were laid out along a system of canals. The canals made a ring of sorts of a half circle on each side of the city. Carter's Dam was divided by the Elmstill River which flowed down the middle of it, cutting off north from south. The canals mirrored each other on each side, many of them teeming with small boats even at this hour. It was more activity than she'd seen yet since her rebirth yesterday. They reached the center of the city where Lynetta paused to stare across the Elmstill. 
her eyes landed on a large ferry that was moving from one side to the other, a handful of figures waiting for their journey to end. A hand on her shoulder made her stiffen, the remnants of a half-remembered dream rattling her. She turned around to see Bracken scowling at her. "'Come on, Thean is just down there,' he said, jerking his thumb down the cobblestone street. "'We'll sleep here tonight and cross the river in the morning.' She followed him down the way, and he craned his neck around. Don't worry, we'll sleep in separate rooms tonight, although I guess I should be the one who's relieved since I was the one sleeping in the stables last night. She tried very hard not to roll her eyes at him. It was even harder to resist when they reached the inn, and he held out his hand for money from her pouch. The smiling sailor inn was painted in a jaunty blue and white, paintings of river boats interspersed among coiled ropes and bits of sail. Bracken was negotiating with a rosy-cheeked woman with a plump build who stood behind the low bar on the far wall. Lynetta opened her pouch and pulled out a few gold coins, passing them over to him. Her attention was distracted by the sound of raised voices, and she found herself peering through an open door that seemed to lead to a private dining room. A man entered and was greeted by the other well-heeled gentleman inside. They were gathered around a table that was piled high with what appeared to her hunger-driven brain to be a sumptuous feast of plenty. Her mouth was watering, her stomach screaming at her. She glanced back at the bar, willing the two to stop haggling and feed her. Once the price had been decided at last, she leaned in to address the innkeeper. Please send a plate of dinner up to my room as soon as possible. She snagged a key from Bracken's hand then hurried up the stairs eager to settle in. She threw open the door, relieved to find a tidy room with a small but comfortable-looking bed and her own private bathroom. There was a small table and chair, a wash basin and towels, and, wonder of wonders, a small wooden tub against the wall across from the bed. Shutting the door behind her, she took stock of her situation. My babysitter, as he considers himself, managed to get us here safely, despite a detour that could have turned deadly. Then let's not forget that kiss. She found herself at the memory. Of all the unexpected things that had happened to her in the past two days, that kiss had to be the most surprising of all. Not just because the hottest face she'd ever seen was the one doing the kissing, but because she hadn't wanted it to stop. He might infuriate her at every turn, but Bracken also ignited something inside her that continued to smolder even now. There was a knock at the door that brought her out of her reverie. Lynette opened it and in bustled the woman from downstairs, bearing a tray of steaming food. She took it, her stomach singing her praises even before she snuck a morsel into her mouth. "'Could you have some bath water brought up?' she asked, her voice filled with hope. The woman nodded and closed the door behind her. Lynette carried the tray to the small wooden table in front of a window. She leaned in to open it taking in a deep breath of fresh air to clear her head from her lingering memories of Bracken's kiss. She dug into the food, moaning with pleasure. They'd had a brief lunch of fruit and bread while walking earlier, but it hadn't provided enough sustenance to restore her flagging energy. The meal she was wolfing down now was much more satisfying. And it's all the better because I don't have to eat on my feet. By the time the innkeeper returned, two young boys in tow and all three with steaming buckets, she was mopping up the last of her gravy with the final bite of her biscuit. The plump woman set down her load, pulling the wooden bathtub away from the wall and dragging it in front of the fireplace. Then she bent to make a fire as the boys emptied the buckets into the small tub. Pointing her index finger at the logs situated in the fireplace, she flicked her wrist and the fire ignited, quickly sending up warm flames. Lynetta dug out a couple copper pieces from her pouch and passed them to the boys. They smiled twin smiles and she noticed that both were missing a tooth, one on the top and one on the bottom. It made them look all the more charming, and she waved as they walked out of the room, the innkeeper sweeping past her after them, shutting the door behind her once again. Excitement filled her as she watched the lazy swirls of steam circling above the tub. It took mere seconds to rip her stained gown off and climb out of her small clothes. Then she was dipping a toe into the water. The temperature was perfect, and Lynetta climbed in, sinking into the warm water with a sigh. The soap the innkeeper had left on the rim of the tub smelled of night-blooming elderflowers. 
She inhaled dreamily, then started to wash away the days of dirt from her body. Her hair followed, and at last she felt clean. Lynetta leaned back against the wooden tub, her eyes drifting closed. Moments later, she slipped into sleep, seamlessly wandering into a dream that was becoming all too familiar. Around her, the forest seemed to breathe with invisible life. A feeling of menace filled her as she looked down at the stream, where her reflection smiled up at her. I'm not smiling, she realized, her eyes widening in fear as her reflection's smile turned feral. That isn't me! You're me, remember? The voice echoed in her mind. At first she thought it was her own voice, but it sounded somehow foreign. I don't remember. Her thoughts were frantic, her heart beating as she anticipated what came next. A hand gripped her shoulder, turning her blood to ice. She took a deep breath, ready to turn around and find out who the hand belonged to. Instead, she woke up suddenly, her hands spasming and splashing water over the side of the tub. Her eyes flew open, flashing toward the open window and the shadow she saw just outside it. Lynetta screamed, a sudden uncontrolled burst. The shadow started freezing for a moment, then dropping out of sight. The door behind her burst open and she turned to see Bracken rushing inside, his rapier drawn and thrust before him. She pointed to the window, her hand shaking. He rushed across the room to the window, climbing onto the table to shove his head outside and look around in all directions. Coming back in, he slid to the floor, his brow furrowed. What is it? What am I looking for? Because there's nothing out there. A look of sudden recognition flitted over his face and Lynetta watched as the fact that she was naked in the tub dawned on him. She scrambled to grab a towel, shouting at him to look away. Bracken pivoted on the spot, moving to close the door and face it while she climbed out of the tub and wrapped a towel around herself. We should get some rest, he said, his gaze still averted. I could certainly use some, he added, the volume of his voice lowering. He shook his head, confidence returning to his tone. We cross the river in the morning, and I want to get an early start. Make sure you're ready to go at first light. Bracken opened the door and rushed through it, slamming it behind him. The Lynetta let out a huff, then sank onto the bed, mortified by their exchange. <sighs> I'd better just go to sleep, because I can't take anything else going wrong today. Chapter 8 She stared at her filthy stained gown and shook her head. I don't want to put that thing on again, she thought, biting her bottom lip. The problem was that the dress was all she had. That's not necessarily true. She glanced to where her coin pouch sat on a small table. Lynetta knew there was more than enough in there to afford a few new pieces. Stepping to the window, she saw the gauzy orange of the morning sky and knew Bracken would be along to collect her at any moment. Her nose wrinkling, she stepped into her wrecked gown and squared her shoulders, a plan unfolding in her mind. Moments later, there was a brusque knock at her door. Are you decent? She pulled open the door to take in the striking form of her travel companion. He looked the same as he had the previous two days, his attire clean and pressed, his countenance graced with what seemed to be a permanent scowl. Let's go, he said with a quick nod. They made their way downstairs to a mostly empty common room. She touted anyone would choose to rise this early. He even provided the delectable smells that were floating out of the kitchen. Bracken made a beeline for the bar expecting her to follow, but Lynetta had another plan in mind. It's time to shift the balance of power, she thought as she seated herself at a table next to a window that overlooked the quiet morning street. She primly folded her hands and stared out at the canal. Many of the small crafts she'd seen the day before were gone, replaced by waterfowl, who cruised around silently, hunting for the little silver fish that danced below the surface. What are you doing? She turned to find a confused Bracken standing next to the table. Waiting for breakfast, she said in a tone that let him know she found his question foolish. He looked down at the folded cloth napkin in his hand. I've packed a few things to hold us over until we reach the inn tonight. We've got many miles to go between here and the capital, and I'm in no mood to stretch this trip out any longer than necessary. I'm in no rush, she said breezily pointedly ignoring the napkin in his hand. He stared at her, the moment stretching out between them. She thought he might revolt, might insist she follow him out the door with only a handful of nuts and some dried fruit to sustain them through the day. 
she held her ground, behaving as a noble might with the servant. Bracken finally acquiesced, taking the seat across from her and signaling to the innkeeper. The woman bustled over, wiping her hands on her apron. She nodded and set off again after Bracken ordered breakfast, and a handful of minutes later, she returned with filled plates. Lunetta wasted no time in tucking in, spreading honey butter on a biscuit before biting into it. She followed it up with a bite of berries and cream, licking her lips to clear it of excess cream. Glancing up, she caught Bracken staring at her mouth. She looked away quickly, praying her cheeks weren't turning noticeably pink. The shuttle across happens each hour. If we hurry, we can catch the next one in about twenty minutes. We could, she said noncommittally, before taking another bite. After swallowing, she knew she had his full attention thanks to the pause. Or we could go shopping. His deadpan expression let her know she was in for an argument. Shopping? Are you serious? I am. Then she made him wait for her to finish a biscuit before speaking again. You said we have a long journey ahead, and I can't keep at it with clothing in this condition. We should keep going, he insisted. I want this journey over with as quickly as possible. And I want a pair of shoes that don't hobble me, she shot back. Besides, a woman of my station can't be seen in something like this, she said, rising and indicating her stained and torn attire. He shrugged a shoulder. I know you might be used to a wardrobe full of fine fabrics and accessories, but you don't need any of that on the road. Besides, you're the one who turned up without anything but the clothing on your back. Shouldn't a woman of your station have a trunk or two traveling along with her? Lynette had shifted, balling up her hands and putting them on her hips. Bracken looked down just as she moved, exposing the length of her thigh from the accidental slit in the side of the gown. His face tightened, and he expelled a loud breath. <sighs> Fine, he grumbled at last under his breath. But hurry up and finish breakfast. As she sat and dug into her plate once again, he laid out the ground rules. We go to one shop and one shop only. Pick out some sturdy shoes and a simple dress, and then we're heading straight to the ferry. Lynetta chewed, ignoring him. She'd get what she wanted because she was the one holding the coin purse not to mention wearing the ring of a noblewoman. I could get used to this kind of lifestyle, she thought, suppressing a smile. Maybe I should lean into it, accept my station, and use it to my advantage. It couldn't hurt to try, she figured, and straightened her spine, ready to take on the world with her new image. Let me see the one in yellow, she pointed to the shelf, and the fake clerk hurried to do her bidding. Let me see the one in yellow, Bracken marked his arms crossed as he leaned against the wall and watched the goings-on. You women and your incessant need to acquire. Lynetta took the dress from the clerk, thanking her, then held it up to herself. I'm sorry that I haven't been assigned a uniform like you have. That means I have to come up with my own, and if that's the case, why not make it flattering? The clerk giggled, hiding a smile behind her hand. Lynetta glanced up at Bracken and saw the corners of his mouth quirking up. She hid her own smile, passing the dress back to the clerk. I think the lavender one is better, don't you? Yes, my lady, the clerk said with a quick bob. I'll wrap it up for you. And the slippers, Lynetta reminded. Bracken watched the clerk as she scurried to place the purchases in a box and tie it closed with ribbon. Those slippers are no better than the ones you tossed away yesterday, he grumbled. Yes, but I need a functional pair in case the situation calls for formal dress, she replied, scanning the small shop for anything else that might be of use. They'd stopped into the first shop they'd found, and although its wares were finely made and expensive, they weren't what she'd been hoping for. Still, it made sense to buy one outfit that broadcast her position as a wealthy member of society. She had no idea what the future might bring, and if she needed to look the part. She wanted to be able to. Lynetta made her way to the door and backed on the street, looking for another storefront that might hold the things she was after. Bracken followed the box of goods tucked under one muscular arm. Don't you want to change into this? he asked, holding the door open with his body. She shook her head. It's not what I'll be wearing today. Heading off down the street, she heard his groan, even though he attempted to muffle it. He trudged after her, his footsteps heavy. Lynetta smiled, finding it amusing to needle Bracken a little. 
He was so demanding, so focused on his mission, that she couldn't help enjoying her chance to take control and give him a dose of his own medicine. That looks like a row of shops down there, she said, pointing down the street to their left when they reached an intersection. We only need one shop, he reminded her, but she could tell by the tone of his voice that he'd accepted their shopping trip wouldn't be as short as he'd hoped. He was stoic in the first shop, following her around as she turned down every selection the clerk offered, then left. The second shop, he paused in front of the window where a form model was displaying an intricate gown in plaid with a confusing array of ribbons. Please don't tell me you're buying this one. She looked the dress over with a critical eye. Honestly, I think it would look better on you than me. Want me to buy it for you? He looked at her like she'd grown another head, then let out a burst of unexpected laughter. It was gone as quickly as it had arrived, but Lynetta smiled, pleased to have forced Bracken to laugh. It seemed to break the ice between them, and as she walked the aisles of the shop, he cracked his own jokes at the wares and on display. This would go with my uniform, he said, lifting an ornate blue hat on which was perched a replica blue bird hovering over a nest of speckled eggs. It was her turn to laugh, nodding along, then asking whether they had it in an extra large so it would fit him. Bracken shook his head, then tossed her a brocade corset sparkling with melted crystals. This looks like something up your alley. She held it up, watching it sparkle in the light. Why bother with the chandelier when you have this thing? They ended up leaving that store without a purchase as well. Who would have thought you were so picky? He asked in a mock surprised tone. Oh, wait, that would be me. This shop looks promising, she said, pointing to the dark wood exterior of a storefront across the street. Bracken followed her in the door, then looked around, his expression confused. This isn't your cup of tea at all, he said indicating the sturdy wool and linen articles on display. You'd look like you just made your way in from the fields in something like that. Lynetta ignored him, motioning for the clerk. A fade gentleman in leather breeches and a rough linen tunic attended her. How can I be of service? I'll be making a journey to the capital soon, and I need something more functional than what I have on. The clerk looked her up and down, taking in her ripped gown and nodding his head. Almost anything would be more functional than that. We agree then, she replied with a smile. Why don't you bring me some breeches like the ones you're wearing? Bracken's eyes widened from where he stood in front of a rack of aprons. Breeches? Did I hear you right? She nodded. They'll make walking easier. Riding even more so. Lynetta made her way to a shelf that held cotton and linen shirts and started searching them all for her size. I'll need undergarments as well, she called out. Something serviceable that doesn't chafe. The clerk returned with a small pile of folded items, which he passed over to her, then led her to a small area with a mirror and a curtain that he pulled across behind him, leaving her with privacy to change. Lynetta took off her gown, which she considered more like a pile of useless rags, and hurried to slip into the soft cotton undergarments he'd provided. It was a bit of a struggle to put the breeches on, and when she saw them in the mirror, she almost fainted. They molded to her body, showing off every angle and curve. She turned around and looked over her shoulder, admiring the way the soft brown leather cupped her behind. The breeches would be durable, provided protection from the rain, and wouldn't impede her movement, which was key when you were being stalked by shadows armed with deadly arrows. She tossed on a tunic-style linen shirt, not bothering to tie up the front and exposing a little of her cotton chemise underneath. Lynetta tucked the blouse into her breeches, then pulled back the curtain to get Bracken's opinion. The look on his face said everything. He swallowed hard, and when he spoke, his voice was rough. "'You can't wear those!' "'Why not?' she asked lightly, shifting from side to side. "'They're comfortable, fit well.' and will be a damn sight better than a dress while we're on the road. He couldn't argue those points, so he stood there silently, his eyes roaming her body in a way that made her insides tingle. She ignored the feeling, heading over to examine their selection of well-made boots. She found two pairs she liked and handed them to the clerk. This is more appropriate, I think. Lynetta turned at the sound of Bracken's voice, finding him holding out a simple shift dress in a light pink shade. 
the half sleeves belled slightly around the elbows, and she knew the fabric would reach its end just below her knees. She could tell it was his way of compromising, offering her something more demure than the fig of hugging breeches. Thank you, she said gently, deciding to push back their eventual confrontation until later. I'll try this one on. It fit well enough, although it wasn't her favorite, but the fact that Bracken had followed her around from shop to shop with a minimum of complaints made her feel like he'd earned a reward. I'll take it, she said, when she came back out of the fitting alcove, handing the breeches and blouse she'd taken off to the clerk to pack away. She then strapped on a pair of the boots she'd selected and gave a nod to indicate her satisfaction. By the time they left the shop, she was several coins lighter, while Bracken was burdened down with multiple boxes. He carried the stack in front of him with a balance that Lynette admired. "'Where to now?' Bracken asked. Lynette looked overhead and realized it was already afternoon. Her stomach growled, reminding her that they'd skipped lunch. "'Back to the inn!' The innkeeper's cooking is a cut above what I've seen served in the other establishments we've passed. Let's go back for another plate. Heading back toward the inn, she paused as they passed a shop selling weapons. The display in the window was an array of swords, knives, quivers, and bolts. Let's stop here, she said, not waiting for Bracken to respond. The bell affixed above the door announced their arrival, and a portly man with closed cropped hair and some of the biggest ears she'd ever seen greeted her. It took a minute for her to realize that his skin held a tinge of green, and when he smiled to welcome her, two pointed teeth protruded from his lower jaw. An Arthwalder, she thought, smiling back. I think he must be a half-orc. Lynetta knew that full orcs were rarely seen away from their own kind, and were considered brutish and cruel. Still, they were known to be well-versed in weaponry, and it seemed that this one had gone into the family business. "'What's a pretty fairy like you doing in a place like this?' he asked, with a waggle of his heavy black brows. "'Looking for something sharp,' she replied, making the half-orc laugh. Bracken struggled to find a spot to set down his boxes, then turned to her. "'What are we doing here?' She moved closer to him to whisper her response. "'If I'm going to be in danger, I deserve some protection.' "'That's what I'm here for,' he whispered back, his voice rough. "'I appreciate that.' But I'm a girl who likes to take care of herself, she said, then slapped him on the back. Now, let me find something I can poke someone with if need be. Bracken pursed his lips, then pushed past her toward the counter where the half-orc shopkeeper stood. Find me a blade that is balanced but lightweight, something that could be tucked out of sight. Lynetta stood back as the soldier and shopkeeper conferred. Her eyes flicked to a wall of bows hanging from pegs flanked by several quivers full of arrows. She fought off a chill at the sight, remembering fleeing from the arrows the day before. And yet, something about the bows drew her attention. She moved closer, lifting a finger to trace a bow's delicate curve. This will do, she heard Bracken say, then he called to her. She returned to the counter to see the dagger Bracken had chosen. The sheath should fit in your boot, allowing you the element of surprise. I'll take it. The shopkeeper complimented her on her choice then smiled eagerly as she counted out his coins. "'Take good care of the blade end of yourself,' he said, pushing the dagger across the counter toward her. Bracken snatched it before she could, then bent, taking hold of her boot and working the sheath down inside it. "'Try and pull the dagger out now,' he said, moving his hand so she felt it cupping her calf. Lynetta licked her lips, trying to ignore the tingles his touch gave her. She bent, reaching into her boot to snag the hilt and draw the dagger. It works, she said, then carefully returned the blade to its sheath, being careful not to nick herself. Bracken retrieved her boxes, and they set out again in the direction of the inn. Climbing in the steps of the sailing sailor, she pulled open the door and walked inside. They'd made progress today, but there was still a little shopping to go. She turned her head back to speak to Bracken, who was following behind with his stack of boxes. Before we leave Carter's Dam, we're going to have to buy some horses— I'm not willing to walk all the way back to the capital, and besides, it will make the journey quicker, which you seem to. Her words were cut off as she bumped into something and bounced backward. She turned to face whatever blocked her path, then blushed when she realized it was an attractive fey male. My apologies, he said, with a small grin on his handsome face. I should have watched where I was going. 
My fault entirely, she replied, pressing a hand to her chest. The well-dressed man looked down at her hand, his eyes narrowing. Then his smile widened. He held out his hand to her. Lord Malvo, at your service. Lynetta looked down at his hand and noticed a ring nearly identical to her own. A crown with four points. Another noble. She blinked up at him before taking his hand and shaking it. Chapter 9 "'It isn't often that I meet another noble so far from Ixaria,' Lord Malvo said, his eyes taking her in. "'Where?' she asked distractedly, her heart pounding. Not only was the man standing in front of her attractive, but he also had the trappings of wealth that she'd yet to see on her journey. Along with the ring that marked him as a noble, he had a couple more rings and a gold circled one wrist.' His clothing was not only well made, but it was also fashioned from luxury fabrics. The nobleman's hair was also styled in waves, a rich chestnut that went well with his light brown eyes. The capital? The place I thought I just heard you say you were heading? His smile remained, but she could see it teetering. Of course, she smiled blithely, waving her hand as if to dismiss her ignorance. I must have misheard you. Malvo nodded, his gracious grin back in place, but it didn't quite reach his eyes. They were filled with something she couldn't name. My lady, if it suits, I would love for you to join me for dinner tonight in my private dining room. Bracken, who had remained silent through the exchange, chose his moment to speak up. We're planning to grab a plate, then go. Too much to do to hang around here. The nobleman turned his head in Bracken's direction, a look of honest confusion on his face. Turning back to Lynetta, he cocked an eyebrow. Does your footman usually make the decisions? Lynetta realized his perception of her as a noble hung in the balance. No, he does not. I would love to join you this evening, Lord Malvo. He bowed, then straightened. I look forward to it. Then he moved past them and headed out the door, leaving Lynetta frozen there and wondering what she might have gotten herself into. "'Upstairs!' Bracken growled behind the boxes. "'Now!' He led the way to her room, which she realized now he hadn't returned the key for. It looked like they'd be staying another night, so it was likely a good thing. Bracken tossed the boxes on her bed and rounded on her. "'What in the seventeenth hells was that?' She shrugged a shoulder, reaching past him to organize the boxes he'd left in disarray. "'A girl's got to eat, right?' "'With that guy!' No, a girl most certainly does not. Bracken, just drop it. Dinner with Malvo represented an opportunity she couldn't miss. He was a noble, like she was, which meant he could be a fount of information for her, providing tidbits that Bracken might not be able to. Drop it, his face turned fierce. I don't know where this attitude is coming from, but I won't tolerate it. Oh, you won't. Her temper broke its leash and burst out uncontrolled. Well, guess what, Velix? You're not in charge here, she gave him a shove in the direction of the door. I will do as I please, and that includes dinner with Lord Malvo. Now go downstairs and let the innkeeper know we'll be here for another night. Bracken stood there, sputtering, his face red. She steeled herself, sure that he had a repeated response for her, but instead he turned and walked away leaving the door standing open behind him. She shut it, then sat on the bed, breathing heavily. Lynetta scrubbed her face with her hands, wishing things had gone differently. Despite his attitude at the beginning of the trip, shopping with Bracken had been more fun than anticipated. She hated to ruin the camaraderie they were reaching by pulling rank now. This is an opportunity you can't afford to miss, she told herself, straightening. If Malvo has information you need then your little tip with Bracken will be well worth it. She stood, moving to the wash basin to cleanse her hands and face. Then she began to organize her purchases, laying out the expensive lavender dress. Figuring it made sense to put her best foot forward, she changed into the only fancy gown she'd bought. Then she sat at the small table and used the new comb she'd acquired to brush out her hair. She counted from the first stroke to the hundredth, and she felt calmer after for reasons she still didn't understand. Her hair a shining cloud around her, her new dress smooth and sparkling, and her soft slippers on her feet, 
Lynetta made her way downstairs to the dining room, where Malvo and his mates had been the evening before. She wasn't sure if he'd be there yet, but when she opened the door, she found him sitting alone at the table. His eyes sparkled in the candlelight, and she had to admit to herself that he made a very charming picture. He rose at her entrance and bowed like a gentleman, pulling the chair across from his out for her to sit. She took her seat and lowered her eyes demurely, feeling off balance. I wish I remembered who I was. She knew enough to be polite, but she felt like there were hidden dangers in every direction the conversation might take. Breathing deeply, she tried to calm herself as he sat across from her and fixed her with his charming smile. I must begin with an apology. I'm embarrassed that I did not ask your name before inviting you to dinner. I hope you will forgive this appalling lapse in manners. His boyish smile said he wasn't entirely serious, but he was observing the forms of good etiquette. No apology needed, she replied. It's Lanetta. For a split second, an expression of shock hid his face, then just as quickly vanished, disguised by a look of admiration. I am sorry that I did not recognize you earlier. Everyone in the realm has heard of the lovely Lanetta Camara. Camara. She fought hard to hide her surprise. She remembered hearing it before being plied with Khmer and summer wine and having it tug at her memories. Now it seemed with good reason. Lynetta Camara, that's me. So why doesn't it seem quite right? I hope that I've not offended you with this invitation. Your station is much higher than mine, and had I known you were Lady Camara, I might have been too afraid to invite you to dinner. She wasn't sure how to respond, so she said nothing. Instead, fidgeting in her chair and placing her napkin in her lap. I must admit, he said more softly, I've seen you from afar at events in the capital, but being this close to you is a bit intoxicating. You're quite the charmer, aren't you? She said, hoping to deflect from the direction the conversation seemed to be heading. Where are your companions? I noticed you yesterday evening with a small crowd gathered around this table. Malvo angled his head and looked at her. The legendary Lynetta Camara was spying on me? Should I be flattered or frightened? She laughed, unable to help herself. It was just a question, nothing more. What about your own retinue? Beyond the mouthy footman, you must have a train of retainers. Legendary? A train of retainers? Who am I? Queen of the Fae? You could be, he countered. You're beautiful enough to rule a thousand kingdoms, and your family is ancient enough. You could easily be the consort of the king. But I am not, she insisted, wondering when the conversation went into the wilderness. I have no aspirations to rule a kingdom. Malvo nodded, and the door opened. The innkeeper bustled in, the two boys following, all three carrying trays full of dishes. They sat quietly as the table was set, platters full of steaming meat, fresh fruits and vegetables, and a loaf of fluffy bread cut into slices. When they were alone again, Lynetta glanced at Malvo, wondering whether she could serve herself, but not wanting to break any protocols she wasn't aware of. "'Looks good, doesn't it?' he said. "'May I serve you?' She nodded, relieved, as he filled her plate for her. Picking up a fork, she stabbed a vegetable and carried it to her mouth. As she chewed, Malvo continued the conversation. Now it makes sense why you're this far south. I know your family has lands down here. Were you visiting the family estate? Lynetta nodded, figuring it was safe to assign that reason to her presence here. Maybe he's right. Maybe I was visiting my estate. It was frustrating not to know her own motivations. Still, Malvo seems to know plenty about me. Maybe I just listened and let him fill in the details. Have you missed the capital? Things are much different so far away from the bustle of our home. She shrugged a shoulder in response. Sometimes it's nice to get away, she admitted between bites. He shook his head. You are not what I expected. Is that a good thing? she asked, a grin playing with the corners of her mouth. It is, he replied, his voice heavy with a meaning she couldn't understand. So many noble women stare down their noses and act as if they're made of ice. Untouchable. You're very relatable. Thank you, 
she said with a nod of her head, taking notes as he described the social dynamics of the capital. She knew she wasn't acting like a typical noble, but by the time she reached the capital, she might be able to blend in better. So, when will you and your retinue depart for the capital? He asked after the innkeeper had returned with a dessert platter filled with tiny intricate cakes. She selected a cake and cut into it with her fork, delighted to see a ribbon of sweet cream in the center. By retinue, you mean my mouthy footbin, she laughed. We're leaving soon. Tomorrow, if he has his way. Malva's jaw dropped open. An important noblewoman like you, traveling with only one footman. That can't be possible. I, I had to depart the estate suddenly. I had no time to gather a retinue, as you say. She was making things up on the fly again and hoping she didn't make a misstep. My footman watches over me, and as you saw, he's very comfortable giving me orders for my own good. A footman is no substitute for a security force. It is too dangerous to leave you to travel alone. You must allow me to escort you back to the capital. My men and I will keep you safe. Oh, that's unnecessary, she said, although a very kind offer. Malvo leaned in to reach across the table, putting his hand on hers. His eyes were filled with emotion. Please allow me to protect you. I could never forgive myself if anything were to happen to you. Lynetta's appetite vanished and she set down her fork. Gently, she pulled her hand away from his. You are a true gentleman, she said with a gracious incline of her head. I must, of course, accept. Malvo smiled, his teeth white and even in his handsome face. Good. My men and I will make certain you return to the capital safely. Her stomach sinking, Lynetta immediately regretted her decision. But there was no way to get around his insistence, just as there was no way to take her accepting his offer back. He's been useful so far, she told herself. Maybe I'll learn even more on the trip back to the capital. That wasn't the only thing that was weighing on her. Her dinner turning to stone in her stomach, she let out a long breath. Bracken is not going to be pleased about this. Chapter 10 Back in her room, her emotions were in turmoil. Not only was she fighting to understand her place in the realm with no real memories of her own, but she was only getting in deeper, events swirling around her to pull her in way over her head. In order to calm down, she reached for one of the only things that felt familiar. Her comb slid through her hair over and over as she counted the strokes. There was a knock at her door, then it opened, revealing a dour-faced bracken. He stood at the end of her bed, and she saw him roll her eyes. Combing your hair again? I see vanity and nobility seem to go hand in hand. Lynetta set down her comb, the calm she fought for abandoning her. She said nothing, exhausted already by the exchange they were about to have. Her muscles tightened, and she pulled on the reservoir of her inner strength that she feared she might deplete too soon. Did you enjoy your dinner date? he asked, still poking at her. It was the prompt she needed to say what she had to. Lord Malvo and his men will be accompanying us on our journey back to the capital. Bracken froze, then burst into laughter. Ha <laughs> ha! Your sense of humor is unleafing believable! He shoved a box out of the way and sat on her bed. I'm not joking, Velix, she replied, her tone even but laced with authority. Lord Malvo offered me protection, and I took it. Protection? From that acorn hoarder? Don't make me laugh. There is no need to curse, she said, lifting her chin to indicate her offense. He's a noble, like me, and he has a retinue to watch his back. I would be a fool to refuse his assistance. I'm protecting you, a trained soldier of the realm. We don't need Malvo and his men slowing us down. Besides, he's a stranger. You have no idea what his intent is. His words were urgent, his expression heated. You're no less a stranger, she pointed out. Lord Malvo is another member of my class. There is a mutual respect there. She left the rest unspoken, but Bracken picked up on the words she didn't say. And you have no respect for me, just because I don't have a fancy ring. He stood bristling with anger and took a few steps forward. 
Forgeries of those leafing rings can be picked up at any shadowy market or underhanded dealer. Anyone could pick one up and pretend to be a noble. Pretending to be a noble? Maybe that's what I'm doing, too. In his attacking Malvo, he'd inadvertently gotten to the heart of her own fears. She leapt from her seat, wanting to shut down those doubts inside herself, as well as his argument. Are you suggesting that he is not what he professes to be? I have not seen anything that makes me doubt his words. He's been the perfect gentleman, while you, on the other hand... Her words trailed off, hanging between them. Bracken took another step forward, his wrath radiating from him. You shouldn't be so trusting, he said, his voice low and rough. His eyes were filled with fire, his expression sharp, but she couldn't stop her body from responding to him. He was the finest example of a fey male form that she could ever remember seeing. Then again, my memory is faulty. She realized they were standing only a foot apart, and the closeness was starting to wear on her. Her mind didn't seem to work when Bracken was this near. Lynetta held up her head. Stop. I'm not in the mood for an argument. I'm going with Lord Malvo. You can come if you want, but you don't have to. His hand rose to clamp itself around her upper arm. You're the one who needs to stop. Have you forgotten how I was ordered to take you back to the capital? If you don't agree, then you can lie about leaving me, she said, her tone flippant. Bracken stiffened, his face turning red. She expected him to shout, to call her crazy, to demand that she leave with him immediately, Malvo be damned. Instead, he turned on his heel and departed. Pausing at the door, he spoke again, not bothering to turn back. Your new horses will be ready to ride at dawn. He left, slamming the door behind him, and Lynetta fell back into her seat, slumping down, all the energy leaving her. She'd heard him. That was obvious, but she couldn't see another way to do things. I'm caught in a trap through no fault of my own, and I can't trust anyone completely, no matter how badly I might want to. There was a knock at the door, and she straightened, worried that Bracken was back for another round of arguing. Come in, she said after a moment when the door didn't open on its own. The innkeeper stood outside, her round face concerned. I heard Ray's voices and the door slammed, my lady. Is anything wrong? Lynetta gave the woman a soft smile. Nothing that a good night's sleep couldn't fix, she said lightly hoping that it would well convince the innkeeper that all was well. The plump woman looked sceptical, but she bobbed her head. Perhaps a bath before bed, she offered. Since Lynetta wasn't certain how long it would be before she could bathe again, it was an offer she could not resist. That would be lovely. She puttered around the room, organizing her things while she waited for the innkeeper to return with her small assistance. When the tub was filled at last, she stood staring at it, the memory of what had happened last time haunting her. The window was closed, the thin lace curtain drawn. Night had fallen, leaving the world beyond the window a dim and formless grey. Slowly she drew off her clothes, keeping an eye on the window. A feeling of being watched pervaded her, but she told herself it was only her nerves. The water was warm when she finally sat in the tub, and she let herself be soothed trying to wash away the anxiety that had haunted her since she'd woken up with no memory. She picked up the soap and inhaled its floral scent, then washed herself, her mind blank on purpose. Her attention has turned wholly to the task at hand, because if she let it wander, it always led back to Bracken. She'd only known the man for a few days, but he'd made quite an impression in that time. His surliness and his overbearing demeanor were not points in his favor, but if she knew one thing about him, it was that he was devoted to protecting her. It's his mission, she reminded herself. If something happens to me, his superiors will find out and punish him accordingly. But something told Lynetta it wasn't his superiors that worried him. His entire attitude screamed that he didn't care for the voices of authority. His own code of honor kept him by her side, she suspected, although that didn't stop him from complaining about everything she did. And then there was Malvo. 
the nobleman with a code of honour of his own. Malvo seemed to know who she was, and he was keen to be the one protecting her. He seemed to perk up when he learned who I was. No doubt he expects a rise in station as the man who brought Lynetta Camara back to the capital. Or maybe he's just being a gentleman. She let out a burst of frustrated air. Her nerves told her there was danger all around her, and putting her trust in anyone was a risk. But going it alone was impossible. She now understood the danger of the wilds, and her time in civilization hadn't been without its problems either. Remembering how quickly her time at the Green Gate had dissolved into chaos, she was firm in her resistance to spurning any protection. Still, she could see the path that lay ahead. Although telling the future wasn't a power she'd been given, any fae could see that Malvo and Bracken would butt heads. Lynetta wasn't sure how long she could keep Bracken in his place, nor how long Malvo would remain a gentleman when faced with the Velux's insolence. When it comes down to it, Malvo has information I need. There was no way around it. Refusing the nobleman's offer would have been foolish. He knew my last name, and a whole lot more about me. I've got to find out who Lynetta Camara is until I can recover my memory on my own. The fact that Bracken wasn't going to like taking orders, not from her, and especially not from Lord Malvo, was something she was going to have to look past. It didn't feel good, accepting that truth. Bracken might act like a jerk, but he'd kept her safe. Subjecting him to Malvo might end up driving him away, and she didn't want to think about that. The water around her had cooled by the time she finally pulled herself out of the bath. Lynetta wrapped herself in a towel and sat, picking up her comb to again brush through her long, honey-blonde hair. She was almost on the verge of sleep as she counted, finally having relaxed after a stressful evening. Ninety-three, she whispered a long, slow stroke that had her eyes fluttering closed. Ninety-four... Ninety-five. She drifted, the hand holding the comb falling limp into her lap. On the verge of succumbing to her slumber, her consciousness picked up on the tiny shift in the room, the smallest of movements, the softest creak in the floor. Lynetta bolted awake, dropping her comb. She swiveled around, staring at a shadow-draped corner where the movement had come from. There was nothing there, but she felt suddenly cold. She climbed into her cotton shift and scurried beneath the blankets, goose pimples breaking out over her skin. Someone was watching me. Sleep felt very far away. Chapter 11 The river swirled past the ferry, and Lynetta watched the light grey water twist and turn of its currents and eddies, wondering what secrets it was hiding. She felt like the river, her insides a raging torrent with hidden depths, what secrets would be revealed as I sink beneath the waves? What could leave a beautiful woman like you so distraught? She turned, pushing back a length of hair that had blown across her face without answering. Lord Malvo was looking at her, his expression different from the first one he'd given her at breakfast, when he'd realized she'd be wearing her breeches and blouse. His eyes had heated as they traveled her body, making her blush at the intimacy. Malvo, of course was as impeccably dressed this morning as he had been the day before. After he'd looked his fill, he'd invited her to dine with him and introduce her to his men. "'Each one will guard you with his life,' he assured her. There was Corvo, a tall, sinewy man, whose eyes were little more than slits. His dark hair was braided, a sword strapped to his back. Fenric, a man with shoulders that looked too wide to fit through a normal door, was a large and squat of a fay as she'd ever seen. His grin revealed two missing front teeth, which she'd caught him whistling through as they'd mounted their horses that morning. The last of the trio of men travelling with Malvo was the one she'd seen entering the private dining room her first night at the Smiling Sailor. Jif was his name, and he was a valet of sorts, as far as she could tell, for the nobleman. He followed a few steps behind the lord, fetching anything he needed. Although he was dressed similarly to Malvo, there was something about the man that was less polished, Lynetta attributed it to his youth, since he appeared at least a decade younger than his employer. 
Is something amiss, my lady? Malvo asked again, his expression full of concern. She blanked her face and gave him a meek smile. I'm fine. I was just remembering something I lost, like my mind. I hope that you find it again, he said, his tone solemn. Me too. She nodded, then excused herself to retrieve a water skin from her saddlebags. They'd been filled with the supplies this morning, along with an empty pack to carry her belongings. Bracken had negotiated for a couple of geldings who looked healthy and sleek. He'd also gathered supplies and made sure they were ready to depart this morning, but since they'd set out, he'd barely spoken two words. He was standing with the horses now, holding their reins as he looked toward the river bank where they were headed. The northern half of Carter's Dam awaited them, the streets and buildings looking very similar to the ones they'd just left. How long until we reach the next city? she asked him, more to discharge the weird energy between than anything else. Depends on your definition of city, he responded after a moment, one long enough to make her doubt he would respond at all. Gelder's Glen is the next thing you could call a city on our way, but we won't make it tonight. Thank you for the horses and the supplies, she said. I know we might not see eye to eye on things, but that doesn't mean I'm not grateful for your aid. She saw his jaw tighten. For a moment he was silent, then he turned, his eyes burning with intensity. We don't see eye to eye because you refuse to listen to my counsel. You may think you have the upper hand, but it's clear you're not experienced enough to be giving the orders. You're lucky I've stuck around, because with this lot, you're minutes away from being robbed blind and left for dead. Lynetta blinked at him. It's a little early for such vitriol, even for you, she hissed, her attempt at conciliation forgotten. I may not have your experience, but there's nothing cutthroat about Lord Malvo. Look at his men, he growled, his voice low so as not to be overheard. What sort of noble surrounds himself with men like these? They're one step removed from brigands. Is it so odd for a noble to employ hired men for protection? You yourself said the journey is dangerous. Why not hire fighters to make a would-be attacker think twice? Bracken shook his head. You're so hell-bent on turning Malvo into a hero. You aren't using your wits. We're almost to the other shore, my lady. Malvo called, coming closer. Be sure to brace yourself for when we tap the pier. Lynetta held on to her horse, who snorted in irritation when they bumped the docks on their arrival. She walked alongside the beast as Bracken led it and his own horse off the ferry and into the open area beyond the wooden dock. Wordlessly, he helped her into the saddle, then mounted his own horse. As they rode through the main street toward the northern gate, Lynetta was again relieved that she remembered how to ride. It seemed that some skills were unaffected by her lapse in memory, while other conventions were forgotten completely. She wished she could make sense of the pattern, but as of yet it all seemed random. She remembered some things and not others, for no rhyme or reason she could fathom. Less than an hour later they made their way through the gate with a crowd of other travellers headed north. Many were on foot so it took time to walk their horses through the milling bodies until they reached a clear patch of road and could pick up the pace. As soon as they were able, her companions established a loose formation around her, with Malvo riding at her side, Bracken and Corvo at the front, and Finric and Jiff at the rear. Other riders passed them occasionally while they rode, the sun climbing higher in the sky. It was past noon when they stopped for lunch, Lynetta relieved to be able to climb off her horse, her bottom nearly numb from her time in the saddle. They did not tarry, resting for only half an hour. But in that time, Malvo presented her with a miniature feast of cold pigeon, buttery croissants, fresh jam and hard cheese. I know it's not the type of fare you're used to, but it was the best to be found in Carter's Dam, the nobleman had said apologetically. It's delicious, she insisted. Riding makes me exceedingly hungry, she explained, feeling like a ninny. Doesn't it do the same to you? Indeed it does, he said, laughing. He then popped a piece of cheese into his mouth and grinned at her. She'd grinned back, finding Malvo more appealing the more she got to know him. The afternoon was spent in quiet conversation as they rode north. Malvo kept her amused with his stories of the capital, referring to this piece of gossip or that rumor Hen Lynetta played along, making speaking glances at him as if she knew the people he was talking about, but never dignifying anything with a comment. Bracken turned back to catch her in the act and had snorted derisively, then looked away. 
She was tempted to stick her tongue out at the soldier's back. Instead, she decided to ask Malvo questions she knew would rankle him. You know, loved Malvo, I never asked, what brings a nobleman like you so far south? A visit to your family estates as well? My family was never graced with lands as ample as yours, he admitted. I inherited a small citadel outside the city along with a townhouse in Exaria. Nothing like your family's vineyard said to stretch from one side of the realm to the other. <laughs> Surely they can't be that big, she said with a little ting laugh. I can't be that rich, can I? Malvo's eyes were twinkling. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but you are a member of one of the first families. That's wealth and influence is far above my own. Maybe I am that rich. You haven't answered my question, she prodded, making him chuckle. A business brings me south, milady. I've got to find a way to pay for the upkeep on the citadel. It's old and drafty, essentially an ancient money pit, but it entitles me to a ring, so I do what I can to keep it standing for the next generation. Lynetta nodded. His answer sounded reasonable enough. Not all nobles were rich, she assumed, despite their overall wealth. But I'm being rude, Malvo said, inclining his head in her direction. Please tell me more about you. Did you enjoy your visit to your family's estate? She wasn't certain how to respond, afraid to say anything that could lead to further questioning. To throw him off her scent, she aimed for something to shut down his questions without making him suspicious. Sometimes we are called home for reasons we would hope to avoid. Reasons that could be sensitive should they be picked up by the wrong ears. Say no more, my lady, he said, then moved his mount a little closer to hers. Coaching his voice lower, he fixed his gaze on her. Although I hope you know that I would never betray your trust, you have a true friend in me. I hope I do. You are too kind, Lord Malvo. As kind as you are beautiful, he replied, and she had to look away. Her eyes landed on the forest that lined the road. It looked closer than it had been earlier. Tell me about this forest, she said, suddenly feeling that eyes were upon her again. Sunlight seemed to disappear a few paces into the trees, and an unease crept over her. The wilds? What is there to tell? Malvo shrugged, his brow furrowing. Even those in the capital are starting to worry, and most of them haven't seen the wilds in ages, as they seldom leave Exaria. There have been rumors that it's been growing, encroaching on civilized lands. There have been disappearances, more than would be expected by Fay fleeing off-world, as rare as that is. And not all of it is rumors. I know for a fact that the wilds have been stirring. What do you know? she asked, her tone hushed, the feeling of being watched intensifying. There is a village farther south than Cottesdam, farther even than your estate. I saw it with my own eyes before meeting you. It had been swallowed whole by the forest. How did you see it then? Lynetta lifted her head at Bracken's voice. He'd slowed down so that he was riding right in front of them, turned back in the saddle to address Malvo. If you'd gone into the woods to find this village yourself, you wouldn't be with us right now to tell the tale. I did not enter the forest, you're right, Malvo admitted. There is a hill that overlooks the wilds, a bend in the road that used to look out over the village. I took that road, and I saw the village, empty of life save the vines and seedlings covering every square inch. He speaks the truth. This came from Jeff behind them. I saw it too. We all did. Lynetta's pulse skittered. Something doesn't feel right. Where were the inhabitants? Bracken asked. I do not know, Malvo frowned, his voice sounding hollow. We did not see any on the road, nor did we find any during our travels. No one wanted to talk about the wilds, maybe because they fear they are the next one in its path. This is ridiculous. Bracken scoffed. You're making up stories to scare her. It isn't a story, Malvo insisted, stiffening. And you've got quite a spine accusing a nobleman of lying. Bracken turned around and rode forward, ignoring Malvo's statement. Lynetta returned to staring at the woods, her unease increasing with every step. The shadows of the forest trees lengthened until they stretched into the road, obscuring rocks and little hollows in the road's surface. Her horse carefully picked its way along, and for a moment, she thought even her mount sensed the wrongness of their situation. They came around a bend and reined in their horses at the sight of a large tree fallen in the roadway, blocking their progress. Bracken eyed the trees, slowly pulling his rapier from its sheath. 
It's a trick, he warned. A trick, Balbo countered. It's a fallen tree in the road. Brigands often plant obstructions to catch travelers unaware. Brecken's tone was matter of fact, but it had no impact on the nobleman. No brigand would dare to attack so close to the forest, Malvo replied, indicating either side of the road where the woods were less than ten feet away. They'd be foolish to risk it. We will dismount and walk the horses around the obstruction, making sure not to stray into the trees. Malvo slid off his horse, then came round to assist Lynetta off hers. Bracken watched her dismount with a scowl, then followed suit, walking his horse closer to her. This is a bad idea, he grumbled as he followed alongside her. They just stepped off the road to circumnavigate the top of the fallen tree when a voice called out, Lay down your weapons and your purses, and no one gets hurt. Lynetta's eyes widened as shadowy figures exited the woods nearest them. We've been ambushed. Chapter 12 Her heart was pounding in her chest, but she had the presence of mind to reach into her boot and withdraw the dagger, holding it in her hand tucked behind her back. The shadowy figures outnumbered them, and she could tell by the feral grins on their faces that they knew they were at an advantage. Bracken shifted to stand in front of her, his sword held out in front of him. "'Go on your way, and you might live the night through,' he snarled at the men approaching them. "'But lay a hand on her, and I promise you I'll slice it off!' Lynetta felt a thrill of pride go through her at his words. She couldn't ask for a fiercer protector." Malvo, on the other hand, looked less than excited about their predicament. His men had formed a circle around him, each man armed and ready for a fight. Malvo himself, however, looked pale and shaky. The brigands did not stop their advance despite Brecken's warning. Lynetta watched as one knocked an arrow and another brandished an evil-looking wooden hammer. The largest of them, a man who rivaled Brecken's own height, moved to the front. His hair was wild and thick, his nostrils flaring. He did not have the look of a fay. An off-worlder. Lay down your purses and your weapons, he repeated. This is your last chance. Bracken didn't hesitate. He launched himself toward rapier point thrust in the direction of the brigand's leader. It dug into the other man's belly, and he let out a howl of anger. A fist launched itself at Bracken's jaw, but the fay soldier ducked out of the way with a speed that was hard to follow. He drew his blade across the leader's arm, drawing blood, then shifted, his arm reaching back to move Lynetta with him so that his body still shielded her. The rest of the brigands rushed forward, two more joining their leader in the fight against Bracken. The others broke around them like waves, hitting at Malvo's men with a vengeance. Lynetta clutched her knife, waiting for an opportunity to use it, while simultaneously hoping that she never had to. Bracken let out a groan, drawing her attention back to him in time to see him take a blow from the hammer. Lynetta wanted to scream, but she knew she had to stay strong and alert if they were going to survive this. She eyed the woods, contemplating a break for its shelter, but she couldn't leave Bracken, not while he was risking his life to keep her safe. The Velux fought with a speed that left her in awe. In all of his thrusts and parries, he never lost track of where she stood, keeping her sheltered while fighting off three men. The leader aimed another blow at his face, but he whirled out of the man's reach, then drove his rapier into the throat of the man, with the bow who was aiming arrows at Malvo's companions. The man fell face first into the dirt and did not move again. Despite Bracken's fierceness, she could see him beginning to tire. Risking a glance at Malvo's man, he could see them in a tight knot, beating back blows that just kept coming. It wouldn't be long before their superior numbers made the fight impossible to win. Lynetta saw a sudden opening as Bracken launched himself forward, tackling the leader and shoving him to the ground. She scrambled across the ground, keeping low to grab the bow from the dead man's fingers. Relieving him of his full quiver, she strapped it onto her own back and drew an arrow from it. She took a deep breath, knocking the arrow and looking for a target. She wasn't thinking about how to use the weapon, or even why she would pick it up in the first place. Acting entirely on instinct, she raised her bow and aimed for the man swinging his axe at Fenric's neck. She loosened the arrow and watched it fly. The man froze, letting out a groan of pain before dropping the axe. Her arrow was embedded in his back, and when he spun around, the light going from his eyes, she saw it had come out the other side, covered in his blood. He fell, and Fenric gave her a grateful nod, then turned his attention back to the melee. 
Lynetta pulled another arrow and knocked it, then loosened it on another brigand. Then another, and another. Over and over she fired, not thinking, just acting. Arrows impacted into brigand after brigand, causing mayhem and turning the tide to their side. We can do this. We can beat them. She looked around her, realizing that Shadow had now engulfed the road. The sun had vanished behind the trees, and as she watched, a full golden moon rose from the horizon. A sudden howl rent the air, and she turned in its direction, a look of horror taking shape on her face. As she watched, the leader of the brigands tossed Bracken off him like he was a child. The Velux flew through the air to land several feet away. Lynette's eyes returned to the brigand, who was suddenly ripping chunks of melting flesh off his own body. Soon the others were doing the same, pulling away their skin to reveal clumps of hair underneath. It was terrifying and disgusting. Hem bile rose in her throat, but she couldn't tear her eyes away. The horses had shied away from the fight from the beginning, but at the sound of the howl and what followed, they'd made sounds of alarm and bolted for the edges of the forest, seeking to flee what was unfolding. Lynetta couldn't blame them. Although it felt like an eternity, only seconds had passed before their skins were entirely stripped away, leaving only muscles covered with thick matted hair. Long claws, a drool-laced snout, and long pointed teeth revealed their true natures. Werewolves! Shifters! Bracken shouted, moving close to Lynetta to once again shield her with his body. Aim for the vital organs. It's the only way we'll take them out. There were several low growls as the werewolves closed in on them. A moment ago, she had been certain they were on the verge of driving them off, but now the brigands had not only regrouped, but they'd also transformed, leaving them more powerful than before. Bracken shepherded her backward as they began to advance, joining Malvo's group to present a united front. "'Stay behind us,' he whispered roughly. "'If you see me drop, you run for the forest as quickly as you can.' Try to catch one of the mounts and ride like hells for the next village. She nodded, creeping backward, while Bracken formed a line with Malvo's three companions. The nobleman himself was next to Lynetta, brandishing a sword that was as clean as when the fight had begun. He swallowed hard, fright large on his features. All eyes were on the advancing shifters, whose large bodies were crouching low, clawed hands now in the dirt, ready to lunge at their prey. Her arrow was knocked, her aim on the one with the hammer clutched in his hairy paw. Lynetta took a deep breath. Deciding not to wait for their enemies to attack again, she let loose and watched the arrow fly toward him. It embedded itself in the creature's eye with a meaty thunk. The wolfman yelled in pain, snarling as it tried to pull the arrow from its socket. The leader growled and leapt forward, leading the charge against them. Bracken met him with his rapier at the ready, but the man become beast tackled him, attempting to maul him with his razor-sharp claws. She couldn't get another arrow knocked fast enough. Lynetta released this time at the leader, and an arrow embedded itself in his shoulder. He ignored it, as he did the other two that landed next to the first. Still, the blows distracted him enough for Bracken to connect his fist with the beast's snout. He scrambled from underneath it quick as lightning, then flipped onto the shifter's back, driving his rapier down into a vicious motion into the back of the creature's neck. It let out a ragged howl that cut off midway and collapsed. Bracken wasted no time engaging another shifter as Malvo's men fought around them. Lynetta focused every ounce of her attention on firing arrows until the quiver was empty. Malvo lurched backwards, slashing madly with his sword at the beast that had managed to penetrate their lines of defense. With her last arrow, she fired close range into the creature's face, hitting it in the throat and dropping it. There was a chorus of howls from the remaining shifters, and they broke suddenly, running on all fours faster than should have been possible for the tree line. Moments later they disappeared into the forest, many of them with arrows sticking out of their hides. Lynetta, dagger drawn, ran after them, instinct dominated, and she saw her prey trying to flee. Even without her arrows she knew she could continue to do some damage. Bracken caught her as she passed, holding her back. Let them go, he muttered. We can't chase them into the wilds. With his arm around her, it felt like some sort of spell had been broken. Her limbs started to shake, riding out the adrenaline that had flooded her. The dagger fell from her hand as she realized what had just happened. I helped fight them off. With a bow. And I'm good. I'm really good. 
She could tell by the look in Bracken's eyes that he was evaluating her differently than before. Go after the horses, he called to the other men, and then turned back to her. Are you unhurt? Dazed, she nodded. I'm fine, she bent to retrieve the dagger, shoving it back into the sheath in her boot. Bracken looked at her, shaking his head. You're full of secrets, aren't you? he said, his voice low. Then he took a step back, wiping at the blood covering the side of his face and neck. Corvo approached, leading Lynetta's mount. The dour-faced man was covered with a fair bit of gore himself. A pack of the shifters in the Fey realm, he muttered, his expression livelier than usual. Bent on robbing travelers, the royal court should hear about this. They will, Bracken agreed, as soon as we get to the capital. The king will dispatch troops to handle the menace, I'm certain. Howls rose again, this time from afar. All eyes turned to the forest, filled with shadows. Without warning, the howls were cut off, the night suddenly silent. Shivers ran over her skin. Sounds like there's no need, Corvo said quietly, then passed Lynetta the reins and jogged off to fetch his own mount. They began leading their horses around the down tree, a new sense of urgency driving them to hurry. What happened? she asked Bracken, her voice shaky. It sounds like they met with someone else they couldn't best. His expression was grim. We need to ride, and quickly. We can't get caught out so close to the wilds after dark. He motioned to the rest of the group. Mount up. We make for the closest village. And watch your backs. We have no idea what else lies in wait for us. Chapter 13 An hour later they reached the gate of a small village. Her knuckles were white from gripping the reins so tightly. She'd been afraid that another ambush was waiting for them, her eyes on the forest and whatever secrets it held. But the wilds wasn't the only thing keeping secrets. Part of her fear was reserved for herself. I killed someone, she thought during the ride, unsure how to feel about it. The beasts were attacking, and she and her companions had only been defending themselves. It wasn't so much that she'd taken a life, but how she'd done it. Before picking up the bow, she had no idea that she could even use it, let alone with such skill. Yet over and over, her arrows had unfailingly hit their targets. She'd done it without thinking, her body acting on its own accord, and every arrow she'd aimed had flown true into her target. Whoever I am, I'm someone who knows how to shoot. It didn't make any sense. If the clues she'd gathered so far had her as the fabulously wealthy noblewoman, Lynetta Camara, then why would she have been trained to use a bow with such viciousness? Some nobles were well versed in the martial arts, but she assumed, as it was rare for a fey noblewoman, to foster such an incredible skill. There was no need, given that she had the coin and status to command others to protect her. She brought her mind back to the scene at hand as they gathered round the closed gate. Bracken dismounted and banged his fist against it, hoping to rouse whoever was in charge of keeping it. Let us in, he commanded. There are dangers out here in the night. Dangers, you say, a creaky voice said from the other side. Why do you think we built this wall? To keep them out. Tin let us in. Bloody hell, Bracken growled, his anger coming to the fore as usual. We were attacked by shifters an hour ago, and I have no desire to repeat the event. Shift this, you say, the voice repeated, this time with a hint of humor mixed with disbelief. And did the king himself come to your rescue? Listen, you odious little... Malvo cut Bracken off with a hand to his shoulder. He shook his head once, and Bracken muttered a string of curses under his breath. The nobleman took up the attempt. This is Lord Malvo Cavaggio of Exeria, escort of the Lady Lynetta Camera. We are returning to the capital with dire news that must reach the royal court. If you would be so kind to open the gate, you will be handsomely rewarded. Rewarded, you say? This time the voice was thoughtful. What kind of reward are you talking about? Your name will be delivered to the king himself for commendation, Malvo announced, imbuing his tone with as much promise as he could. You'll be a hero among your fellow fay. A hero, you say? I likes the sound of that. But there's something I likes more. Gold. Of course. Did I not mention the tip we'd provide for your services? A man like you deserves a gold coin or two for your trouble. Ten, the voice was flat, the demand obvious. Bracken threw up his hands and rolled his eyes. 
Malvo licked his lips. Ten, you say? Surely opening the gate wouldn't tax you that severely. Ten, or you can go back to your shift as for all I care. This time the voice might as well have been iron. Ten it is, Malvo said, his expression dark. Lynetta could tell he wasn't eager to be parted from his coin. She reached for her own purse, but Brecken put a hand on her arm to stay her. He gave her a shake of his head, then mounted his horse again. The gate creaked open slowly, and their companions walked their horses inside. Bracken and Lynetta, the last two, to pass through. The man on the other side hurried to work the crank that lowered the gate back into place. He had a scruffy beard and clothes that had seen better days. His eyes lit up as he watched Malvo count out the gold before handing it over. Make sure the king reimburses you, the gatekeeper said with a snicker, then disappeared into the hut beside the gate, chuckling to himself. We make for the nearest inn, Bracken said, having settled into his command during the werewolf battle. The horses need to rest, and we could all use a meal and a bed to settle our nerves. We will be staying at the wing's breath tonight, Malvo countermanded. It's near the other gate. Why head across the village? I can see a sign for an inn just down the lane, Bracken pointed, bristling. He was in no mood to take orders from Malvo, in part, Lynetta assumed, because the man had managed to get them inside the village walls where Bracken had himself failed. The wing's breath, Malvo repeated, his tone stiffer. He stared in the direction of the inn he'd chosen, his men falling in behind him. Bracken turned in Lynetta's direction, waiting to see what she'd do. She nudged her mount forward, following Malvo and ignoring Bracken's swears from behind her. She was unsettled, her nerves riding her hard after their encounter earlier. She didn't want to be in the middle of a power play between two warring fey males. She only wanted time and space to think about what had happened today. It made sense to her now to stick with Malvo, if only because there was safety in numbers, not to mention the other advantages. The village streets were deserted, even though there were still hours to go before midnight. A lone dog watched them pass from where he lay outside the door of a two-story house. He lifted his head and sniffed the air, then let out a low growl. Lynetta was hypervigilant, unwilling to be caught off guard again. The feeling of being watched returned, worse than before. She tried to tell herself that it was nothing, that she was traumatized by the attack and jumping at shadows. Then she realized they were actually being watched. As they passed, people were peeking out from behind curtains and shutters, half-faces with wide eyes observing their transit. No one greeted them. No one stepped outdoors. They stayed as hidden as they could while still spying on the riders outside their doors. Bracken moved up to ride alongside Lynetta. What is wrong with this village? he called up to Malvo. You seem to know something about it. Why is everyone on edge? Nothing is wrong with the village. Malvo answered with a laugh that didn't sound entirely genuine. They're just not used to strangers, especially those coming in so late. Maybe those werewolves weren't just waiting to attack travellers, Lynetta floated. Maybe they've been menacing the town as well. The walls look pretty new to me. Were they recently built? Malvo shook his head at the same time Bracken spoke. If shifters was repeatedly attacking a fey village, the military would have heard about it and sent aid. You're worried over nothing, Malvo said in a soothing tone. And look, there is the wing's breath. He pointed in the direction of a large inn with a wooden sign hanging out front, painted with butterfly wings. Relief filled her, and Lynetta dismounted, ready to be out of the saddle and into safety. A boy came out of the shadows as they filled the courtyard to begin, leading their horses into the stables. Fenric and Corvo followed him to retrieve their baggage, Lynetta assumed. Malvo spoke a few words to Jiff, then watched as his valet hurried back out into the street. The nobleman then wasted no time entering the inn, holding the door open for Lynetta to follow. She was surprised to find a comfortable common room with a large fireplace roaring away. A man snored in an armchair close to the fire, and a young woman slowly swept the floor near the bar. She looked up at their entrance, let out a yelp of surprise, then disappeared behind a door, leaving them alone with the sleeping figure. "'Cozy, isn't it?' Malvo grinned. "'It's the finest inn in the village, which is why I insisted we come here. 
the Lady Lynetta deserves the best. She gave him a small smile, although she wouldn't have cared where they stayed as long as it was away from whatever creatures might be chasing after them. There was a sudden cry of recognition as a portly woman waddled out of the doorway where the girl had disappeared moments before. Oh, it is you, Lord Malvo. Welcome back. The woman hurried toward them, a goblet in one hand, a small plate in the other. Come in, my lord, come in. You know you'll always have a place at the wing's breath. Malvo strode forward to meet the innkeeper, fixing her with his most charming smile. Miss Rainier, how good it is to see you again. The woman stopped to make a makeshift curtsy, then shoved the goblet into his hand. A cup of our finest wine she refresh you, she promised, then held out a morsel from the plate to him. My famous stuffed olives, I know how much you adore them. Of course I do, he said, bending down to allow the woman to pop the olive in his mouth. He chewed, letting out a noise of approval. <sighs> Delicious as always. What is this horror show? Bracken grumbled into her ear. Malvo never said his mother owned an inn. Lynetta bit back a laugh. Hush, she whispered. She seems nice. The innkeeper's eyes flashed in their direction. She looked over Bracken with disdain on her face. But when her gaze alighted on Lynetta, calculation appeared. Her eyes scanned her body, coming to rest on her hand, where they widened. Who is this beautiful creature traveling with you? she asked, coming forward. She's a vision of loveliness. Mrs. Rainier, allow me to introduce the Lady Lynetta Chimera from Exaria. Malvo held out his hand to Lynetta, and she stepped forward and took it. The woman shoved the small plate she was holding into Malvo's other hand, then curtsied low, bowing her head. Lynetta was worried the woman wouldn't be able to right herself without falling over. It's my pleasure to meet you, Miss Rainer. I've heard that your inn is the best in the village. Aren't you kind to say so? The innkeeper beamed, her legs creaking audibly as she straightened herself. Come, let me show you into my private dining room. It's quite enough here, Lynetta said. No need to make a fuss. A fuss! The woman pressed her hands to her chest as if in shock. I can't let you eat in the common room like, well, like common folk. You simply must have my best dining room. She pulled her in the direction of a red door and opened it revealing a small room that looked like it had been caught in a lace factory explosion. Lace doilies covered every surface, matching the lace curtains, lace tablecloth, fine lace chair covers, and lacy wall hangings. Everything was done in shades of red and pink with a heavy-handed feminine touch. There were statues of women and men in various romantic poses spaced about the room and the centerpiece of the lone table was a couple holding hands and staring into one another's eyes. This will be perfect, Malvo said gratefully, taking Lynetta's hand from the innkeeper and escorting her in. She heard a muffled sound from behind her and turned to see Bracken hiding his mouth behind his hand, his eyes twinkling with mirth. She tried hard not to laugh herself, stealing her expression as she took a seat at the table. Bracken attempted to follow them in, but the stout woman stood in the doorframe, blocking his entry. Oh no, not you. Your kind eats in the kitchen. Bracken arched her brow at the woman. My kind? She nodded. Yes, you and the others can grab a plate from the kitchen, but you'll be sleeping in the stables tonight. She sniffed, unimpressed by Brecken's look of fury. Turning back, she promised to return with a feast for the two of them, then walked out and shut the door behind her leaving a fuming bracken on the other side. Chapter 14 Lynetta stared at the white porcelain figures in front of her. The male and female were turned to face one another, their hands clasped and fingers locked together, staring helplessly into one another's eyes for eternity. She knew the centerpiece as well as the rest of the decor was aiming to be romantic, but in her opinion, it was less beating hearts and more juvenile depiction of a complex emotion that couldn't be reduced to handicrafts. Then again, what do I know about love? I can't even be sure of my own name. It didn't take long for Mrs. Rayner to return, trailed by the shy young woman who had fled from her sweeping earlier. They filled the table with dishes crammed with various delicacies, including the stuffed olives from earlier. Mrs. Rayner took five minutes to discuss the vintage and flavor profile of the wine she poured for them then shooed her help out of the room and told them to ring the bell if they needed anything more. 
Lynetta caught the innkeeper's wink in Melville's direction, then turned back to her plate, her cheeks growing pink. Melville offered to fill her plate, and she let him. Too overwhelmed to care much about the food she was served. I should be starving, given the day's events. Mostly, I just want to be alone. Melville passed a full plate to her, then dug into his own. His table manners as impeccable as always. She remembered how he'd seemed to hang back during the fighting, his sword unused, his face pale. She didn't want to fault him for his behavior, remembering her own self-doubts after discovering her hidden skill. He's likely been protected by well-trained men his entire life, she told herself. He has no need to fight for his life because others are paid to do so. Still, it didn't sit well with her, especially compared to the bravery that Bracken had shown. But here sat Malvo, gobbling down the best the inn had to offer, while Bracken and the others were bedding down in the straw and feasting on scraps. It doesn't seem right. Today was certainly interesting, Malvo murmured after taking a sip of wine. Not what I expected. Lynetta took a bite of the sliced meat covered in gravy and chewed. It felt like rubber between her teeth. When she didn't respond, Malvo continued unabated. I know these surroundings are nothing compared to what you're used to, but after what I saw today, I've come to believe you aren't a woman completely bound by her station. She wasn't sure where he was going with his words, so she nodded, allowing him to continue while she picked at her plate. I've never seen a noble female with such prowess with a bow. Where did you learn it? My father taught me as a lark, she lied then took a small sip of wine. I just happened to be good at it, so I pursued the skill. Your father doesn't seem the type of man who is prone to larks, he replied with a grin, nor the type who would allow his daughter to practice with a weapon. There is the face he shows to the public, she said in what she hoped was a breezy tone, and the man he is behind closed doors. Indeed, Malvo said with an understanding nod. We all keep parts of ourselves hidden, don't we? He set down his fork and took another sip of wine. Then he stared into her face. There is something, though, that I fear I may not be able to hide for much longer. Lynetta looked up at him, worried by his tone. Malvo's face was a study in how a man on the cusp of love should appear. I know that my title is no match for your own, but I know now that you aren't as conventional as many of the others who hold all rank. I hope, my darling lady... That you might see a way to... She could see where he was going and knew she couldn't let him finish his thought. Please excuse me, she said suddenly, standing without warning, pressing her hands to her stomach and affecting a look of pain. She ground out her words in a rush. Dinner doesn't seem to be agreeing with me. I need to... rest. Dropping her napkin on her plate, she fled the room. Mrs. Rayner looked up from her post at the bar, startled. Something wrong, dear? "'Nothing at all,' she said, affecting a smile. "'I'm just awfully tired after today's travel. "'May I have the key to my room?' "'Of course. Let me show you the way.' "'The innkeeper led her up the stairs to a room overlooking the street. "'This is our finest chamber. "'Please don't hesitate to ring the bell,' she said, "'indicating the pull cord near the bed, if you need anything.' "'Thank you,' Lynetta said, then closed the door and leaned against it, "'letting out a long breath of relief.' How in the multitude of worlds that make up the web am I stuck here with no memory, an angry bodyguard, and a nobleman about to profess his love for me? She undressed slowly, wondering what she could do to get out of this mess. Lord Malvo is interested in allying himself with Lynetta Camara, either for advantage or because he has genuine feelings for her, er, uh, me, but I don't feel the same way. Malvo was handsome, charming, and chivalrous, but he didn't make her swoon inside. Still, I can't give up this chance to learn more about myself before I reach the capital. I can't just break things off and hope they won't be awkward or worse for the rest of the journey. Rejecting Malvo outright is impossible. That meant she had to go along with his little romance, or at least not turn him down explicitly, until they reached their destination or she recovered her memory. With a last look at the windows to make sure no shadows lurked outside them, she blew out the candles and climbed into bed. This isn't going to end well, she thought, as she stared into the dark. I've always wanted a large family, 
Malba was saying as he rode along beside her the next morning. My own family was small, and I often wished for more brothers and sisters to share my life with. Lynetta nodded distractedly, her eyes on the forest that ran close to the road. She was sure someone was there. Someone, or several someones, were keeping pace with the group, just out of sight. She was certain of it. A shiver racked her, and she turned away, trying not to let her paranoia run rampant. "'Do you have a chill, my lady?' Malvo asked, removing his coat and holding it out to her. "'Please, wear my coat and warm yourself up.' "'What do you think happened to the werewolves?' she asked, ignoring his offering. "'Something must have happened to them to cut off their howling like that.' Malvo's brow wrinkled, the corners of his mouth turning down. "'I do not know, my lady.' But rest assured, they won't return to bother us again. We fought them off with Aplum, and any creature should think twice before attempting to rob us again. It wasn't the answer she wanted. Blind confidence wasn't enough to overcome the fear that gnawed at her belly. She turned her gaze back to the forest, seeing Malvo lay his coat over the pommel of his saddle out of the corner of her eye. A few minutes later, he held out another offering, this one a water skin. You must be thirsty, my lady. Please help yourself to my water skin. Thank you, she said, taking a draw off the skin and swallowing the water. It did little to refresh her, her mind too focused on the dangers around them. Still, Malvo kept up his chivalrous gestures, sharing his skin and handing out occasional morsels he'd packed away from the inn, mostly bits of dried fruit and sweets. I've been saving this one, he said, as he passed her an ornate chocolate in the shape of a swan. It's a rare prize, but I can think of no finer person to share it with than my beloved. As she reached for the chocolate, she heard a gagging noise from behind her, where Bracken was riding beside Fenric. Lynetta stiffened, but she refused to turn around and dignify the soldier's behavior by acknowledging it. Sure, Malvo is laying it on pretty thick, she thought, but at least he's not pouting like a child. Sleeping in the stables hadn't seemed to agree with the Velix. He'd been cranky all morning, barely speaking two words to her. Things only got worse when they stopped for lunch under the noonday sun. This looks like a perfect place to stop, Malvo said, calling his men to a halt in a clearing of sorts. The forest was twenty paces from the edges of the road on either side, and scattered in the grass before it was a half-dozen boulders of various sizes and shapes. One seemed to make a natural table of sorts, and Malvo gave orders to his men to pull two of the small rocks over as makeshift chairs. Lynetta watched him bustle around, barking out instructions as his men did his bidding, laying out a tablecloth, then filling the table with a picnic of sorts. As she stood, brushing the dust off her breeches, Bracken came alongside her, crossing his arms over his broad chest. "'Is that a vase with a single rose?' he asked." "'joking his chin at the table being set. "'She ignored him, knowing he was only mocking Malvo. "'What's with the beloved stuff?' he asked when she didn't answer him. "'Isn't it inappropriate to address a noblewoman like yourself in such a way?' "'Her brows shot up at his words. "'Now he cares about what's appropriate to say to me, after everything he said. "'He's harmless,' she said, waving away Bracken's concern. That doesn't look harmless to me, he said, laughing and gesturing toward the tower of cakes the men were assembling. Shh, she said, glaring at him. Don't let him overhear you. Since when do you become so protective? I didn't hear you complain at all when I was forced into the stables last night. Perhaps there weren't enough available rooms, she said lightly. That inn was nearly empty, he grumbled, just like Malvo's head. Be nice, she warned. What's his deal, seriously? Lynetta sighed. I think he has some sort of crush on me, she admitted, keeping her voice low. It's meaningless. Harmless and meaningless, eh? His brows furrowed. Are the feelings mutual? Why do you ask? Lynetta replied. Afraid I might keep you in the stables the entire trip. She meant it as a joke, as a means not to have to explain why she couldn't reject Malvo out of hand. Bracken didn't find her joke funny. I saw him giving you little sips and feeding you out of his hand, like he was taming some wild creature. Maybe that's what you like. Look, 
Malvo is a gentleman, well-dressed, well-spoken, and kind to offer his protection on our journey. She felt him stiffen beside her, saw his hands balling into fists by his sides. You would fall for a man like Malvo? He bit out, his words full of rough edges. All appearances and no substance. But when the going gets rough, it won't be Malvo saving your ass, milady. He said the last word with a mocking tone. Come, milady, Malvo called at the wrong moment. Come, join me for lunch. He gestured grandly at the table he'd finished setting. Bracken grumbled under his breath, then walked away, across the road to sit alone on a boulder and eat. Lynetta wasn't pleased about the situation, but there wasn't much she could do. Although part of her wished it was just her and Bracken as it had been in the beginning, there were too many reasons not to leave the group they'd found. She joined Malvo at the table, marveling over the spread he'd set out for them. This is something. It's nothing for my beloved, he said, and she heard the sound of choking coming from Bracken's direction. Chapter 15 Late in the afternoon they crested a hill, and Lynette caught sight of a city in the distance. The sun seemed to hover just above it, setting its roofs ablaze in a golden burst of flame. She gasped, unable to help herself. What is that place? she murmured. It looks like a mirage, like it will disappear when we get too close. It's Gelder's Glen, Bracken responded, his features seeming more relaxed than earlier. She even caught a smile playing around the corners of his lips. It's said to be the first place where face shaped gold, and pieces from the Gelders there fetch a handsome price on any world in the web. It's beautiful, she said, a bit breathless. Bracken looked at her, his mouth opening as if to speak, then closing again. He looked away, and shudders seemed to close behind his eyes. "'You really don't know about Gelder's Glen?' he asked, his tone disbelieving. "'It's also renowned as the Fey Realm's biggest and best shopping district.' "'Of course I know the Glen,' she said, affecting a blasé attitude and shortening the name in an attempt to seem in the know. "'I just haven't seen it from this angle before, is all?' Bracken stared at her, his expression guarded until she propelled her horse down the hill, leaving him in her dust. The city itself seemed to be made of gold, although, as they got closer, she could make out more details. The roofs were not made of the precious metal as it appeared, but the tiles were formed out of an alloy that shone in the sunlight. The walls of the buildings were formed of plaster, made from sands the color of melted gold, and bits of colored glass were decoratively pressed in their surfaces to increase their reflective shine. Even the walls around the city looked like they were made of gold bricks, though Lynetta assumed they'd been painted to give off that impression. Still, making her way through the gates, she saw a city built on wealth, down to the evenly spaced cobblestones that shone beneath her feet. "'I have a reservation at the Gilded Grimoire,' Malvo shared while they made slow progress down the crowded city streets. "'We will rest here for a few days while I conduct some business.' I'm not going to cool my heels here while you peddle your trinkets or whatever it is you do, Bracken scoffed. My plans are to make a few trades and gather supplies for the remainder of our journey, Lord Malvo replied stiffly. And it is uncouth to expect such a sensitive lady to spend all day, every day, in a saddle. Fenric snorted, slapping a hand on Corvo's back. Did you hear that? Calling Lynn a sensitive lady? You saw the way she shot the bow like a vengeful demon? Malvo's eyes narrowed, and he scowled at his man, causing Fenric to stop laughing and stand up straighter. He then turned his gaze to Bracken, who failed to wither under it. My orders are to get the Lady Lynetta to the capital sooner rather than later. That means there's no time to wait around for you. Your orders? Malvo asked with a confused countenance. I thought the Lady Lynetta gave the orders. Aren't you her footman? Her leafing footman? I'll tell you what, Lynetta hurried to slap a hand over Bracken's mouth, leaving him sputtering beneath it. A few days will be fine, she said, talking over Bracken's angry noises. I'd like to do some shopping myself, since the Glen is where all the fashionable ladies find their fripperies. Malvo grinned and inclined his head. As you wish, my lady. The inn is this way. The nobleman turned down a narrower street off the main drag, and Lynetta released her hold on Bracken. 
What are you doing? He hissed at her. Why are you being so deferential to that creep? I know you're as eager as I am to get back to the capital. No one seems as eager to get back to Exeria as you do, she thought, but held back from speaking. Come on, I don't want to get lost. She nudged her mount forward, following Malvo and his retainers. The inn was painted in a deep shade like amber honey, its roof just as shiny as the rest. The wooden sign hanging out front was of a gold-encrusted book next to a candle that made the symbol on its cover glow. Stable boys were lazing in the lengthening shade of the stables off the courtyard when they made their way in and dismounted. Jiff whistled to alert the boys who dragged themselves out of the shadows to fetch the horses. Corvo and Fenric followed to retrieve the group's possessions, while once again Jiff hurried off on foot at Malvo's instruction. Lynetta wondered where the valet was being sent. Jiff said little, always dancing attendance on his lord and doing little else. So where does he keep disappearing to? The inn's interior was as ostentatious as its exterior. Everything seemed to glitter and shine, from the candelabras to the goblets and plates. The image of gold was everywhere, so much so that it almost hurt her eyes to look around. Malvo marched off to find the innkeeper, while Lynetta lingered near the fire, feeling lost. She'd been staying in unfamiliar places for days now, a new location almost every night, and it was starting to make her feel more and more unmoored. The longer she existed in this state of limbo, with no memories of her past and no idea of her future, the more she struggled to feel like anything was as it should be. If I'm unsure of my own reality, how good a judge can I be of any reality? Bracken was behind her suddenly. She could feel him there without having to turn around. The desire to close her eyes and lean back into him hit her with the force of a blow, but she resisted, instead standing quietly and staring into the flames. Let's go, he said softly, putting his hands on her shoulders and making the need to melt into him stronger. You and I, we can find another inn. Leave early in the morning. We could be back to the capital in a few days. No need to wait around for Malvo and his miscreants. That's not fair, she said. His men have been polite and helpful. They aren't miscreants. What does it matter, he said, and she could tell that his temper was being tied down with a fraying rope. We don't need them. I'll get you home safely and quickly, if you trust me. She turned around, searching his face. He kept his expression schooled, and there was a shielded look in his eyes. I'm staying, she said at last. I like traveling with Malvo. He knows how to talk to people. She hadn't meant it as a slight against Bracken, but he took it as one. His eyes narrowed and his demeanor turned frosty. You don't know what you like, he grumbled, but I know what I want, to get you to the capital and be rid of you. His words hurt, and for a moment she thought she saw regret in his features, but it vanished quickly enough that she wasn't sure if it had been there in the first place. You can leave any time, she struck back, her tone prim, her body stiffening. Now, if you'll excuse me, Lynetta walked toward Malvo, who was speaking softly to the innkeeper. She didn't look back, didn't want to look back. Arguing with Bracken always ended up with someone hurt, and usually both of them. He sometimes seemed so impossible to talk to. Okay, most of the time. But that didn't mean she enjoyed losing her temper with him. She took a deep breath and fixed a smile on her face as she reached Malvo. Here is your key, milady, he said, handing her what appeared to be a gold-plated room key. It's to the finest accommodation that can be had in the city, of course. Of course, she parroted, beginning to wonder if anything ever went not as expected among nobles. Could you please have your men bring my things up to my room? I would like to get some air. Certainly, he called after her as she set off for the door. Bracken was nowhere to be seen in the common room, so she had to assume he was outside. She stepped into the courtyard, scanning the area for Bracken with no sign of him. Corvo and Fenric were sitting on stacks of saddles, passing a bottle back and forth. "'Have you seen Bracken?' she asked. Corvo shook his head and spit on the ground. "'No, my lady,' Fenric translated. "'We was busy seeing after the horses.' "'And getting drunk,' she thought nonplussed. "'Thank you.' She left the stables and the courtyard, returning to the street outside the inn. 
Turning her head from the left to right, she looked for the soldier to no avail. The urge to apologize was strong, and she figured things would go easy if she told Bracken that she valued his service, even if she didn't exactly follow his plan. Setting off to the right, she followed the narrow street to the next intersection. Still not spotting Bracken, she wandered in the direction of what appeared to be stalls selling wares. When she reached the first stall, she realized it was part of an interconnected network of individual sellers, a vast market that stretched across a huge cobblestone square and bled out into the connected streets. This must be what Bracken was speaking of, she thought, her eyes struggling to define the margins of the massive marketplace. Lynetta walked along the first few stalls, getting a sense of the enormity of the shopping district. There were wares of every kind, every shape and size, from food to clothing to jewelry and more, musical instruments, household goods, shoes, wagons, exotic birds. Anything a person could want to buy was laid out in the vast center of Gelder's Glen. It was late, the sun dipping behind the taller buildings, the shadows around her lengthening. Some of the stalls were packing away their goods, closing up shop for the night, but she found a stand selling fruit drinks and stopped to purchase one. She was handed a cup made of clay that had been painted gold in exchange for two copper pieces from her pouch. Lynetta strolled through the market, sipping her juice and taking in the sights, sounds, and smells coming from all around her. When she started to chase the delectable scent of some sort of grilled meat, she found herself surrounded by stalls on all sides. She was no longer certain from which direction she had come, but Lynetta figured she could find her way back easily enough. A display of glittering decorative combs drew her attention, and she stopped to admire them, thinking that investing in a comb to hold her hair back while riding might be a good idea, even if they were a tad overpriced. Why not splurge, she asked herself. You're supposed to be rich after all. She reached for a comb, then froze suddenly, her hand shaking so much she had to set the cup of juice down. Her body felt like it was flooded with electricity. Someone is watching me. It was the same feeling she'd had before, back in the village and before that in the woods along the road. Someone had eyes on her, someone who had followed her to this place. Why? What do they want? She had a feeling she was going to find out, maybe sooner than she'd like. Chapter 16 Just get back to the inn, she told herself. Your companions will protect you there. Lynetta released the comb and abandoned her drink, moving in the direction she thought she'd come from. A few paces in, she turned around, realizing that none of the stalls looked familiar. Maybe I came from this way, she thought, heading in the opposite direction, but nothing looked familiar there either. I'm lost and someone is after me. Panic crept up her spine like an army of spiders, making her shake. She closed her eyes, trying to get a hold of her breathing. No time to spiral out of control. You're a master of the bow, remember? You can handle yourself. Except her quiver was empty, and the dagger tucked in her boot felt very small when she could not tell where the threat was coming from. She made the first left she could, guessing that it was in the direction of the inn. Passing several stalls, she came to another intersection and paused, wondering which way to try next. The wind rolled down the narrow passageway between stalls, causing her thin fabric sides to ripple and wave. She looked over at the movement, then caught a shadowy figure watching her from on the other side of the thin green cloth that made up the far side of a stall selling carved wooden boxes. The figure started when she noticed it, then moved in her direction. Lynetta let out a yelp of fear and ran in the other direction, tread driving all thoughts out of her mind. Her only instinct was to flee, to get away from whatever evil creature was pursuing her. Like in a nightmare, time slowed and she felt like she was running through mud up to her knees. She craned her head around, looking for her stalker, but the passage was deserted. Then she caught her shifting in the shadows between two stalls. It was still after her. Putting on a burst of speed, she rounded a corner and slammed into something hard enough to make her teeth rattle. Lynetta fell backward, about to slam into the cobblestones, when a pair of strong arms grabbed her, pulling her against a chest that felt like bricks. She looked up, blinking in confusion, then realized she'd run directly into Bracken. While the muscular fay hadn't budged an inch, she'd been knocked down like a bird flying into a wall. His arms wrapped around her protectively. What is it? What's wrong? He searched her face, then moved a step back to look over her body. Speak to me! I... I saw... 
How do I explain it? A shadow was chasing me through the market? It sounded absurd. She brushed back a lock of hair with a shaking hand, her eyes imploring him to let it go. What are you doing wandering the marketplace alone? He hissed, his hands tightening around her arms. You have to know it isn't... Safe. I know. Her head swiveled, trying to look in every direction at once. Could we just please go back to the inn now, please? His eyes searched hers, then he nodded once and tucked her arm in his. Bracken seemed to have no problem finding his way out of the maze of stalls, and soon enough they were back to the inn. Before they entered, he held out his hand. Your key. She reached into her pouch and pulled it out, handing it to him. Bracken held the door open for her, then followed her through the common room and up the stairs. Her room ran the length of the rear wall, a long, narrow chamber with a bed at one end and a sitting area arranged around the fireplace at the other. There was a screen behind which she was certain to find a chamber pot and wash basin. Bracken closed the door behind her, then set the key on the small table beside it. Lynetta was starting to calm down when he grabbed her suddenly and pushed her up against the wall. He pinned her hands to her sides and leaned in until his face was inches from her own. "'It's time for you to tell me exactly what you're up to,' he said, his voice low and rough. "'Nothing about you has made sense since the day I met you. So fess up. What are you hiding?' Her eyes widened, and a new anxiety laced its way up her insides. The look on his face said he wasn't going to be fogged off again this time. He wasn't going to let her go until she told him what he wanted to know. I can't reveal my secret, can I? When she decided to let him escort her back to the capital, she hadn't been sure whether she could trust him. Him or anyone, really. But after spending this time on the road with him, she knew that Brecken was not the one who was responsible for her memory loss. He wouldn't do that to her. Although he'd never said anything nice to her that she could remember, Lynetta knew that Bracken only wanted to protect her. He wouldn't hurt her, which meant he'd never be able to mastermind this sort of messed-up scenario. Bracken wouldn't toy with me. If anything, I'm the one deceiving him. She trusted him. That was now evident, but there was still something that made her hold back. I'm not hiding anything, she said, her tone sounding exhausted. Please let me go. He didn't do as she asked, and it only made her feel worse. Part of her wanted to open up to him. It would feel good to get this secret off her chest, to share her dilemma with another person, to reduce the burden she felt, the loneliness she struggled against. But the fact that something was after her made her hold her tongue. If Bracken knew she was somehow tied up in something sinister, he might not be able to keep that news to himself. He was a soldier, after all one who reported to higher ups. How long will my secret remain my own if Bracken thinks I am a danger to the realm? Talk to me, Lynetta, he said softly, making her start. He rarely uses my name, if ever. To hear it on his lips made her feel uncomfortable, but in a tingly way. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. I'm sorry, she whispered, her eyes fixating on his lips. She remembered how he kissed her before, that day beside the road. That kiss had been overwhelming, a torrent of sensation that she realized she badly wanted to experience again. She looked up when he shook her gently. I'm tired of trying to get answers. His tone was hard as flint. I'm going to make you talk. Eyes shining, lids hooded, Bracken's mouth swooped down to capture her own. A thrill ran through her at the contact, her body rejoicing at the reunion of their lips. Her arms were still pinned at her sides, but she leaned into him wanting to be pressed against him. Bracken let out a growl and deepened the kiss, his tongue sweeping across her bottom lip before slipping between them. Her head fell back and stars shone behind her eyelids. As suddenly as he kissed her, he pulled away, releasing her and letting out a string of curses. His face was red, anger radiating from him. She wasn't sure whether he was angry at her for not talking or at himself for kissing her. He breathed heavily, struggling to get control over himself. I just want to know what's going on with you, he said after a moment, his tone frustrated. It was a genuine moment, a moment of vulnerability, one that she could not leave unanswered. Someone is following me, she said, then moved over to sit on the bed. Head bowed, she told him about what had happened in the marketplace. And it isn't only that. I've had this feeling like I'm being watched for a couple of days now. Someone is stalking me. Who? 
he asked quietly, sitting down beside her. I haven't seen anyone tracking us, and I've been keeping an eye out for it since we set off on this journey. I don't know, she admitted, letting out a heavy breath. I'm not sure who, and I'm not sure why, but someone is after me. He looked at her, unsatisfied. I need more than that, he said. Why would someone be following you? There has to be something you aren't telling me. She shook her head, her voice monotone. I don't know. I'm sorry. Bracken stood looking down on her. She thought he was about to say something, but he looked away, then walked to the door and opened it. Without looking back, he walked through it into the hallway and shut the door behind him. Lynetta stared at the door, feeling empty inside. She thought she would feel better after telling him about the shadowy figure following her, but it hadn't helped anything. The afterimage of his kiss still burned on her lips, and she touched two fingers to the spot, feeling it tingle. She felt defeated, helpless, unable to connect with others because she had yet to connect with herself. For now, her secrets would have to remain her own. Chapter 17 Breakfast at the Golden Grimoire was surprisingly simple, given their glittering surroundings. She looked at her tray, which contained a small bowl of plain yogurt, a handful of dried berries in an even smaller bowl, a cup of honey, and a thick porridge mixed with oats. It was filling, not fancy, but Lynetta barely noticed. She was still fretting from the night before, having slept badly interrupted by anxiety dreams of being lost in the market, with a squad of shadows chasing her from stall to stall. She stole a glance at Bracken, but his head was down, his attention on his bowl. Lord Malvo was dressed in a deep blue brocade vest, heavily embroidered with golden thread and a pair of matching slacks. His boots were polished to a bright shine, and his hair was perfectly coiffed. He fixed her with a bright smile, then extended an invitation. Would you like to join me in the marketplace today? She looked up, unsure of how to answer. He attempted to persuade her with his usual mixture of deference and confidence, leaning in as if spilling a confidence. I know most nobles frown on commerce, but I found I have a knack for trading, and it's made me a fair amount of coin. He leaned back, grinning widely. Any wife of mine would be well taken care of, I can assure you. Bracken snorted suddenly, spitting porridge all over himself and half of the long wooden table they were gathered around. Lynetta was forced not only to ignore Bracken's behavior, but also Malvo's ob obvious remark. I would enjoy seeing the marketplace, she said at last. Best to face your fears than run from them, she told herself. In her nightmares, there had been nowhere to run. She didn't want to spend her day cooped up in the inn, jumping at shadows. Maybe the market would be more inviting during full daylight hours. Great, Bracken whined as he cleaned himself up. That means I'll be spending my day hauling around boxes of feminine nonsense that aren't going to fit in our already overstuffed saddlebags. Lord Malvo sent him a cutting look, then turned his attention back to Lynetta. Never fear, beloved. My men will carry anything you buy back to Exaria for you. She inclined her head in gratitude, then made an excuse, abandoning the table to put on something suitable. Lynetta changed out of her britches, choosing instead the simple dress that Bracken had picked out for her. There was no point in flashing around her wealth in the marketplace. It was likely to attract thieves, or make the merchants hike their prices knowing she had the purse to pay for it. She quickly braided her hair, then returned to the common room. Soon they set off for the market, this time approaching it from another angle, the perimeter marked by jaunty flags and vendors who were walking around with trays strapped to them, offering treats and trinkets. There was a different air to the experience when the market was in full swing, as opposed to its final hours at sunset. They entered and she soon realized the scale of the market was almost incomprehensible. It has to stretch for miles in either direction. She realized as she stared down long passageways in the open-air market, folks gliding back and forth between the stalls, buying and selling, hawking and watching. It was like a warren populated by bartering bunnies, and Lynetta made a point of sticking close to her companions, not wanting to become lost like she had the day before. Malva walked at her side, pointing out this stall or that one, stopping occasionally to make conversation with the vendors who were eager to sell to him. His ring stood out, even in the bustling crowd, and it wasn't long before Lynetta's was noticed as well. Vendors began calling out to them as they walked along the passageways between stalls. 
Behind her, Bracken let out a long groan. When Malvo paused again to speak to another vendor, Lynetta elbowed the soldier in the stomach. Behave, she whispered, wagging her finger at him. I'm sorry if watching that acorn horde promenade you among hawkers eager to drain your purse isn't exactly what I had planned for my day, he grumbled, pressing his lips. His eyes caught on a stall up ahead, one selling fresh meat pies. Lynetta followed his gaze and noticed the busty redhead, who was leaning over to roll the dough, looking as if her bits were about to fall out of her blouse. Is he looking at the pies or the girl? She wondered, then told herself she was being an idiot. Why should I care if he's ogling other women? She turned away, her grip tightening on Malvo's arm. She smiled up at him when he looked her way, and he moved his arm to circle her waist, pulling her in closer. She thought she heard a growl from behind her, a bolt of electricity zapping her insides at the thought of making Brecken jealous. On the other hand, she wasn't eager to admit her own jealousy of the redhead. She drew Malvo's gaze as they passed the stall as well, and Lynetta saw the nobleman's eyes linger on her chest. She frowned, looking away and admitting to herself that men were incorrigible. They turned into a passage that was tighter than before, the stalls closer together. A crowd of people seemed to converge on the same stalls, leading to a crush of bodies that she was forced to work her way through. She kept a hand around her money pouch, not wanting to lose it to thieves. Malvo waved to a vendor he knew, and soon the vendors around them were screaming for their attention. She stood close to Malvo as he offered to trade some number of ale casks for a necklace on display. Not far away, Bracken stood with his back to the stall, his eyes on the crowd, searching for any trouble that might be coming their way. She was relieved that he was watching over her, but as the crowd around them swelled during the midday rush, that relief started to fade. The heat of the day, combined with the press of bodies and constant cacophony, was getting to her. Lynetta found herself scanning the crowd while she tried to catch her breath. It was hard with all the people around her. Claustrophobia began clutching at her, and she started to fight her way through the crowd, seeking a spot that was less crowded. Can't breathe. Is that a, a shadow? There, that one. Is he watching me? Her thoughts were in a disarray, fear taking hold of her, warping her mind. A hand grabbed hers and she turned, relieved to see Bracken's concerned face. He led her around another corner, then another, the crowds thinning out until it was just the two of them, and a random passerby here and there. Bracken pointed out a tent that was advertising tea, and she followed, eager to be somewhere quiet, somewhere where she wasn't confronted by a million sights and smells and sounds. Bracken pulled back the flap of the tea tent and motioned for her to enter. He followed, gesturing to the ancient woman stooped over a table, sorting dried leaves into glass containers. She scuttled in their direction, asking for their orders. "'Something calming,' Bracken said, and Lynetta nodded. The woman returned to her station, selecting leaves and muddling them in the bottom of two ceramic mugs before filling the mugs with water. She brought them back to their table and held out her hand for payment. Lynetta reached for her pouch, but Bracken was faster, putting coins in the woman's hand from his own pocket. He lifted his mug and inclined his head to her, then drank. She looked down at her own mug, where the tea leaves seemed to be swirling in lazy circles. Just looking at the tea in the mug was relaxing her. Her eyes flicked back to the old woman, and realized she must have magic. Likely a weak variety, but enough to imbue her leaves with magical qualities. She took a sip, and a sense of tranquility unfolded inside her. "'Did you ever hear the joke about the organ grinder's monkey?' Bracken asked. Lynetta set her mug down and shook her head. What's an organ grinder? An organ is a type of instrument composed of a series of pipes and bellows to drive wind through the pipes. The fellow who turns the crank on the organ to activate the bellows is called an organ grinder. Okay, Lynetta said, following along. And what is a monkey? Bracken let out a burst of frustrated air. A monkey is a type of animal from off-world. They usually have long tails and agile hands and feet. Why does the organ grinder have a monkey then? Lynetta asked. Will you just let me tell the joke? Bracken said, grinning. She couldn't hold back her own grin. Lynetta nodded, prompting him to continue. Bracken opened his mouth and immediately closed it again. You know what? I think I just forgot the joke. Lynetta slapped the table, a drop of tea sliding over the rim of her mug at the impact. She let loose a peal of laughter. 
uh, married with his laughter in the air, to fill the small tent with the pleasantness she'd missed these last few days. Their eyes met, and Lonetta felt something inside her start to unlock. She was about to blurt out everything she kept hidden from him, ready to share out all she had with the handsome soldier. There was a sudden crash from outside the tent. Bracken, on instant alert, rose from his seat and ducked outside of the tent. The wind picked up abruptly, making the tent shake, and Lynetta rubbed her arms at the sudden chill. She turned her head, expecting to see the ancient woman at her table, but another sudden gust extinguished the lamp, plunging the tent into shadows. Her eyes picked up a figure across the tent, one she assumed was the proprietor. The figure moved forward, nothing more than a dark outline, a shape without form, until a sliver of light from a gap in the tent's flaps landed on the shadowy form, and it resolved itself into a familiar face. Lynetta gasped, staring into a face that looked just like her own. Lynetta! Brecken called, bursting back into the tent. She turned to look at him, her eyes wide with fright. He rushed to her side, his rapier drawn. Lynetta turned back to the woman with her face, but she was gone. Lynetta snapped her fingers, reigniting the flame inside the lamp and bathing the tent's interior in a pleasant orange glow. This time, the pleasantness missed Lynetta. She stared down at her tea, which had gone cold. Even so, she doubted it would have the ability to calm her after what had just happened. She was just like me. My face. You're me, remember? The memory of those words spoken in a dream made her start to tremble. She shook her head, unwilling to accept that her nightmare had just come to life in front of her. What is it? Brecken pulled her up, wrapping his arms around her and pressing her head to his chest. What happened? She stared into the empty tent, her mind feeling ready to snap. Her strong arms held her, but she knew now that they couldn't protect her from whatever was chasing her. I thought I was searching for myself, and all this time myself was searching for me. She shuddered, unable to stop the tears from falling from her eyes. Chapter 18 Maybe I hallucinated it all. There's no way it could have actually happened, right? These thoughts jostled their way into her mind as she sat at the table in the common room of their inn, trying to do their job to calm her, to convince her that she hadn't just seen herself in the tea lady's tent. Maybe it was magic, some sort of spell. Maybe the same spell that blanked my memory. Even as she thought it, Lynetta knew it didn't make sense. Her hands shook at the memory of her confrontation with the person who had looked just like her. She'd only seen her for an instant only in a sliver of light, but it had been enough to convince her that the two of them were identical. A cup of mulled wine appeared in front of her. Drink it, Bracken said, his voice full of authority. She did, taking a large swallow, then held the cup in her hands, letting the warmth seep into her chilled skin. Bracken sat down across from her, his face full of concern. He did not demand answers. He only looked at her, and over time she was able to calm herself, to feel secure as the wine warmed her, and his nearness soothed her. Bracken reached across the table to pull one of her hands into his. His voice was low, vibrating with urgency. I know you prize your privacy above all, but at this point I need to know what we are up against. You look like you've just seen a ghost. Lynetta swallowed hard and spoke, wrenching the words out of herself. It wasn't a ghost. It was me, another me. He opened his mouth to speak, but she held up a hand, wanting to get it all out while she was able. I need to tell you what I saw, everything I saw. I need to have another person hear it before I convince myself that I am out of my mind. Bracken nodded, squeezing her hand in his. The words started tumbling out of her, starting at her recurrent nightmares, the reflection I see in the stream. It's me, but it isn't, she tried to explain. Then someone touches me, and I turn around to see. Another me. That's the best way to describe it. I always wake up then, but the feeling sticks with me. His brow furrowed, but he didn't interrupt, letting her get it all out. Then I started seeing this shadowy figure, only for a second, but there. I saw it in the bath, and again at the market last night. Even when I don't see the figure... I have this feeling of being watched, being stalked. 
She shivered, and his thumb stroked the back of her hand. How long have you been seeing this shadowy figure? He asked softly. She shrugged a shoulder. I'm not sure. Since I began this journey, I guess? She finished lamely, hating that her memory stopped at the riverbank where she'd woken up. Can you point it out to me the next time you see it? It comes and goes too fast, she admitted. It's like as soon as I see it, it disappears. It makes me wonder if it's around me all the time. I just can't see it. The thought was one she suppressed for days. It made her heart pound in her chest, fear causing it to echo like a bass drum. It must have magic, she whispered. Magic? Magical means to remain unseen, Bracken shook his head. I don't know of a fae that has that power. Then he frowned. Maybe a king's blade. King's blade? She wasn't familiar with the term. He eyed her, shaking his head. Your education is severely lacking. The King's Blade are the elite force of magic users, conscripted by King Lyr himself to be his personal guard. You think one of them might be able to become invisible? He shrugged. Maybe. Or could it be someone from off-world? I don't know, she admitted, fighting back tears again. I don't know why any of this is happening. All I know for certain is that someone is after me. Bracken took a deep breath, then lowered his voice and leaned closer. My unit was sent south to investigate rumors about the wilds. I warned you about their being more active lately. There is a theory that they've been infiltrated by a rebel faction of Fae set on overthrowing the king. Lynetta started. A rebellion? In the wilds? How could that happen? King Lyre has long had defectors from his court. Get enough people angry about the same thing, and you'll end up with the rebellion on your hands. They know they can't defeat the king's military with a straightforward attack, so they gather in secret to plot his downfall. But in the wilds, didn't you warn me they were too dangerous to enter? Look what happened when we did. And the werewolves, remember them? Something got to them too. I know, Bracken said, throwing up a hand. It doesn't make sense, and yet... Neither does what's been going on with the wilds. Someone has to be behind whatever is happening in the woods. So a secret army is amassing in the wilds. She mulled that possibility over. Do you think they were the ones who were shooting at us? I don't know, Bracken admitted. Our men were sent on controlled marches into the edges of the forest. We could only remain for one hour and not go deeper than one mile. While we never came across a rebel in the flesh... We did find evidence of their existence. What sort of evidence? The detritus of day-to-day -day living, a discarded fruit peel, a dropped arrowhead, the occasional footprint. There wasn't much to go on, but it confirmed that people are living in the wilds. We assume they were fey, but they could be off-worlders. How they entered the fey realm and managed to survive the wilds, we don't know. He sighed. There's a lot we don't know, actually. Too much. How does any of this connect to me? she asked. The pieces were laid out in front of her, but she could make no sense of them. And to the other me, is she a part of it somehow? I wish I could say for certain. You mentioned feeling like the words were watching you. Say this other you, this doppelganger, was the one watching you. Say she and others like her were the ones shooting at us. Maybe they're a part of this rebel group. I don't know, she whispered, still unsure how things fit together. Something sinister is afoot, but I... Darling! Malvoy's voice echoed through the common room as he rushed to her side. Grabbing her under the shoulders, he pulled her out of her seat and into his arms. I was terrified when I couldn't find you. Lynetta struggled to breathe as he pressed her face into his chest and stroked her hair like one would pet a child. I'm sorry, she mumbled into his brocade vest. I wasn't feeling well, and I asked Bracken to bring me back to the inn. How could you lure her away without alerting me, he said, rounding on Bracken to chastise him. My men and I were searching for hours, clearly wasting our time. Lynetta saw Bracken's eyes flash to the water clock on the mantel. She did the arithmetic herself, realizing that it had been a little over an hour since she left Malvo's side. That didn't seem to affect the nobleman's concern. He crooned soft noises to her holding her close, 
until Lynetta was finally able to peel herself away from him. My only job is to protect the Lady Lynetta, Bracken said after standing and straightening his attire. No one, including yourself, will stand in my way. Marvo scowled but refused to acknowledge his rival directly. Your footman has an insolent tone, he growls to Lynetta. You should dismiss him. I can find you another footman, one who won't backtalk or boss you. Bracken's face turned to stone, his eyes blazed, focused on Malvo. It was like Lynetta could read his thoughts, and they were violent. If anyone needs to be dismissed around here, thank you, Lord Malvo, Lynetta interrupted. But it was truly my fault. I should have alerted you. Please accept my apology. Of course, beloved, he murmured, pressing her head back into his chest. I will always forgive you. She gently pulled herself away once again, giving him a weak smile. I am feeling a bit lightheaded, she told the nobleman. Will you please excuse me? I need to lie down. He nodded, letting her go. Calling after her as she headed toward the stairs, Malvo promised to check on her soon and to bring a tray to her room later. I will take care of you, my lady. Never fear. She climbed the stairs at a loss as to how everything had gotten so out of control. Glancing back to the table as she climbed, she saw Malvo and Bracken staring daggers at one another. Overcome by weariness, she turned away and retreated to her room. Hoping a good night's sleep would chase the confusion and anxiety away. Her eyes were fluttering closed soon after, and soon after that her reflection was taunting her yet again. You're me, remember? Chapter 19 Lynetta was happy to leave Gelder's Glen behind, while other fey females might be delighted to visit the shopping capital of the realm. She didn't think she could ever think about the massive marketplace again without shivering at the memory of what had happened there. Luckily, the sun was out and riding high as they left the gates behind, and the force remained a decent distance from the road. As they made their way north, some of the fear that had clung to her started to ease. We should reach Exeria three days from now, Malvo announced. I believe the most treacherous part of our journey is well behind us. You do? she asked, relieved to hear that she wasn't alone in her assessment. The nobleman nodded. The woods are not so overgrown this close to the capital, he said evenly. And there are more villages and towns along the way. We'll have our choice of the inns moving forward. We've had our choice the entire time, Bracken grumbled from behind them. You're the one who has insisted on choosing where we stay. Malvo acted as if he hadn't heard a word the other man said. None of the towns will be as large as Gelder's Glen, mind you. But I think we've had our fill of adventure, haven't we? Lynetta tried not to hear the condescending tone in his voice. Her eyes flicked to the forest on the side of the road. It was still dark, still inscrutable, hiding a multitude of secrets. But the feeling of being watched wasn't there currently. She felt safer, but it seemed that feeling would not make the trip any easier. Jeff had ridden up to Malvo's side and the two had sped up, leaving Lynetta behind and out of earshot. Bracken took the opportunity to advance until his mount drew up level with her own. "'Have you had your fill of adventure yet, beloved?' he said in a mocking tone, doing an imitation of Malvo's cadence. She gave him a look that said she didn't think he was funny. Lynetta was already tired of the bickering between the pair, even though they rarely talked to one another. They preferred to use her as their proxy, running their complaints for the other through her instead of facing the offender directly. "'When are you going to tell that guy where he can stick his acorns?' Bracken asked. "'I know you can't like the way he's treating you.' "'What isn't to like?' she asked. "'He's polite, caring, attentive, and helpful.' "'And an utter burl!' Lynetta looked at him sideways. "'Language!' she warned. She wasn't sure if she was a noble or not, but the things that came out of the soldier's mouth weren't fit for polite company. Bracken rolled his eyes, and let out a huff of air. Malvo turned to see him talking to Lynetta, his expression turning hard. I'm starting to feel like a deer caught between a lion and a bear. She nudged her mount forward, looking for a spot between both men where she wouldn't have to hear any more sniping. Malvo, however, slowed his pace so that he was once again riding beside her. 
Jif reminded me that we are approaching a town that is famed for its hot springs. The waters are said to be very restorative. What say we stop for a couple hours and enjoy a soak? No, Bracken said from behind them. Absolutely not. Why add more time to the journey? If we pick up our pace, we could make it back to Xeria before sundown tomorrow night. Malvo did not turn his head to acknowledge him. We could hurry back to the capital, but we'd be exhausted if we did, dead on our feet. I prefer to set a more leisurely pace, and the hot springs are not to be missed. Bracken groaned, and Lynetta put a hand to her head, where her temple was beginning to throb. A break does sound good. Maybe I can find a private pool to drown myself in. I would like a soak, she said, smiling at Malvo. Of course you would, Bracken shouted causing a murder of crows to burst into flight from the top of a nearby tree. Anything to delay us just a little while longer. Do you hear something, milady? Malvo said with a squint on his face. I wish I didn't, she mumbled, then started counting her horse's steps, hoping they weren't far from the town in question. She slipped into the water, fully nude, a sigh rising from her mouth to the heavens. As the only female, she'd been rooted to the pools designated for the fairer sex. The men, on the other hand, were forced to crowd into the other area. Thankfully, they'd chosen to stop at a time when most of the townsfolk were at work in the fields, so the pools were mostly deserted. That meant that Lynetta could finally find the peace and quiet she'd been denied on the road. She was leaning against the stone rim of the pool, eyes closed, listening to the faint tinkle of water over rocks when she started suddenly at the sound of shouting from the other side of the small building where they'd stowed their clothing. "'I don't see your name engraved on any of these pools,' it was Bracken's voice as surly as ever. "'Jiff, would you be so kind as to inform our friend about the unwritten rules of our society in which nobles are entitled to space of their own, whether or not anything is engraved to that effect?' She could hear Jiff's voice as he repeated what Malvo had said. Bracken interrupted halfway through. Jiff, would you be so kind as to inform your master that I am perfectly capable of hearing him without having you repeat everything? Jiff dutifully repeated Bracken's words, only to be interrupted by Malvo again, who told Jiff to tell Bracken that it was rude to interrupt someone carrying a message from a nobleman. Bracken then interrupted to tell Jiff to tell Malvo that all messages he received from noblemen were returned unheeded. Lynetta let out a cry of frustration and sank beneath the waters, her chance at a restful break evaporating like the steam rising from the hot springs pools. They were back on the road less than an hour later, identical scowls on both Malvo's and Bracken's faces. The nobleman was glued to her side, making idle chats, and since Lynetta knew she wouldn't get a break from his talking, she decided to steer the conversation in a useful direction. How about we play a game, Lord Malvo? she suggested brightly. A game? On horseback, he frowned. It's not a race, is it? Because I'd rather not risk your precious frame on something as dangerous as a horse race. It's not a race. On the contrary, it's a game of questions we can play while we continue this sedate pace. Too sedate, Bracken grumbled from behind them. At this rate, it will be King's Day before we reach the capital. Malvo ignored the other man. I would enjoy playing a game of questions with you, though I must admit I have not played one before. It's a courtship game, she said flirtatiously. It's meant to prove how well a suitor knows the woman he's courting. You females and your games, he laughed, shaking his head. All right, then. I accept your challenge. Allow me to prove my eternal devotion. Good. Lynetta said, clapping excitedly. Family is first, of course. Tell me what you know of the Chimera clan. Your line is very old, he answered. One of the oldest of the Fey noble lines. I know that your grandfather held a governorship in the south for many centuries. He received your southern estate at his appointment. An estate rich in vineyards, orchards, and grain. That is how your family also became one of the wealthiest of the nobility. Very good, she said nodding graciously while making note of every tidbit of information he revealed. There was little time to spare, now that the capital was so close. This game might provide the means she needed to learn everything she could about herself before she was put to the test in Xeria. What of my siblings? she continued. Ah, but you're trying to trick me, he said, wagging his finger at her. You have no siblings. 
a rare only child among the Fay. Your parents dote on you because of that fact. No siblings. She wasn't sure why that felt wrong to her, but it did. Chalking it up to lingering anxiety, she ignored the feeling. What of my traits? What do you know of them? She hoped to understand herself better, her likes and dislikes, her place in society. Malvo's lips quirked as he spoke. Well, I've heard you are famed throughout the realm for your singing voice. Perhaps you'd like to entertain us with a song as we ride. Yes, Lady Lynetta, Bracken said in a faux rabid tone. Please, bless us with your song. We must hear this famed voice of yours. Another time, perhaps, she said coolly. There's no chance in hells that I'm going to risk croaking off key if I'm a well-known singer. We're still playing the game. Right. My apologies, beloved. Malvo scratched his chin, deciding what to say next. I've also heard you are known for your tiny pencil portraits of birds. Bird portraits? She heard Bracken sniggering and wanted nothing more than to turn around and punch the man in his smug face. Lynetta nodded, hoping there was more substance to her than the things Malvo had just mentioned. She felt like she was assembling a collection of facts that had no bearing on who she was inside. And if I may be bold enough to discuss your personal life, the nobleman continued, you are courted often but never married, not after the sudden death of your husband nearly seventy-five years ago. Lynetta held still, trying not to show a reaction. I was married? To a husband who died so long ago. How can I not remember that? She had loved and lost, and not one memory remained of that time. Of course, your beauty is such that suitors cannot resist you, even if most feel that it is hopeless to pursue you. His tone was even, but Lynetta knew he was wondering how he stacked up against the others she'd rejected. Brecken sniffed, and this time Lynetta turned around. His eyes were burning into her, and she didn't know why, but she wanted to ask him what he knew about her. Malvo might be able to list a bunch of random facts about the woman she was supposed to be, but as of now she felt that Bracken was the man who truly knew her, knew her fears, knew her quirks, knew how to make her smile, knew how to hold her when she cried, knew how to kiss her like he couldn't breathe without her lips against his. She turned away, her cheeks heating with embarrassment. You aren't considering suitors, Lady Lanetta, she told herself. You're finding out information, vital information you'll need when you reach the capital. As it is, it looks as if you won't recover your memory any time soon. These facts are the only thing you'll be able to arm yourself with to convince people that you are who they say you are. Correct, she said after a moment. Let's move on. I'd like to hear about the gossip people say about me. Malvo's eyebrows rose. My lady, you know that rumors are just that. There is likely not a grain of truth among them. Amuse me, then. What do people say about me when I am not around? Malvo licked his lips, and she could tell he was coaching his words carefully. You are a hard woman to get to know, he said slowly. You raise your defenses at the first hint of probing. Some call you cold, others calculating. Your nickname around Xere is the Ice Princess. Ice Princess, Bracken muttered. Utter nonsense. You've got more fire in your veins than any fay female I've ever seen. She wasn't sure if he was speaking for her to hear at or not, but she perked up, pride filling her. Talking about herself in the abstract was like learning about a different person, but Bracken was speaking from experience, very personal experience. She knew she should ignore him and stick to the task at hand, but it wasn't easy. What else? she asked for after a moment still hungry for information. I have to learn all I can, know myself inside and out. She told herself that it was because she would be confronted soon by people who knew her, not like Malvo who knew of her, but people she'd met and spent time with, friends, relatives, suitors. Deep down, however, there was another fear lurking, one she didn't even want to acknowledge. I have to know everything about myself because if I don't, the doppelganger might return and steal my life from me. She might become me. Then who would I become? Chapter 20 Today they would enter the capital. She'd seen it last night when the lights of the city were bright enough to emerge as a glow in the distance beyond the walls of the hilltop town 
where they'd start to rest. Anxiety coursed through her as they rode toward its area. She was relieved that her journey was near its end, but the part of her that knew she faced an even greater danger in the capital was frightened by what was to come. Jiff had ridden out early that morning to prepare Lord Malvo's house for his arrival, which meant there were only five of them now, but the roads this close to the capital were well patrolled. Not only did brigands and cutthroats avoid the area, but the wilds were now a full league away from the road on either side. Farms, homes, and other signs of civilization now filled in the margins, growing more populous with every step they took toward the gleaming white city before them. Although the feeling of being watched had subsided, a new worry knotted up Lynetta's stomach. What would she do when they entered Exaria? Bracken would insist on accompanying her home, but she had no idea where home was, and even if she were able to surreptitiously obtain the address, what would she find when she arrived? Either no one would recognize her, and she'd be arrested for attempting to impersonate a fey noble, or worse, they would recognize her and welcome her with open arms, only to discover that she didn't remember large swaths of her life. Maybe a family member is responsible for my memory lapse, she thought. I could be walking right into a trap. The glimmering walls of the capital drew closer by the hour, and her anxiety grew along with it. It wasn't all driven by her worries about what might happen when she arrived. Part of it was driven by certainty, not speculation. The only thing she knew for certain was that when she arrived and Bracken ushered her home, he would consider his mission complete. He would return to his unit, and she might never see him again. The only person who knew her was about to abandon her, making her feel more lost than ever. They picked up fellow travelers as they progressed, with more and more bodies filling the roads. A few were on horseback, like they were, most seeming to be shuttling back and forth between the city gates and the rapidly expanding infrastructure outside Exaria's walls. Their pace was forced to slow, but Lynetta didn't mind a little prolonging of the inevitable. A woman carrying a small fey child walked alongside her for a stretch, and she smiled at the babe, making funny faces until it squealed with laughter. The mother looked up at her, quickly assessing her rank, and inclined her head in acknowledgement. That's something I'm going to have to get used to, she thought. Malvo might make a big deal out of her social status, but she'd felt like everyone else for the most part. That, too, was about to change. I should turn around, flee, seek answers elsewhere. I'm not ready for this. Almost home, Brecken said, having ridden up beside her without her noticing. You're probably eager to be back among your own kind. Lynetta wasn't sure if she could bear to look at him, even with his double-edged comment. She stared straight ahead as she responded. It would be a relief to be out of the saddle, she said, ignoring his implication. Bracken chuckled, then sat silent in the saddle, not falling back to his position behind her, but remaining near her side. She snuck a glance at him, noting once again how strikingly attractive he was. Even now, women in the crowd were making eyes at him. She imagined how much female attention he must get in his uniform and tried to suppress a scowl. Maybe you are the Ice Princess that Malvo mentioned, Brecken said in a quiet tone. That might have been for his ears only, but she doubted it. I beg your pardon, she turned to him then, unable to help herself. No need to beg. I'll give it freely, his grin irritated her. I thought he was incorrect about your nickname, but I can see it sometimes. You can be a hard nut to crack. Would you prefer I was an easy nut? Perhaps like the redhead you couldn't keep your eyes off at the market in Gelder's Glen. She watched his face carefully for a response. A look of confusion took over his features. What are you talking about? I saw your eyes practically fall out of your head watching her. Just like her assets were practically falling out of her dress. I remember her, Malvo said suddenly. His voice was full. He'd been riding near Corvo, but had allowed her to catch up without Lynetta noticing. She is nothing compared to you, of course, my lady, he hurried to add, then coughed nervously. Lynetta ignored Malvo, not caring if he ogled fifty fey females in front of her. Bracken shook his head, his expression unchanged. I have no idea who you're talking about. I was keeping my eyes peeled for danger. Oh, she was dangerous, all right, Lynetta muttered. 
She could have easily smothered you to death. Malvo tried to hold in a gasp of laughter, not doing very well at it, but Bracken still looked as if he had no clue what she meant. Either he wasn't looking at her, or he was an excellent liar. As far as she knew, he'd played things straight with her so far. A little tingle bubbled up inside her, and she tried not to enjoy the sensation. We're approaching the gate. This was from Fenric, who was riding point. The men pulled in tight around her so they'd enter the city together. Guards in uniforms like the one Bracken had been wearing the first night she met him flanked the wide gate on either side. The eyes trained on the masses who flooded into and out of the capital. A flurry of nerves had her muscles tense, but they rode through the gate unimpeded. Lynetta let out a long breath when she was on the other side. I'm home, she told herself. So why doesn't it feel like it? The buildings in the capital city were white so bright they nearly hurt her eyes. She was stunned for a moment by the architecture. Exeria was more like a work of art than a living, breathing city, even though the streets were teeming with people. Roofs curved in elegant ways, then were embellished with intricate scallops, swirls, points or shapes. Some resembled white flames, others birds, and everywhere she looked something new and fantastic presented itself. "'Beautiful, isn't it?' Bracken said, leaning over to speak softly. She nodded, too overcome to speak. The streets were wide, paved in large white stone blocks. In the distance, she could see a white bridge curving over bright blue waters, its sides decorated in intricate patterns that almost hurt the eye to view. Beyond the bridge, a large tower rose to dominate the landscape. It looked like a carved spiral that looped up to the heavens, its windows almost blending into the sophisticated brick and plaster work. Surely you've seen this all before, Bracken said, affecting a bored tone. Nothing special, right? She wanted to contradict him, to tell him the city might be one of the most special things she ever had the privilege of seeing, but she knew she couldn't, not if a big lie was to stand. Right, she said, then yawned. You've seen one capital, you've seen them all. She thought she saw a flash of disappointment in his eyes, but it quickly faded. Point me in the direction of your mansion, and I'll make sure to deliver you there post-haste, Brecken said. My lady, Melville called, reaching a hand to touch the pommel of her saddle and hold her in place. Before you depart for home, may I invite you to my townhouse for refreshment? I would be honoured to say that Lady Lynetta graced my doorstep with her exquisite presence. Well, how can a girl say no to that request? Relief flooded her, now that she had an excuse to delay giving directions she didn't yet know to Bracken. She inclined her head to Malvo. You are very kind, my lord. I am feeling parched. Oh no, Bracken interrupted. No more delays. I'm taking you home, and that's that. Malvo scowled at his rival, shaking his head. I have been polite for as long as I can, but I will not stand for this inferior mass of muscles with little sense dictating the terms of your existence any more. If your mistress wishes to visit my townhouse, then you'll follow along like a good little boy and say nothing. A little boy? Is that what you think I am? Lynetta could see that Bracken's hand had moved to his rapier. His voice was low, his face carved of rock. You aren't the only one who's been behaving himself. I don't take orders from some jumped-up minor noble who is getting too big for his britches. Malvo's mouth opened and closed, reminding Lynetta of a fish out of water. Lynetta moved her mount to block Bracken's path, cornering him and cutting him off from the target of his wrath. Lord Malvo and his men have been very kind to accompany us back to the capital, she told him in an even tone. The least we can do is accept his hospitality for a few minutes. My orders command me to see you home, and that's what I mean to do, without another leaving interruption. You will complete your mission, never fear, she said, trying to keep the weariness out of her voice. All he cares about is this bloody mission of his. Is he so eager to be rid of me? I will reward you handsomely if you'll be patient just a little while longer. Bracken let out a burst of air from his nostrils and said nothing. He lifted his hand and gestured as if to say, lead the way, and Lynetta turned her mount to follow Malvo's. She took the time she had before they arrived to gather her thoughts. 
They'd finally reached the capital, and her memory had yet to return. Maybe I can find a way to determine where my house is without having to admit to Bracken that I don't know. They turned down a narrower street, tightly packed with residences of the two- and three-story variety. They were still ornate, but less so than the ones that had been built along the main street. She watched Finrick stop at a gate that had been outlined in black to stand out against the whitewash of the rest of the street. He knocked his fist against it, and it opened a moment later. Lynetta guided her horse through the gate and into a small courtyard. There were attendants in livery waiting there to help them dismount and to collect their horses and to see them. Malvo wasted no time leading her inside, his pride in his domicile showing on his face. He puffed out his chest as he showed her down a corridor crammed with portraits and landscape paintings in ornate frames. There didn't seem to be an inch of bare wall among them. The corridor opened on both sides to other rooms that were stuffed to the gills with gaudy and expensive furnishings. Malvo has done quite well for himself if he can afford all this, she thought. I wonder what my house must look like since I'm apparently a hundred times wealthier than he is. A liveried attendant stood at the door of the sitting room, and Malvo showed her in, pointing out the tea and cakes that were already waiting for them. She sat waiting as the attendant served them one by one with motions that seemed almost ritualized. She knew the pomp and ceremony was for her benefit, but it only served to make her feel more awkward. She sipped her tea, realizing she wasn't comfortable in the confines of the crowded, overly lavish room. I would rather be back out on the road, near the wilds even, than to contend with all the noise and activity that comes with the city, not to mention the rules and protocols for being a wealthy member of the nobility. Things were simpler before we reached Exaria. She wanted to make her excuses and leave, to start playing a role she didn't feel suited for. Her eyes flicked to Bracken, who stood in a corner, scowling at the nobleman and spurning his refreshments. She knew he was impatient to be gone, but she didn't know exactly where they were going. What else can I do? I can't admit that I'm lost, in more ways than one. Best to stick things out, try to puzzle out where I belong. The longer I delay, the longer Bracken stays. It was a thought she didn't like, a moment of weakness she wished she didn't have, but it was there, nonetheless. Chapter 21 An ornate clock was ticking, its pendulum swinging back and forth to count out the seconds in each minute. It was the only noise in the sitting room as she sat on a small, overstuffed sofa across from Lord Malvo. An oval table was between them, weighted down with a cavalcade of cakes as well as a pot of steaming water, several varieties of teas, a carafe of fresh milk, and both sugar squares and honey to sweeten one's cup. Bracken shifted from one foot to the other where he stood in the corner, arms crossed, expression shuddered. The minutes ticked away, and a sinking sense of doom invaded her. Lynetta leaned in to refill her cup with hot water, but before she could, the attendant rushed to do it for her. It was her third cup of tea, and even Lord Malvo seemed a little at a loss of how to proceed. He'd danced attendance on her since their meeting, had flirted shamelessly, and even hinted at a possible relationship between the two of them, but their conversation since arriving at his townhouse had a stilted and awkward quality. I've exceeded the bounds of his hospitality, she thought, sipping her tea slowly and beating her brain for an excuse to extend her visit. She'd yet to uncover any hints as to where she lived in the city, and she was frankly scared of what would happen when she left the townhouse and set out on her own. Except I won't be alone. I need an excuse, one that Bracken will accept. She was in a panic that her chance of success was slipping away. She'd made it all the way to Exaria without anyone discovering that she had no memory of who she was, and to expose herself now would mean all that effort was for nothing. Besides, she'd be ashamed of herself if Bracken knew she'd been keeping secrets. Somehow, not disappointing the soldier had become important to her. Although she knew he considered her nothing but a mission, somewhere inside she hoped to see him again. Lynetta was almost certain He'd do his best to avoid her if he found out what a liar she was. "'I have enjoyed getting to know you, Lady Nanetta, Malvo said at last when the tension between them had reached its zenith. 
I hope that I might see you again, and soon. Perhaps take a walk in the Kingsbeth Gardens. She could tell by the way he trailed off that he was unsure how his proposal would be received. There was no denying that Lord Malva was a handsome man, and clearly a rich one. He was good to her, persuasive, and had her best interests at heart. I could do worse, she thought, wondering if maybe in some world a man like Malvo and she could find an understanding. But not this time, she thought, unable to stop her eyes from flitting to Bracken, who continued to scowl and gnash his teeth. Lynetta smiled gratefully and set down her teacup. Rising, she inclined her head in Malvo's direction. I would like that. Malvo stood when she did and came forward. His embrace was loose, and he leaned in to press a kiss to her forehead. If there is ever anything I can do for you, don't hesitate to ask, my lady. What happened to Beloved? she asked with a small grin. Lynetta didn't know where the question came from, popping out of her mouth unexpectedly. She chalked it up to her nerves at facing what came next. Malvo's expression turned serious. I never sought to offend, my lady, he said softly. I'm afraid my affection got away from me. I hope you will not think badly of me. I do not, she said, raising a hand to his shoulder. I am so grateful for your companionship on our return to the capital. Malvo's smile was blinding. He took her hands in his and raised their backs to his mouth. As he kissed them fervently, she could tell she'd inadvertently caused the man to have hope where there was none. She was just about to let him down gently when her guardian interjected. I've seen enough, Bracken grumbled from his place in the corner. Time to go. Yes, he's right, she said with a sigh. I've got to find somewhere to lay my head tonight. The last sentence she'd said mostly to herself, slipping out like her prior comment had, without her control. She hadn't intended all eyes to turn to her in confusion and shock. My lady, you can't mean that you have no place to go. She blinked, mentally kicking herself. Scrambling for an excuse, she let inspiration take over. Oh no, she said, laughing airily. It's just that my home, it's... The men were hanging off her words, Malvo waiting attentively, bracken with his permanent scowl. It's being renovated, she spit out finally. Relieved that an excuse had finally presented itself. Renovated, Brecken said dumbly, as if the word made no sense. Yes, renovated. That's why I was at my country estate, remember? She glared at him, waiting for him to play along as her dutiful footman. Is that the emergency that brought you back to the capital? Malvo inquired. Something to do with the renovations? Uh, yes. I mean, no. Lynetta had forgotten the lie she'd told the man earlier. The emergency is something else, but it will keep. I'll, I'll deal with it tomorrow. For now, I need to acquire temporary lodgings. My lady, you should have told me sooner, Malvo chastised her. You must stay here, of course, as my guest. You're too kind. She could feel the tension drain from her as the crisis was averted, at least for the night. It's as good an idea as any. It buys me time to try and figure out what to do next. Her spirits rose for the first time all day. It didn't take long for Bracken to ruin it. No, absolutely not. Bracken moved forward, stopping just in front of her and staring down with disapproval. We are not doing this. Will you excuse us for a moment? She said with a polite smile sent in Malva's direction. Then she shoved Bracken into the hallway with all her might. When they were out of earshot, she shoved her finger in his chest. We are staying just for the night. The hells we are, his face was a thundercloud about to let loose a torrent. I'm taking you home. Renovations be damned. Even when he was this angry with her, she couldn't help but be in awe of his splendor. He really was the best looking man she'd ever had the pleasure or the pain of encountering. You're being ridiculous, she said, trying another tact. Putting her finger away, she turned, affecting an air of nonchalance. No one can disturb the renovations. Besides, what's one more night away? We've come this far already. I'm not going to disturb anything, he said quietly. I just want to take a look at them, to make sure they really are ongoing. Why are you like this? she hissed, letting her anger show. 
You have to countermand me at every step. Does it make you happy to tell me no? To say I'm wrong? To call me a liar? Her voice rose on every word. She was spinning out, unable to control the volume of her voice. The tidal wave of emotions she harbored inside since waking up on the riverbank was threatening to be unleashed. Lynetta, I'm sorry, he said gently, stepping forward. But before he could reach her, Malvo interrupted. That's enough, he said sharply. Lady Lynetta, I must insist that you fire this man on the spot. He's been nothing but insolent and insubordinate. Throw him out or I'll do it myself. I would love to see you try, Bracken spit his grin feral. Gentlemen, if you please. They were standing toe to toe, Bracken taller than Malvo and armed. Malvo, however, had the advantage of being on his own turf. I've kept my mouth shut for too long, Bracken growled. You might be a nobleman, but I'm not a nobody, and no one is going to push me around. Fire him, Malvo insisted. It hasn't come to that yet, she replied, then shoved her arm through Bracken's. If you'll just excuse us for a moment, I'm going to have a talk with my associate. She dragged him through the nearest open door, landing in a room with walls covered in wallpaper in a repeating pattern of gold and silver leaves. The furniture itself was either gold or silver, and all of it looked too delicate to sit on. "'What are we doing here?' Bracken asked, his expression frustrated. "'Why can't you go home?' "'I already told you,' she insisted, her eyes flicking to the door to make sure they weren't interrupted again. "'Look, I'm in a bad spot at the moment, and although I appreciate everything you've done for me, I'm going to have to put off going home for a little while longer.' "'What's wrong?' he said urgently grabbing her by the arms and staring into her face. And don't repeat that stupid lie to me. She shook her head, unwilling to say anything other than please. Bracken's face shifted, a frantic energy filling him. A compromise, then. Come with me to an inn. I'll keep an eye on you a little longer, and we can figure out who's following you. Just please, don't insist on staying with Malvo. What's wrong with Malvo? Lynetta turned her head to see the nobleman leaning against the doorframe. He took a step forward, his expression black. You see, I don't think I have a problem. I think you're the person with the problem. But I'm the one who's going to solve it. Bracken ignored him. I promise to escort you home, and I'm going to do it. His hands moved to cup her cheeks with his thumbs stroking her. Just come with me. She is home, Malvo said, crossing his arms. Your little task is finished. You may go. I'm not leaving, Bracken said, rounding on Malvo after his dismissal. That's where you're wrong. Malvo snapped his fingers, and footsteps sounded in the hall. You've just been given your marching orders. Jiff appeared, and he wasn't alone. A stoic fay in a military uniform with ornate embroidery stood beside him his attention fixed on Bracken. "'You are to report to the main barracks for reassignment,' he said, his voice rough, as if he didn't use it often. "'Captain,' Bracken said, surprise obvious on his face. "'I haven't finished my commission yet. "'If you'll just let me, orders are orders,' the grizzled captain replied, then whistled sharply. Two other soldiers appeared, flanking Bracken, each taking an arm. The handsome fay began to struggle immediately, and Lynetta bit her lip and hugged herself. It took all three of the uniformed men, the captain included, to drag him out of the room and down the hallway. She hurried to the windows that overlooked the street below. Moments later, she saw the soldiers haul Bracken out in the street while he hurled curses at them. Her stomach dropped as her eyes filled with tears. This wasn't the goodbye she was hoping for. The man who knew her best had just been forced out of her life. Now what will happen to me? Chapter 22 She rounded on her host, fury filling her. What did you do? Malvo laughed, but there was a coldness to it that she hadn't heard before. Why don't you join me in the sitting room? We didn't have a chance to finish our tea. Lynetta stared at him, considering whether to resist. She could use her status as a club to beat him with, telling him his hospitality was lacking, then leave in a huff. But Jiff and the livery attendant were watching her carefully, and she had a feeling things might not go her way if she protested. 
Following her host back into the sitting room, she retook her seat, ignoring the tea that had now gone cold. Malvo didn't seem to mind lukewarm tea. She watched him pick up his cup and take a sip, eyeing her over the rim. His demeanor was as calm as it had ever been, and that made Lynetta's anxiety increase. What is he up to? I've seen through you from the start, you know, he said conversationally, setting his teacup on the table and leaning back to bend his knee and cross one leg over the other. She waited, her pulse firing erratically as he picked a piece of lint off his slacks, then looked away again at last. Every noble in the realm knows what Lynetta Chimera looks like, and you're not her. His words shook her to her core. Lynetta licked her lips, trying to think of a comeback, but none rose to her tongue. I'm a fraud? I also know a deserter from the military when I see one. That man is no more your footman than I am. You're wrong. He's a felix. I heard his superior give him the order to return me to the capital. At least she knew she was on solid footing when it came to Bracken. Malvo shrugged a shoulder. Wrong or not, it doesn't matter. I've achieved my objective either way, although it took longer than I hoped. He extended his hand, wiggling the finger where the ring of nobility sat. I bought this ring for a king's ransom five years ago, and I would do it again at ten times the price. This little trinket has paid for itself a dozen times over. A hundred. The gemstones on the ring twinkled in the fading light of the sun. Where did you come across yours? He asked gently, making her flinch. It had become apparent that Malvo was not the man she thought he was. Once she'd considered him harmless, but now she realized he'd been toying with her from the start. He was a dangerous man, and it was time to flee while she had the chance. You, sir, are offensive to the highest degree. She stood, balling her fist at her side and affecting the most condescending countenance she could manage in her shaken state. I refuse to remain here and be insulted any longer. Sit, Malvo growled, his tone one she'd not heard him use before, because you're going to want to hear my theory on how you came across that ring. Ignoring him, Lynetta turned to go, but the doorway was blocked by two men in livery. Malvo jerked his chin at her, and she sat down again, feeling the icy fingers of fear starting to twist her insides. Here is what I think, he continued, once she'd taken her seat. You somehow ran into the real Lynetta Chimera. This is her ring, and so is the purse tied to your belt. She looked down at the purse, realizing that the embroidery was there for anyone to see, the name Lynetta, stitched boldly for anyone who took the time to read it. She couldn't speak, couldn't tell him he was wrong, because she had no idea where the ring had come from, nor the purse. His theory is as good as any at this point. Maybe you and your toy soldier managed to get her alone. I must admit that your pretend footman cuts a dashing figure. Even a pillar of virtue like the lovely Lady Chimera might not be able to resist his wiles, even if he chose to employ them. You're wrong, she hissed, using her anger to drive back the fright building inside her. Her eyes scanned the room, looking for alternate exits. Am I? he said idly. What did you do to her? Rough her up kill her. He looked her over with a gaze of appreciation. With the air of desperation that's been clinging to you since we met, I can see why you'd be willing to go to any length to change your fortunes. You know nothing about me. No one does. I know one thing. If you insist on impersonating Lady Chimera, you'll be caught in a day and forced to confess, and I don't think they'll go lightly on you for your crimes. There has been no crime, she said patiently switching tactics again upon the realization that the door offered her only escape from the room. And I can assure you, no one has been hurt or killed. This is all a misunderstanding. I'm sure your partner in crime is saying the same thing to his superiors right now. We'll see if they believe him any more than I believe you. It was evident that Malvo wasn't buying a word of what she was saying. If you were so certain that I am not Lynetta Chimera, then why did you play along for so long? Why not turn me in for whatever reward you're after? It's not a reward I want, he said, his eyes filling with something she did not want to recognize. Although I might have had this conversation sooner if I had been able to get rid of that damn soldier before Exaria. He's tenacious, I'll give him that. 
but he's all wrong for you. She rolled her eyes in response. So that's why you've been trying to drive a wedge between us this entire trip? Malvo nodded with an evil grin. You can say that. Although my charms weren't having the desired effect, I had to wait until this morning to send Jif to the Guard General with a note about the probable deserter. I imagine your darling Bracken is locked away behind bars by now. She closed her eyes, fighting against a feeling of despair that was fighting back. What do you want? she said at last, too tired to keep up their verbal sparring. Walk with me, he said suddenly, rising and offering his arm. She looked at him with narrowed eyes. You have no reason to worry, he said with a grin. If I wanted to hurt you, I could do so easily, he motioned with his arm again. Join me. Feeling like there was no point in resisting, she did as he asked, but declined to take his arm. Malvo led her out of the sitting room and back into the corridor. He lifted his hands to indicate the portraits cluttering the walls. What do you think of my collection? Turning from side to side, she tried to determine a pattern among the riot of colors held in an assortment of different sized frames. There were landscapes, still lifes, portraits, line drawings of people and things. It's, she trailed off, unsure of how to describe the eclectic assemblage. Isn't it? He said with a chuckle. I assure you, there is a method to my madness. Each of these frames holds a reminder of what I was and what I have become. He motioned to her to follow as he approached a large frame portrait of a fey male with long chestnut hair in a series of elaborate braids. His clothing was so filled with embroidery that she could scarcely see the fabric underneath. This is my great uncle Fabulous, he said, indicating the man in the portrait. He was the most vicious cutthroat the Downs has ever seen. He could sneak up on a man in any condition and slit him from ear to ear without attracting any noise. They used to whisper that he had the power of invisibility. He may have. I cannot say for certain. But to a scared young boy, he was both a nightmare and a dream. She had no idea what he meant, and her desire to indulge him in his recitation was non-existent, but information was power, so she listened despite herself. The Downs? He nodded. If you were truly from the capital, you would know about the Downs. Their Xeria's dirty little secret, all the forgotten fay, those not fortunate to wear a ring like ours, they find their way to the Downs. Malvo turned away from the man he'd called his uncle, moving to a smaller frame, holding a line drawing. She drew closer to see that it was a group of boys, all younger than ten, skulking in an alley. My crew, the faux nobleman said, pointing out the smallest with his index finger. And me. Your crew. The figure under his finger barely looked old enough to dress himself. We would pick pockets and steal unguarded purses. My little hands could get in places others could not. One of the reasons, I assume, Fabulous found a use for me. He kept me fed, and I kept him in coin. You were a child, she whispered, although she refused to allow herself to feel pity for the man who'd laid a neat trap for her. I survived, he said, his voice vibrating with intensity. My mother abandoned us to chase after some minor noble or another, and my father was too busy drinking himself to death to care about me. But I found a family in the streets, and I thrived. Why are you showing me this? she asked, unable to keep her confusion in check any longer. Malvo took a step closer and looked down on her. I came from humble circumstances. Few could be termed lower than I, and yet here I stand, surrounded by opulence, all the trappings of wealth, everything I've come by. I made my own place in this world. You can too. Shaking her head, she took a step back. I'm not like you. She held up her hands, taking another step back down the corridor. I can't be. You're almost there already, he said, indicating the ring. And now that I've gotten rid of a certain bad influence, I can take you the rest of the way. I don't know what you're saying she said, creeping backward, her eyes on the door that led to the courtyard. I'm going to take you under my wing. Mentor you. Teach you how to imitate a noble convincingly. You've got an excellent base to build on. All you need is a little refinement. How, how do you know I'm an imitation? You may be correct. 
I may not be Lynette Camara, but that doesn't mean I wasn't born into nobility. He laughed. I've been existing among the nobility for half a decade now, convincing them all that I'm one of them, and I can tell you confidently that you would be exposed within a few hours without my help. It's your demeanor, the way you treat people, for example, your footman. Malvo's face held a look of distaste. It was clear that Brecken was not one of his favorite subjects. A real noble would never allow a footman to be that familiar, nor to speak back, let alone issue commands. While nursemaids might be well to get away with a little sass, footmen would never survive behaving as that great oaf did. No one else seemed to have a problem with my demeanor, she pointed out. Innkeepers, shop clerks, none of them ever looked twice at me. Coin talks, beloved, he said simply. What did they care if you were a real noble or fake? As long as you pay them, it doesn't matter. She stared at the floor, embarrassed. All this time I thought I was pulling the wool over everyone's eyes, turns out. I was only fooling myself, thinking I could be some noble female. I should have known better. Then there was the little matter of your being an absolute killing machine with a bow. She looked up at his words, feeling a little bolstered by his genuine admiration. No noble, male or female, is so well trained as to be able to handle a weapon as you did. That alone gave you away. Standing tall, she pushed her hair off her shoulders and took a deep breath. Fine. I accept your assessment, but not your offer. Are you going to release me? Malvo shook his head. No. I'm going to save you. Save me from what? Your evil clutches? Save you from yourself, from the brackens of the world. I'm going to show you what you were always meant to be. I'm going to share my wisdom and my fortune with you. And why would you do something like that for me? Whatever his answer, she knew she would not like it. Malvo looked her over, his eyes traveling slowly, so that by the time he finally met her gaze again, she felt slightly sick. The real answer is, why would I not? You're smart, capable, and vicious, and you're more gorgeous than Lynette Chimera could ever hope to be. You, my dear, are the perfect package. She stared at him, disbelieving. So his romantic shtick hadn't been entirely fake. Malvo closed the gap between them, his hands lifting to her shoulders where he rubbed gently. Lowering his head, he spoke into her ear, his hot breath feathering her skin. You are everything I need in a mate. Chapter 23 Your mate? She couldn't believe what she was hearing. I've fallen right into Malvo's trap, no matter how many times Bracken tried to warn me against the man. And now the soldier was gone likely imprisoned on whatever charges Malvo had been able to trump up against him. Just think of the two of us together. There's nothing we couldn't do. His hold on her tightened as his eyes glazed over. We could convince people that you are some sort of heiress, one tucked away on an eastern estate. Those noble families tend to keep to themselves, rarely appearing in the capital, and even more rarely marrying outside of their region. Of course, I was able to romance you away and win your hand, bringing my prize back to the capital. I'm not interested in more lies, she muttered, knowing that he wasn't paying a lick of attention to anything she said. I only want to discover the truth. The truth is, they'll believe whatever we feed them. Once I'm done dressing you, teaching you the appropriate manners, you'll have them eating out of your dainty little hand. To what end? she said with a gesture of frustration designed to dislodge his hands from her frame. She took a step backward, bristling with anger to make him keep his distance. Why would snagging yourself a fake heiress matter? Do you not see what's around you? The fruits of my labor? All of this I managed on my own, but with the elevation to a higher title with the help of your esteemed family's name, I could move my machinations to a higher tier. Your good looks and obvious breeding will grant me access to even fatter purses and fuller coffers. They'll be eager to trade with me and distracted enough by your beauty not to notice the substantial cut I take of every transaction. You don't know my family's name. I don't even know it. You're missing the point, darling, he said, advancing a step toward her. And I know you're doing it purposely, because you're not a stupid girl. 
You know how to make a man ache for you. Just look at how that soldier was carrying on. She blushed, wishing he would stop throwing Bracken in her face. Maybe I'm just a pretty face, she blurted, wishing she had eyes in the back of her head so she could judge the remaining distance to the door. More than pretty. Beauty like yours should be outlawed, like iron. It's too dangerous. It was a compliment, she knew, but it didn't feel like one. Malville wanted her as a puppet, one who would help him carry out his schemes without complaint. The fact that she now knew his noble background was fake didn't matter, because he knew she was a liar as well. The best she could hope for was mutual destruction. The worst, she didn't want to think about. I've got to get out of here. She knew she had to flee, that she had to escape and stay gone. Because if Malvo started to consider her a liability rather than an asset, she'd end up in a world of hurt. Her restraint broke the second he took another step toward her. She turned and ran down the hall, lunging for the door to the courtyard. She yanked it open, then froze when she saw two livid attendants on the other side. Malvo's footsteps were pounding toward her, so she did what she had to. Leaping out the door, she made a break for the gate. Hoping to outrun the surprised attendants, Grab her! Malvo shouted, rushing out the door after her. Time slowed and she ran with everything she had, praying that she could get the gate open before someone caught her. She extended her hand, reaching for the lock as she hurried forward, but before her fingers could find purchase, she felt hands clutching at her. They spun her around, the attendants holding her fast against the gate. Malvo slowed to a saunter, shaking his head. No reason to make things difficult. You want to see difficult? She let loose the rage boiling away inside her. Cornered, instinct was all she had to rely on. She lashed out, tensing her muscles then flexing them, dragging and pulling her limbs while trying to free herself. She managed to catch one of the attendants off guard and freed her arm by kicking him in the knee. Her arm flew up, forming a fist which she smashed into the other's jaw. He fell backward, wincing, but his hand still held her fast. Malvo lurched forward to grab for her, but she spun around, throwing the attendant into Malvo with a burst of strength. They collided and fell into a heap, the hold on her releasing. She abandoned the gate, knowing she'd never get it open before they stopped her. Instead, she sprinted back to the house, hoping to find an alternate exit. Leaping through the door, she ran headlong into Jiff, who caught her in an embrace. She struggled, leaning in to bite his shoulder. With a howl, he let her go, but Corvo and Fenric stood at the end of the hall, a wall of flesh that would not let her pass. Corvo shook his head as he advanced, Fenric on his heels. She'd been wary at the dour-faced man, who she'd not seen once smile during the trip, and now she wanted even more to avoid him. She shoved her way past Jiff again and cut off down another hall. But it came to a dead end, the doors on either side of it locked. She looked around for anything she could use as a weapon, but all she could see were the framed pictures crowding the walls. She grabbed one that looked sharp, and when Corvo turned the corner, she threw it at him with everything she had. Her eyes widened as she saw it flip end over end with vicious speed. The corner buried itself in Corvo's eye, and the man dropped, letting out a muffled groan of pain. Fenric's eyes widened and the big man charged. She attempted to grab another painting, but she couldn't get the frame off the wall fast enough. The giant of a fay tackled her, bringing her down and pinning her to the floor. No amount of struggling could dislodge his bulk. Soon enough, Malvo was staring down at her, hands on his hips and a grimace on his face. Is this the way you repay me for my hospitality? He motioned with his hands. Get her up. Fenric moved, pulling her to her feet. He yanked her arms behind her and trapped her wrists in his big paw. Let me show you to your room, Malvo said formally, turning on his heel to head down the hallway. Fenric propelled her after him, not releasing her arms. They followed Malvo up a flight of stairs and down a carpeted hallway. In here, he said, and Fenric shoved her through the doorway and into an opulent bedroom. Then he released her, heading back out the door. Malvo stood there, his hand on the doorknob. Why don't you think things over for a while? Give my offer some further consideration. I'll return when it is time for dinner, and I'll expect a different answer. As soon as the door shut, she rushed to the window. It overlooked the stable roof, and although it would present a treacherous climb, she would rather risk breaking a bone than stay here 
and be forced to do Malvo's bidding. She wrenched on the window attempting to open it, but it went nowhere. She tried unlocking it, but it would not release, no matter what she tried. Turning her back to the window, she scanned the room, taking stock of her situation. There was a large bed covered with a duvet of luxurious fabric. A wardrobe closed, a couple dresses, and a desk with a leather chair. She could see a door that was cracked open, and she hurried to it, opening it to reveal a bathroom with a chamber pot, a wash basin, and a large stone tub. There was also a narrow window. She tossed aside the curtain, then let out a groan. Bars! They were thin, made of silver, but there was no way she'd be able to dislodge them enough to squeeze between them. It was a lost cause, just like the other windows. She tried the wardrobe next, looking for something she could use to pry the windows open, but all she found were her own things, removed from her saddlebags, brushed out and hung. She grabbed her breeches and blouse, tossing them on the bed, then undressing quickly. This morning it had seemed like the right decision to put on her fanciest dress for their triumphant return to Exaria. She figured that if she did run into anyone who knew her as Lynetta Chimera, then it would be better if she looked the part. But I was never Lynetta Chimera, so it didn't matter. And it was hard enough to fight in these bloody skirts. The breeches would be better. Their mobility would aid in her escape, because I am getting out of here. I didn't make it this far just to be thwarted by some two acorn con then. She returned to the bed, sitting down and trying to corral her racing thoughts. It wasn't easy to make sense of what had happened in the last hour. I found out I'm not who I thought I was. I got Bracken in trouble, and now I'm the prisoner of some criminal who wants to team up to defraud the richest and most powerful people in the capital. Just another day in the Fey realm. She buried her face in her hands. It was demoralizing to be back at the beginning again, no further along in solving the mystery of herself than she had been when she'd woken up in the forest. I don't even have a name for myself. It was even worse that she'd lost the only person she could trust. Because of me, he's likely being punished, or worse, imprisoned. Bracken had only tried to help her, from the first moment when he'd interceded in the bar, keeping the locals from abusing her drunken state and her purse. I was lucky he was there, she thought. I never would have made it this far without him. Malvo's theory returned to her mind, and she grimaced. She couldn't believe he thought her capable of hurting someone to steal a ring, hurting or killing. It was worse still that he thought Bracken would have acted as her partner in crime. The Felix had done nothing but protect her. She could not imagine him putting his hands on a woman to harm her. It just didn't seem possible. Then again... Earlier this morning, I thought Lord Malvo Cavaggio was a kind and decent nobleman. When I get things wrong, I get them massively wrong. She froze, a new, more sinister thought entering her mind. She'd been wrong about Malvo, so what if she'd been wrong about Bracken too? It had been very convenient, him showing up just when she needed help. He'd been only too happy to escort her back to Exaria, even though his entire demeanor declared that he was never happy to do anything. I heard his superior order him to bring me back to the capital, she reminded herself, but even that was not enough evidence to stop the doubts from haranguing her. He could have gotten one of his friends to pretend to be his superior. The entire thing could have been a setup. He might not even be in the military at all. Eyes wide, she had a vision that would haunt her. Bracken following her, waylaying her, and blanking her memory, either with a well-placed blow to the head or some sort of spell or potion. He'd then waited for her to return to town, and pretended to be her bodyguard, her savior. But why would anyone go to such lengths? It didn't make any sense. Then she remembered how he'd tried to keep her to himself, to steer her away from the others. Maybe he figured that he could manipulate you more easily with no memory. He could build himself as your hero, maybe even convince you to fall in love with him, so when you finally solved the mystery of your identity, a mystery that he likely knew the answer to the entire time, you'd be so grateful that you'd marry him. Falling back against the mattress, she stared at the ceiling, wondering whether anyone could be so calculating, so deceptive. To manipulate someone in that way? It was barbaric, cruel, unleafing, believable. Could I really believe that Bracken could be capable of such a heinous crime? 
He'd run hot and cold, pushing her away only to kiss her and draw her back in. She'd never known where she'd stood with him, but to believe that everything he'd done had been part of some sinister plot, it was unfathomable. She didn't think Bracken had it in him. He might be a foul-mouthed, bossy, brooding male, but he isn't a monster. She closed her eyes. Whether or not Bracken had anything to do with her loss of memory didn't matter at the moment. It told her nothing about who she really was. Nothing seemed to get her closer to any of the answers she needed. I wish I could just give up, lie down and sleep, and not have to worry about the nightmares, or the horrors that happen when I'm not asleep. But she wasn't the giving-up type. She sat up and walked to one of the dresses, on top of which sat her comb. Starting to brush through her long locks, she counted the strokes, seeking the calm that always came with the activity. By the time she hit fifty, she was breathing regularly. Her heart beat no longer faster than an alley cat. She could feel her internal reservoirs refilling, her strength returning. At the hundredth stroke, she put down the comb and told herself that she wasn't giving up. Walking calmly to the door, she slammed her fist against it. Let me out, she shouted, continuing to hit the door. I'm being held against my will. Help me. Over and over, she banged against the door, over and over, repeating the same words, calling out to anyone who might hear her. It was no doubt a long shot, but she couldn't risk not trying. Someone could hear, she told herself. Someone might call the guard. Her hand began to ache, so she switched to the other one. She pounded until her limbs felt like jelly, finally leaning face first against the door when she could pound no longer. And that was when she heard a thump. It came from the hallway, somewhere away from the door, but it was definitely on the same floor. She pressed her ear to the door just in time to hear a groan. She stepped back, her eyes searching frantically again for a weapon. There was nothing of use that she could use, so she rummaged in the drawers of the desk, coming out with a large ink quill and brandishing it as a weapon. The door burst open suddenly and she froze, ready to do her worst to whoever crossed the threshold, except she was the one standing on the other side of the door. Her hands went limp as she took in the face of a woman who looked exactly like her. Her reflection had come to life, and here it was, just as it had been in the tea tent back in Gilda's Glen. Although their features were identical, their clothing varied, her doppelganger also wore leather breeches, of a darker brown than her own. Her shirt, however, was composed not of cotton, but of animal fur, and it was sewn together with leather patches, hugging her body and allowing for full mobility of her arms and torso. She wore a dark green cloak of a shade that seemed like it changed as she moved. Her double's honey-blonde hair was braided into an intricate pattern, tight against her skull and down the back of her neck. They stared at each other for a second, maybe two, and then the other woman vanished, setting off down the hallway. Unwilling to let her double escape again without getting some answers, she followed. Terra hit her in the hallway when she saw the number of liveried bodies that were strewn about the hallway. It was unable to determine whether they were dead or merely stunned, and keep up with the woman who was now rushing down the stairs. She put on a burst of speed, taking the stairs two or three at a time, then rushing pell-mell down the corridor, dodging the bodies that were littering the first floor. She crashed into the courtyard, ignoring those who had fallen here, keeping her eyes peeled for her doppelganger. She looked up at the squeak of the gate and saw her slip through it. Pursuing at top speed, she followed the swirl of her dark green cloak around corners down busy streets. The sun was setting over Xeria, but the streets were just as crowded as before. It was hard for her to keep her target in her sights, but she refused to give up and as the chase continued, she seemed to get faster, to get closer, to somehow gain on her prey. She didn't understand it, but there was no time to think about it. When she saw the cloaked figure leap to grab the overhang of a low-hanging roof, she skirted across the street and did the same, pulling herself up onto the slick tiled surface. When her double leaped from that roof to the one next to it, then climbed up the wall to the next story, in a series of quick and elegant movements, she did the same. She didn't think, her body acted for her, an instinct machine that turned her from helpless maiden to determined athlete. Minutes later, she found herself running along the narrow pinnacle of a roof, the place where the tiles came together in a narrow run of plaster. The woman in front of her raced along without fear, so she did the same, every molecule in her united in purpose. 
until the wind picked up. A gust upset her balance, and a second later she was falling, slipping down the tile and heading for the edge of the five-story building. The fall would likely break her neck. She scrambled for perches, her fingers finding none. A shadow hit her face just as her body went over the edge. She reached up for the hand that reached down to her, staring into her double's eyes as she pinned all her hope on the other's outstretched hand. They made contact, and suddenly the world around them exploded with light. Chapter 24 Power burst through her, a raging torrent that ripped through her insides, blanking her senses. She burned with it, on the edge of exploding into a thousand points of light. The first thing that grazed her consciousness was the sound of screaming. Her eyes blinked open, the blindness clearing from them as she felt herself pulled upward. She scrabbled up the tile until they reached the narrow plaster strip again. She stood, carefully balancing herself before trying to understand what just happened. The night around them was heavy with the shouts and screams of the people below them. She could see them, pointing and running, the street a whirlwind of chaos. She turned to her companion, who was looking at her, her expression stunned. That makes two of us. Her double raised her hand, and she did the same. When their fingers got close, electricity crackled between them, pink and purple forks of miniature lightning. She pulled her hand away in wonder and saw that her doppelganger did the same. The woman looked at her, and she realized suddenly that one thing about their faces were different. Her eyes, they are pink, like rose quartz. Adelina, the woman whispered suddenly, then gasped. Her double turned with a whirl of her cloak, and her eyes widened as she saw what looked like shadows streaming out of the cloak, covering her double until she vanished entirely from sight. She breathed for a moment, letting the shaking subside from her limbs as the adrenaline started to drain out of her system. As carefully as she could, she retraced her steps, letting herself down from the tile roof and onto a balcony below. Then it was a complicated climb down, lowering herself from balcony to balcony until she reached the ground. She forced herself to focus on the climb and not on what had just happened. Don't think about how you almost fell to your death. Don't think about the burst of magical light that happened when you touched each other. Don't think about her at all. Finally, her feet once again were touching the ground. She let out a ragged breath, her legs feeling like they were about to melt from under her. She leaned against the wall of the building, looking both ways down the narrow alley where she'd landed. Now that she was no longer in danger of crashing to the earth, she could consider what had just happened. For the first time, she'd gotten a good look at her double and found that they weren't identical. Her eyes are pink, mine purple. In every other physical attribute, including their athleticism, they seemed evenly matched. Except she wasn't the one falling off the roof, she reminded herself. So maybe we aren't perfectly matched. Still, she couldn't help thinking that she was somehow related to the other woman. The resemblance was too uncanny for there not to be a genetic thread tying them together. She called me Adelina. That's my name. She wasn't sure how she knew this, but it was true, nonetheless. While she'd never felt certain that Lynetta Camara was who she truly was, there was no doubt in her mind in this moment that she was Adelina. For the first time since she'd woken up beside that riverbank, she knew who she was, and even if she wasn't certain what her place was in this world, she understood now that she had one. Pulling herself off the wall, she started to walk to the end of the alley that let out onto the street. She could no longer hear the screams of the people on the larger streets, so she hoped that enough time had passed for the fervor to die down and for her to pass without notice. But where am I going? It wasn't like she could go back to Malvo and ask if she could stay until she figured out who she was. But no thanks on that whole mentor mate offer. Let's be friends instead. She had no idea where to go next. She only knew she needed a little distance between herself and the place where she'd almost tumbled to her death. Maybe I can find my double again, she thought although it was evident that if the woman didn't want to be seen, she wouldn't be. Deciding to find herself a room at a reputable inn to give herself time to think over her next move, she came out of the alley and into the street. A street that was lined with the contingent of the city guard. Hells, she muttered, backing down the alley. She turned, intending to sprint to the other street, but behind her was a squad of guards blocking her exit. Looking up, she considered the balconies and the roof again. 
but with the way her limbs felt, she didn't think she'd manage the climb up again. In moments, she was surrounded. Hands up, the beefy guard in front of her commanded. Adelina did as she was told, lifting her hands and letting him pat her down for weapons. The guard then yanked her wrists down and clasped cuffs around them. What are you doing? she asked, concerned. She'd just escaped one prison and wasn't keen to repeat her performance. You're being brought in for questioning, he replied, his voice like gravel, then he pushed her in the direction of the street in front of her. Let's get a move on. They walked in silence, Adelina trying to get a sense of where they were in the city. She'd only seen a tiny portion of it on her ride from the gate to Malvo's house, and when she'd been chasing her double, she hadn't kept track of the direction she'd run in. Nothing around her looked familiar. She wasn't sure how far they marched her, but after a while they reached a squat building with a white so dark that it was almost grey. It stretched the length of the block, with doors set at intervals in the brick. The contingent of guards stopped before one door among several and knocked on it. It swung open from the inside, and they were waved into the corridor. Adelina looked around her, but there wasn't much to see. Plain grey walls, austere wooden furnishings. The rest of the city was a whirlwind of decoration, every inch seemingly intricately carved or painted, but inside these walls there was nearly nothing. It was a contrast that caught her off guard. Down here, the league guard said, dragging her down a corridor by her cuffs. He took a few turns, enough for her to lose track of where they'd walked, then stopped abruptly in front of a nondescript door. Inside! He opened the door and propelled her inside, coming in behind her to point at a chair. She took the seat, which sat in front of a large desk with nothing on it. Hold out your arms, he instructed, and she did so. She watched as he removed the cuffs. Wait here for evaluation, and don't attempt anything you shouldn't. These people aren't as nice as the rest of the guard. She blinked at his words, worry knotting her stomach. The guard went out the door they'd come through, shutting it behind him. Alone, Adelina let her eyes wander the room, looking for anything that made sense. Beyond the desk was a large chair, and behind that, a low cabinet with many drawers. The walls on either side of the desk were lined with shelves, and on the shelves sat scrolls, bound books, and a series of wooden boxes on their side, filled with papers. She was just turning around to take in the cabinets on either side of the door when it opened. A woman with long silver hair and two buns on either side of her head, hiding the points of her ears. The woman walked around the desk and sat in the chair behind it, setting a folder on the desk in front of her. She opened it and skimmed its contents before looking up to make eye contact with Adelina. Are you registered for magical activity? The question caught her by surprise. I beg your pardon? Any fay with powers of an intensity beyond the same gifts we all share must be registered with the King's Council. There must be some mistake, she said, her forehead furrowed. I don't have strong magic. The steely-eyed fay stared at her. According to this report, you were seen in the fourth quadrant on a rooftop with another woman. Either you or this woman generated a ball of energy that was great enough for King Lai himself to feel. Adelina blinked, unable to comprehend what she was hearing. I, that is, we... The woman ignored her stammering. The king wants both women found and evaluated. That is why you're here. She shut the folder and primly folded her hands above it. Are you ready? No. Adelina had been put through the ringer for days, only to finally discover her name and a connection to someone nearly identical to her. She didn't want to confront the thought of having something else hiding inside her, another secret that she had no answers to, no power to control. The woman eyed her, then turned around to pull open one of the drawers in the long cabinet. She brought something out, then turned around to place it on the desk before her. Adelina studied it, feeling more confused than ever. It was a small white statue, about six inches high, carved in the shape of a woman with her hands pressed together. Fingers up, she wore flowing robes, her hair tumbling down her back in waves. Her ears were delicately pointed, and on her face was a sublime expression. This is one of our evaluation tools. It's rudimentary, but it works. Those who have only the ordinary face skill with magic will not cause a change, but those of us with more... She held her hand over the statue, and the white of its surface slowly turned pale blue. 
Adelina held back a gasp. The woman pulled back her hand, a smug expression on her face. Those of us with more magical ability will cause the statue to shift in color. She gently pushed the statue in Adelina's direction. Now it's your turn. Letting out a long breath, Adelina held out her hand, letting it hover above the statue as the other woman had. She told herself that nothing would happen, that she had the same powers as everyone else. She could light a fire by will alone. She could cause her skin to glow when light was needed. Those were the extent of her powers as far as she knew. It only took a second for the statue to turn so blue that it was almost black. It began to shake, and the serene expression on the woman's carved face began to morph, turning into a silent scream. Adelina pulled her hand back with a gasp, holding it against her chest. She watched as the other woman stared at her with eyes as round as coins. She grabbed the statue and hastily tucked it away again. Adelina saw that she was nearly panting. The woman scrambled out of her seat and rushed to the door, disappearing without another word. Adelina melted into her chair, the events of the last hour too overwhelming to comprehend further. She gave up on trying, instead trying to banish the fear that was threatening to engulf her. What does that mean? There is no way I have strong magic. Right? She'd never felt anything inside her that would indicate the power the statue seemed to say was inside her. The memory of her hand clasped with her double, and the energy that had rushed through her then descended on her mind, and she knew she was in trouble. Her hands moved to her stomach, which had knotted itself with fright. I retracted the attention of the king himself. How can that bode well? He sent men to find me, me and my double. Have they caught her too? Is she even now sitting in an identical room, making another statue turn blue? Adelina doubted it. Her double had a way of disappearing whenever the mood struck her. She had a feeling that whatever the other woman was, she wasn't a prisoner. Not like me. There was no way of knowing what had caused the surge of power. But Adelina knew her chances of convincing the woman and her colleagues that she wasn't a powerful magic user like she thought was so slim as to be none. There was only one thing she knew for certain. Whatever was about to happen, she wasn't ready for it. Chapter 25 Adelina wasn't sure how long she waited alone in the room, but finally the door opened, and the woman with the silver hair reappeared, this time with a plain grey dress in her hands. She handed it to Adelina, then leaned against the desk to face her. Put that on, she said, indicating the dress. You and I are headed for the academy. Adelina knew better than to ask questions. They only lead to more problems. She waited until the woman turned her back, then pulled off her breeches and blouse to slide into the dress she'd been given. The woman then moved to the cabinet to draw out a stack of blank paper along with a quill and inkwell. Is there anyone you'd care to send a message to, to let them know your whereabouts? What do you mean? The woman indicated the ring with a crown on it. Your family. Do you wish to inform them that you're headed to the academy? Adelina bit her lip. The woman obviously thought she was a noble. Maybe I can use this to my advantage. Why write them when I could go home to inform them? She asked mildly. I'm sure nobles are allowed free passage at this academy. The woman looked at her, her brows lowering. Nobles and non-nobles are treated the same at the academy. Nobility is not a free pass to abandon one's duty. All magic users with superior skills are made members of the King's Blade and you will be granted free passage once you've attained your rank in the academy. There must be some mistake, Adelina said again, desperate to turn the tide of events. The statue doesn't make mistakes, the woman replied. Then she waved the quill at her. Last chance. Anyone you want to let know where you're going? Adelina shook her head. The only person she wanted to warn was Bracken, but she had no idea how to reach him. And whether her letter might somehow hinder him, given the charges Malvo had trumped up on him. No, thank you. The woman collected the paper and writing implements and returned them to the proper drawer. Then let's be on our way. She followed the woman down the maze of hallways, realizing that tears were falling from her eyes. Adelina was tired, worn out, empty. Hope had fled, as had her plan for tracking down her double and finding out the truth. 
Once again, fate had intervened to alter her path. I'm beginning to think I shouldn't make any plans at all. What's the point when they all get thwarted? They departed the building through a different door than she'd come in. It led out onto a narrow brick-lined alley that cut between two identical walls. She sniffled, feeling forlorn, and her companion looked back at her, disdain in her features. No need for sniveling. You're about to start a brand new life, and you should be proud to be of such service to the king. I don't feel proud. I feel lost. The alleyway led out into a wider courtyard that seemed to be at the center of a complex of interconnected buildings. She looked up to see the arches of several bridges that spanned the courtyard above them, crisscrossing between buildings. There were several people milling around the courtyard, including a contingent in light blue military uniforms. She kept her head down and followed her evaluator, the thoughts churning in her head such a mess that she couldn't focus on any of them. Then she heard someone call out, Lynetta! Her head snapped up, and she saw a familiar muscular figure sprinting toward her. Joy burst inside her, and she felt a wash in relief. Bracken pulled to a stop beside her, but instead of speaking to her, he turned his attention to the silver-haired fae. Roxy, it's been ages! The other fae pursed her lips. You're the only one who calls me that. I shouldn't let you. He rubbed his shoulder against hers. Come on, you know you love it. He jerked his thumb in Adelina's direction. She giving you any trouble? You know this person? Roxy asked with a sniff. I do. We're old friends. The silver-haired fay quirked a silver eyebrow at him. You're friends with a noble woman. Why don't I believe that? Because you're a smart cookie, Bracken fixed her with a blinding smile that had Adelina's insides contracting in jealousy. He tapped his fingertip against her nose. Haven't I always said so? What do you want, Bracken? She said in a harsh tone, but Adelina could see her cheeks turning pink and the corners of her lips quirking. Five minutes, he said, with my friend here. Roxy looked Adelina up and down, then frowned. On second thought, I can totally see why you count her among your friends. She sighed, then looked out at the stars that were starting to come out above them. Five minutes, no longer. You have my eternal gratitude, Bracken said warmly, then bent down to kiss the woman's cheek. That earned him a giggle, which Roxy quickly tried to smother. She pushed him away and walked across the courtyard to give them some space. What are you doing here? He asked immediately. I should ask you the same thing, she replied. Malvo said he had you arrested. He tried, Bracken said with a black look. Tried to convince the guard general that I was a deserter, Luckily, my sergeant had sent a message ahead, registering my orders. It took a couple hours to clear up, but I'm a free man, at least until I receive new orders. He looked down at her, taking in her changed attire. Your turn. Spill. Adelina took a deep breath. Five minutes isn't enough time to explain, so you're only getting the big beats and don't interrupt me with questions. Malvo admitted to buying his ring of nobility and tried to convince me to join forces with him. He had this crazy idea that you and I had bumped off the real Annette Chimera and stolen her ring and purse. Wait, the real Annette Chimera? You aren't Lynetta. His expression was so confounded that she immediately dismissed any doubts that he might have somehow masterminded her memory loss and subsequent journey. I am not, apparently, an unbeknownst to me. And I said no questions. I managed to escape with the help of the shadow that's been chasing me around. Turns out, She's not my exact double, but we are close enough to be twins. I followed her, tried to stop her to find out who she was, but I almost fell off a five-story roof in the process. He grabbed her, quickly looking over her for any injuries. I'm fine, she said, slapping his hands away. Just listen. When my double grabbed my hand to stop me from falling, we set off some kind of magical explosion. When I made it off the roof after my double disappeared, the guard were waiting for me. Seems the king himself felt our little ball of power. They took me to be tested, and apparently, I'm off the charts. So, they're making me a king's blade. Bracken grabbed his head in both hands like it was going to explode. A king's blade? There must be some mistake. That's what I keep telling that lady, who you seem to be very friendly with, by the way. But she insists, and she's taking me to the academy. No, Bracken said, giving his head a decisive shake. 
That can't happen. I don't seem to have much choice in the matter. What am I going to do? Tell the king to take his elite magical fighting force and shove it? Do you know what you're talking about? Because the last time I told you about the king's blade, you didn't seem to know what they are. There are many things that I've forgotten, she said rapidly. And the king's blade is one of them. But it doesn't seem to matter if I believe in them, just so long as they believe in me. He grabbed her arms, his expression full of intensity. Lynetta, the king's blade are the most elite, most secretive and powerful of all fae. Sure, the nobles might seem to have all the prestige, but the king's blade moved the levers of power like no other, save the king himself. My name is not Lynetta, she reminded him, gently tugging herself out of his grip after a glance at Roxy's pinched face. It's Adelina. Whoever you are, you shouldn't want to be a king's blade. They're forbidden to marry, never allowed to have children, isolated from their families, their friends. Bracken's words shook her. The weight of everything that had happened to lead to this moment pressed on her until she felt like she was about to be crushed under it. She couldn't help the tears that filled her eyes. I don't want to be a king's blade. You're not listening. I haven't been given a choice. Time's up, Roxy appeared, her expression grimmer than it had been before. Adelina glanced at Bracken, worried that his flirtation with her would turn the woman against her before she even reached the academy. Let's go. Roxy, wait, Bracken said, putting a hand on her shoulder. There's been some mistake here. You know we don't make mistakes, sweetheart, she said, removing his hand from her, as if it were a dead rodent she was disposing of. Now make way. She pushed past him, Adelina forced to follow in her wake. Bracken stood there frozen, watching her go. Adelina turned her head to keep him in view for as long as she could. There was a stoop to his shoulders that he'd never had before. His face was morose, and her chest felt like it was collapsing in on itself. They left the courtyard, entering another narrow alley. Adelina walked on, tears blurring her eyes. She didn't bother to try and track their path. It didn't seem to matter anymore. Since she'd set out to find herself, she'd only become more elusive, impossible to pin down. And yet, she herself had been caught in one trap after another. Every way she'd turned, she'd been met with a cage of some sort. Now she was about to enter potentially her worst prison yet. A lifetime sentence with no chance of appeal. Any chance of finding out about her doppelganger was fading away like dew in the rain. And with that went her best hope of finding out about herself. Her induction into the King's Blade made determining her identity irrelevant. They would forge a new identity for her. In their own image. One without friends or family beyond her comrades in arms. She thought about what Brecken had said. How the King's Blade were not allowed to wed nor to have families of their own. Perhaps she should consider herself lucky. As an orphan by chance, this was her opportunity to forge new alliances without having to worry about any ulterior motives. But even if that were true, it wasn't what she wanted. She had but one friend in this world, and now it seemed fate was determined to keep them apart. Bracken had his own brothers in arms, his own keepers who gave the orders that dictated his life. Between the academy and his commission, The chances of them being together were nearly zero. They stepped out under a street lamp, and Roxy pointed to the large edifice before them. It had several white columns flanking its front, each of them intricately carved with curling vines and flowers. This is the academy, her guide said, leading her toward a small door not far from the large set of double doors that towered above it. Follow me. Adelina turned once to take in her last view of the city, before entering her new prison. Inhaling her final breath of fresh, free air, she stepped into the door and into her new life. Epilogue Embrin waved away the fly that insisted on hovering around his face. The humidity still clung to the air even though it was nearly dusk, and the heat of the day had started to fade. He took another swipe at the fly, but it continued to evade him forcing him to give up and settle his hat deeper onto his head. The road wound lazily through the valley, green grass for a mile on either side. In the distance he could see the borders of the forest, visibility disappearing right after the first row of trees. The woods were silent as his cart rolled down the road, 
pulled by a pair of mules that had made the trek several times before. One of the wheels squeezed, setting off a repetitive rhythm as he rode, making Embran nod his head in time. It had been a busy day, starting with him hauling his goods to the village five miles from home. He'd managed to sell every one of his melons, and he knew his wife would be delighted to see the tidy pile of coins he'd made in the process. She was saving up for a new bolt of fabric. With big plans to fashion a new dress by King's Day, she'd been scraping up every spare coin they'd had to make it happen. He thought his haul for the day would put her over the top, which meant he'd get a dose of her gratitude. Meat pies for days, he murmured, wiping away the spot of drool that escaped his lips. No one made meat pies like Vanilla did. Something about the blend of spices. He'd married her for her pie alone, although over the years he'd come to appreciate so much more about her. The cart rounded a curve in the road, and when it straightened out again, Embrin frowned. Is this forest somehow closer than before? It was a ridiculous notion, but he blinked and then cleared his eyes, and the question remained. The roots and branches seemed closer, maybe a half mile off the road. Can't be, he murmured to himself. I've been taking this road all my life, and never once has the forest moved. One of the mules flicked its ear to chase off the persistent fly, but otherwise nothing was disturbed. The sun continued its descent until the world was washed out in shades of grey. An unease crept up inside him, and Embrin shifted his seat, trying to calm himself. There's nothing to be worried about. You've lived near the same forest for your entire life. Sure, your parents kept you out of it, warned you never to go in, and yes, you told your own children the same warnings, never to enter the forest, always to keep it at a safe distance, but there is no danger so long as you do not enter the trees. He might understand that logic, the same logic the people of his small farming community had been following for ages, but tonight it didn't have its usual weight. Tonight it felt flimsy, mutable, unstable. Another curl in the road brought him to the realization that he was not hallucinating. It's closer, almost to the road itself. There was no way he could be mistaken. The woods were on the move, and they were headed for the road. He made a clicking sound and lifted the reins to urge his beast forward, hoping for a little more speed. The farm was less than a mile down the road, and there would be lamps and candles, and vanilla with her meat pies convincing him that he was safe, that what he'd seen was just a daydream, the illusion of a man tired after a day of hard work. A sudden howl rent the twilight, sending a shiver through him. Embrin's eyes flashed to the woods, first left, then right, but he could see nothing. They were as inscrutable as ever, even if they were now close enough that he could make out the pattern of leaves on the dark branches. He swallowed hard, pulling back on the reins to settle the mules. Their eyes were rolling in their heads, their nostrils flaring. They're as frightened as I am, he realized. Another howl followed the first one, and Embrin clutched his chest where his heart was pounding hard enough he thought it might burst through its ribcage. I've never heard a howling like this, he thought. His farm had been visited by the hoots of owls and yips of foxes, the barking of coyotes and the long and mournful howls of the woolly wolves who still stalked the ancient forests and occasionally came forth to menace livestock. None of them had sounded like this. It sounds almost like fay, he said. Then another chorus of howls rose, more than before, and the idea cemented itself in his mind. Those were fay howls. Fay were in the forest, somehow incredibly. It defied all logic, but he couldn't refute it. The trees nearest the road began to quiver abruptly. Their leaves shook furiously, the branches whipping back and forth, like lashes ready to leave stripes on the skins of anyone foolish enough to come close. Embrin let out a shout of fright and snapped the reins, no longer content to ease his way home. Go! He shouted to his mules, and they did their best to give him what he wanted. The cart lurched forward, and he almost toppled out of it before regaining his seat. Holding on for dear life, Embrin sped down the road. If I can just make it to the farm, it will be okay. Vanilla will be there, and she will have put on a light for me. He focused on piloting the cart, terrified that if his attention veered even for a second, he might hit a rock and break an axle, becoming stranded here. 
a root suddenly charged its way across the road, and he had to pull hard on the reins to root the cart around it without hitting it. Imbrin let out a curse as he realized that branches and roots were unfurling themselves closer and closer to the road. The forest was on the move, and it was heading straight for him, determined to swallow him from both sides. He screamed, and the howls screamed with him, their intensity drowning Embrin out. His hands were shaking, his heart sputtering in his chest, making him feel faint. Leaves shuddered around him, dropping as the branches that held them whipped toward his cart. A root leapt from beneath the road, breaking through its surface to wrap itself around one of the cart's wheels. The vehicle pulled to the side, held fast as the mules pulled hard to try and free it. Embrin leaned over, beating at the root with his bare hands, trying to escape its clutches. He managed to unwrap it from the wheel just in time for another to rise up and repeat the motion, wrapping around the wheel and then the axle, causing the cart to topple suddenly on its side. Embrin let out a cry as he tumbled from the cart. His mules screamed, but he could barely hear them over the howling that seemed to swell until it consumed all the air around him. He pulled himself along the gravel of the road, attempting to rise to his feet, but something was stopping him. He looked back and saw a branch wrapped around his right foot, holding him fast. He clawed at the ground, praying for purchase, as the branch began to tug him backward. Another grabbed hold of his other leg, dragging him toward the forest. Embrin let out a terrified scream, but it was soon muffled as roots and branches forced their way down his throat, silencing him. His eyes went wide with fear as the forest closed in around him, blocking out the stars above him blocking out all light but the glow of the eyes that were surrounding him. His eyesight began to fail, but not before he saw them. The shadowy figures with glowing eyes, their howls still echoing to the heavens. One knelt beside him, crouching to look into his face as all the remaining light around him faded. Her face was the last thing he would see. It was a fierce face, a beautiful face, full of pride. Consciousness left him, as the branches and roots wrapped around him, finally hiding him from sight. The beautiful woman walked past his remains, pulling herself up a nearby tree, branch after branch, until her head broke the canopy. For miles around her, all she could see was forest. She smiled a beautiful, terrible smile at a job well done. A fly buzzed around her, and she batted it away from her face, a face that looked just like Adelina's, save for the eyes. They were pink. The End Fay Wild Series Book Two, Curse of the Fay, coming soon. With no memory of who she is and where she comes from, a fay sets out on a quest for answers that unravels the mystery of not only who she is, but a greater secret that threatens to topple the entire realm.